In this section, I'll be talking about identity providers. I'll mainly be talking about OpenID Connect or OIDC. Let's start with what is an identity provider? Simply put, an identity provider, abbreviated IDP, manages and maintains identity data for users. It's often used in conjunction with single sign-on, SSO. It gives a user a single login and password and optional multi-factor authentication capability. It can be used for multiple applications and websites. And while very convenient for the end user, it's also more secure. So just think about this as being able to log in to multiple applications and websites with one single login and password and potentially multi-factor authentication. Two often used implementations for authentication within an identity provider setup are OIDC, so this OpenID Connect, and SAML. OIDC, OpenID Connect, and SAML, Security Assertion Markup Language, are authentication mechanisms. They don't store login password information themselves. So it's an authentication mechanism. They don't store the actual login and password to validate your login and password when you're logging in. You would still need to validate the login and password and potentially the MFA token with a separate mechanism. Users can be in a database, in LDAP, in Microsoft Active Directory or other technologies where user credentials can be stored. SAML 2.0 was released in 2005 while OpenID Connect or IDC was launched in 2015. You can see that OpenID Connect is much more recent than SAML. SAML is still used a lot, but OpenID Connect is more lightweight and much easier to implement. Why implement OIDC? In this section, I'm going to implement OIDC. And you can follow along. The lectures will be built in a way that you can code some of the endpoints first before checking out the lectures. So why implement OIDC? It's a great learning experience. There's a flow to follow. There's JLTs involved. There is API calls that need to be done using REST. So implementing this yourself will be a great learning experience to learn about authentication flows and to actually do the implementation yourself. You will get the exposure to a lot of technologies Amongst others, it will be REST, OAuth, JWT, and JWK. You're often exposed to an identity provider and it's worth understanding the inner workings. So authentication is something that happens a lot. It's implemented in a lot of projects. So getting a good understanding of how authentication works, how OIDC works, is definitely great to have. You can build your own identity provider authorization server, a client or application. So depending how you're going to the implementation, you might be the client connecting to an application that is using OIDC, or you might be the application that needs to implement OIDC, or you might be the server itself. I'm going to implement all of them, but in the end, you might not run your own authorization server. You might use a third party for that, but then you would still maybe need to implement the application or the client. So it's still definitely worth to understand the full flow and to have a look at how all these components work together. Understanding how the flow works will help you when you need to build one of these components. What is OIDC? OIDC is short for OpenID Connect. It's a simple identity layer on top of the OAuth 2 2.0 protocol. OIDC can verify the identity of a user using an authorization server. OIDC uses REST endpoints, so it's easily implemented. So REST endpoints are just the normal endpoints that we have been using in this lecture already. Get and post using JSON. OIDC uses this instead of, for example, XML that SAML uses, so it's pretty easy to implement. OIDC uses JSON and JSON web tokens, JWT. JSON web tokens are used in a lot of applications. We have used it already before in one of our demos. OIDC also uses JWTs, so we are going to make use of those in the OIDC flow. 
There are different ORDC flows that you can implement. You have the authorization code flow, which is the one we are going to implement in our demo. It's for web applications that can store a client secret. So if you have a backend application, a backend application can store a client secret without the client knowing because the code will be parsed in the backend. You don't see it on the front end. So it can store a client secret to make the connection to the authorization server. This is the flow we are going to implement. And then you have other flows that you can implement. For example, when you only have a front end. So there's an implicit flow for front ends and mobile apps that cannot store a client secret. So if you cannot store a client secret because you only have front end code, then you could go for the implicit flow. And then you also have a hybrid flow. And the hybrid flow combines the authorization code flow and the implicit flow. It has immediate access to an ID token. So where the authorization flow, you will see there's multiple steps with a hybrid flow. You don't need to have multiple steps. So let's talk a little bit about the flow itself. This authorization code flow that we are going to implement. On the left, you have the user, which can be the web browser. Then we have the web application, which can be a Golang backend. And then we have the authorization server. And the authorization server has an authorized endpoint and a token endpoint. At least those endpoints to connect to, to be able to authenticate our user. So what's going to happen? Our user is first going to connect to our web application. It's going to access protected resources, or maybe there's a login button that needs to press to log into the web application. Then the web application will send a redirect to the user. So the redirect is an HTTP redirect to the authorization server. So the web application will say, I'm not responsible for login, go to the authorization server. So it's the user that then will go to the authorization server to handle the authentication part. And this is done using this authorized endpoint. The user, the browser, will go to this authorized endpoint to ask for authorization to do an authorization code request. It will ask for a code of this authorization server. And this code can be requested using this authorized endpoint. Then the authorization server might send another redirect to a login prompt. So this is the login and password box that you see on websites. This can come from the authorization server if you're not logged in yet, that the authorization server is asking the user to log in. So then the user will send its login and password to the authorization server. If the login and password is correct, then the authorization server will send again a redirect to the user and it will redirect the user back to the web application with a code query parameter. The first time that the user hit the authorization server was to the authorized endpoint for this code request. Now that the user is logged in, it will actually get this code as a query parameter and this code it can send back to the application. And because it needs to go back to application, it's the authorization server that will redirect the user back to the application. These redirects are whitelisted. So the actual redirect will come from the application, but they are whitelisted on the authorization server. So the user cannot be just redirected anywhere. It needs to be a specific redirect to a specific URL. So then the user will follow the redirect and it will go to the web application, send this code query parameter to the web application so that the web application can read this code. And then the web application can exchange a code for a token. So using the token endpoint, the web application can go there to the token endpoint and ask for a token, which will be a JLD token. So here you see that the user gets a code and not a token. So why would the user not be able to just get to the token endpoint and get the token itself? It's because of this secret that is being stored by the web application. So our web application has a secret that it will pass to this token endpoint and the authorization server will only give a token if you have the secret. So the user doesn't have access to this token. It only has access to a code and it cannot retrieve this token itself. It is the web application and only the web application because it has a secret that can retrieve this token. And then the 
token endpoint will send to the web application the access and ID tokens and potentially a refresh token to refresh those tokens when they expire. So that's the complete flow, a logical overview of how to authenticate. And this is the flow that we are going to implement in Go. We're going to build this authorization server, the web application, and then we're going to use a browser to log into this web application, which will redirect us to the authorization server. We log in to the authorization server, and then the web application will see that we are logged in, and then we'll be able to retrieve some of our user information. Because in this ID token, there is actually user information like a login, and it proves that we are logged in, and that we then can access the web application. On this diagram, we only have one web application, but the idea of ORDC is that we can have multiple applications and only one authorization server that takes care of the authentication of our users, distributes the codes to the users and the tokens to the applications, and then the applications have user information, can make API calls using the access token, and extract some user information from the authorization server for every user or make external API calls for this user. So it proves that the user is logged in, but we can also make API calls because once we have this JWT, another application could also verify whether this token was issued by the authorization server. The implementation details will become more clear once we start implementing this flow. So how does the flow work on an HTTP level? Here on the left, we have the user. Here on the right, we have the authorization server. If we going to the authorize endpoint, then we're going to do a request to the authorization endpoint. The exact name of the authorization endpoint can differ. It depends on the implementation of the authorization server. Here I called it slash authorization. The user is going to supply a client ID, the redirect URI, and this redirect URI is then the application server. So our application server here is running on port 8081. And we do a redirect to the slash callback page. So this slash callback page will then get a code, basically. We define a scope. The scope is open ID. We can add other things to a scope if it is supported by the authorization server, like a profile if you want to receive profile information, or things like offline access if you want to have a refresh token. These things all need to be implemented. We are just going to start with a simple implementation with scope open ID. The response type is code. So we expect the authorization server to give us a code. And we also need to pass the state. So the state is a random string that we supply that then the authorization server will then get back to us. Then the authorization server is going to say you are not logged in. So go to the slash login page and the slash login page will show a login and password box that the authorization server will then validate. If we are successfully logged in, then the authorization server will send us a redirect back to the application server. So the application server is still running on 8081 and it will redirect us to this callback URL. So this callback URL is typically whitelisted in the configuration of the authorization server so that we cannot just pass any redirect URI that we want. It needs to be whitelisted. It will also specify the code and the random string. So the code is the code that comes from the authorization server and that we send to the web application. So here below we see that we do the redirect to the web application. Now the web application has access to this code and it can request from the slash token endpoint a JWT token based on the code that we are giving the application. So the application is going to do a post on slash token. Grant type is the authorization code. It needs to specify the client ID and the client secret. And only because it has the client secret, it can receive this token. It cannot receive any token just based on this client secret. It also needs to supply this code that the user has been given to the web application because it enter the correct credentials on this authorization server. It also passes the redirect URI that was specified just so the authorization server can validate it still. The combination of this client secret and the code makes the authorization server give this JLT token. So then the application will then get the JLT tokens that can then be used as proof that the user is logged in. Now that the web application has these JLT tokens, 
it can still validate whether those tokens were issued by the authorization server. There's a JWKS.json where the public keys are available. So the web application can download these public keys from the authorization server. And using those public keys, it can validate whether the JLT was indeed issued by the authorization server. Those JLTs are encrypted by a private key of the authorization server. So using the private public key algorithm, when we have the public key, we can validate whether this JLT was indeed signed by a private key. And that is what the application can do. Once we have the public key from the JWKS URL, we can validate whether the signature of this JLT is indeed signed by the private key by using our public key. So the last step, when we receive the JLTs, we can still validate them. This validation can happen at any point as long as we have the public key available. So other application services could also validate a JLT as long as we have the public key available. The exact implementation details you will see in the demos and once you start doing the implementation, I'm not going to go over all the details because they will become clear once we restart writing code. This section is also a challenge. You can write the code of these components yourself first. So I will provide instructions first so that you can test it out yourself. You can write the code as an exercise and then once you have written one function or one call, you can validate whether you did it correctly using my demo lectures. So if you would like, you can write the ODC implementation yourself first. I will include instructions to step-by-step -step write the implementation. The start project contains already the function signatures. And I have written unit tests for those functions to be able to test the validity of your code. So you can write one function by one function and I have unit tests written, so you can just execute a unit test for a specific function to see whether you wrote the correct code. The start project is located in GitHub under OIDC start. So this is the GitHub URL, the Golang for DevOps course. So in there, there is a directory called OIDC start, and that's where you will find the function signatures and the tests. The actual implementation has not been written yet in that code. And the solution code is in the folder OIDC demo. So I will write also in the next lectures the correct code starting from OIDC start and will end up eventually with the solution code that is located in the folder OIDC demo. Before every demo, I will supply you with some information so that you can try to write the code yourself first in those functions. And then I will do the implementation myself and explain all the details that you need to know to write the OIDC implementation. To get started with the OIDC demo, I have created this OIDC start that already contains the function signatures. It doesn't really contain any logic, just some function signatures and some boilerplate code. In this lecture, I want to go over the files and directories and the Go files that we have in this OIDC start project. And this is where you should get started. So you can just download or copy this directory somewhere and get started yourself. So the first file that I created here is the go mod file. So the go mod file defines that this is a module. It's the OIDC start module. It uses go 1.18 and has two dependencies. One dependency is the JLT dependency. So I'm using from the Golang JLT project, the JLT dependency. I'm not going to encode and decode JLTs myself. I'm going to use a library for that. You could actually do that yourself if you want to. Maybe you could start with the library and then if you want to get rid of the library, you could try to encode and decode JLTs yourself. It's not super difficult, but it would definitely make this project a little bit longer. So I opted to use this Golang JLT. It's used a lot, this library. So that's why I don't mind using this library. I also use it in my other projects. And our second dependency is the SSH demo, and we just use that to create our RSA keys because we did it in the SSH demo. You could also just copy out the this code from the SSH demo if you don't want to use it as a dependency. We're going to have an app server and the authorization server. In the app server, I have the main.go and 
every time we need to start a web server. So what's going to happen here is we have the listen and serve, which is going to create a server and it's going to listen on port 8081. We are going to have an index and a callback because the application needs to be able to parse this code at a slash callback. So that's part of the flow. And at the index, we will just have a login button. These are our function signatures, two calls that we can make. And I have a separate file here, jdlt.go. And in jdlt.go, we have a function signature for the get token from code. So once we have the code, we can retrieve a token. And the reason why I put this signature here, this function signature here is so that I have a test. So here we have test get token from code. So when you run test, it will actually try to run this test. And because we just return nil, 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 it will say claims is nil. But if you write the actual code in here, the get token from code, you can use this JLT test to validate whether your code is correct. And then here in your callback, you will need to use that get token from code. So that's the app server. So here we just have two endpoints. The authorization server will be a little bit more complex. So we have also a main.go. And in this main.go, we have a little bit more boilerplate code to get our server started. So what do we have here? We're going to read a configuration file because we need definitely a configuration file to store values like the client ID, the secret ID, the callback that the callbacks that are whitelisted. So we definitely need to keep some config. So what are we going to do here? We're going to see does this config exist? Here we will have to put the config file, the name of the config file. I'm going to use a YAML file, but you can choose whatever you want. You can also use a JSON or a TOML file. Those are all valid. And then we're going to read the file here. And then we have in config just the binds. And what else are we going to do? We're going to check whether we have this encryption key because we need an encryption key in the RSA format, which is the same as our SSH format that we were using. So we are testing, does this encryption key exist? If not, we are going to generate a key. And if the key didn't exist, we generate it and we also write it out. So that, this, so that the second time we execute it, we are not generating a new key anymore. We are just going to read this private key. So we need a config and a private key in the RSA format. Well, here it just bytes because it will be in a PAM form format, but then eventually we'll have to convert it to the RSA private key format. And then we'll start our server. We'll start our server passing the HTTP server struct from the HTTP package, just so that we can easily pass the port. If you want to change the port, you can change it in the main instead of going to dig into to this package. And we pass the private key and the config. But for the config, we are already going to parse this byte into a server config struct. And this server config struct, I already have defined. So I already have some boilerplate just so that we can agree on the attributes in our variables so that when you write the code, it's not going to be completely different than my code. So this start uses the server package and this server package is defined in here in PKG. So if I have a look at this server package, you see we'll have all the files. Most of these files are completely empty right now, just with the function signatures in. Let's have a look at this config maybe first and then at the start server. So this config, where is this defined? Right click, go to definition. So here we have the read config, which is currently empty. So you will have to parse this config, uh, which is just bytes. So this is a file that we pass the file contents and we have to return this config. How does this config look? So in server we have types and in the server types we just have this config defined. So right now we have an apps, which is a map. The key is a string and the value is the app config. So we can have multiple applications. Our authorization server can support multiple applications and for every application we're going to keep a client ID, secret, issuer and the redirect URIs. We're also going to find on a 
root level the URL. And we also have load error that we can use internally. If there was a error while loading the config, we can put it in here. The URL will then be just the URL of the server. So we don't have to define it for every application. So this is the types. And then in HTTP.go, we'll have this uh, start server. So here we have this start that was called from the main. So the start requires this HTTP server so that we can pass this server address and to also help us with the testing, the private key and the config. Then we do new server, which is defined right here. New server is a struct where we keep this information so that we can access it at all our endpoints. New server, we pass the private key and the config, and then we can use the functions that we're going to define for every endpoint. We have an authorization endpoint, token endpoint, login endpoint, jwks.json. So these I explained already in the overview, this as well. So this is the authorization. This is the first step. This token is to exchange the code into a token. The login will show our login page. And we will also be able to do the actual login there. JWKS.json is going to show our public keys so that we can validate our tokens. This well-known OpenID configuration is just going to be a discovery endpoint so that we don't have to hard code all our URLs. This discovery endpoint will then just show us a JSON with all the token and the authorization and the JWKS URLs so we don't have to hard code it. And the user info is an endpoint that we can call with a token, it will then give us a JSON of the user info, the user that you pass a token of. And then we do the listen and serve. So let's have a look at the tests. We have an HTTP test here that is going to start a server and then it's going to test whether we have all these endpoints. This test should already work. Oh, yeah, it passes. So it starts a server and then it checks whether we have all these endpoints. And then we are just checking whether the code falls in a certain range. So if then something goes wrong, then this test will then stop working. And then you might have to make changes to your endpoints. So we have the main Go, the server, and then we have all these files. What are all these files? In authorization, we just have the authorization endpoint. In config, we read the config. In discovery, we have the discovery endpoint, which is also just a signature. So it, right now it just returns nothing. We have the HTTP file, which I already went over. JWKS, also just an empty endpoint. The login. The token. The types and the user info. They are all empty and we will have to one by one write a code for every endpoint to start working. So let's say that we write the authorization code here, then we can run the authorization test. We can run the test authorization code and now it will fail because we are expecting this location header, but there's no location header set because, because we haven't written any code. But then once you write the code, this test should pass. So that's why we have all these tests. So every underscore test has actually test files to help you to see whether the code that you have written actually works. So we'll do this step by step. We also are going to focus on the OIDC flow itself. We also will have a user package for the authentication. So once that a user enters a login and password, then we're going to validate that login and password. And that's why we have the users package for but we are not going to do any complex authentication, any complex login and password checking. You could, if you have a database or LDAP or Active Directory somewhere that you, you would like to use, you can change this code and make a connection to your directory server here to validate a login and password. So here you can change the login and password into your name, for example, so it's easy to log in. And this is only going to check authentication and will then return a user. So this is the user that has been statically configured in this package. So you have the Edward user that I'll be using to log in to the authorization server. We'll also have this OIDC package 
And in this ORDC package, we will have a few helper functions. So for example, here we have the parse discovery, which takes a URL and then just returns the discovery JLT. So this discovery, this discovery endpoint is basically just going to be returning a JSON in the structure of this. So you have an issuer, authorization endpoint, token endpoint, user info endpoint. So this is standardized and you should have this endpoint, which is going to make it a lot easier for your application servers to be configured because you will only have to pass this discovery endpoint. So this parse discovery will just go to this URL, do a get request on this URL and try to unmarshal this JSON into a struct and return a struct. So I left it here because it's just such a simple API call. So we're not going to spend too much time on this. It just goes to this discovery endpoint and gives us a discovery struct. Then we have this jlt.go, but I actually moved this to here to the jlt.go. So this one we don't need. Then we have a get random string in the rand.go which will just generate a random string based on the amount of characters we want to return here. So we have n, which is how many characters you want to return. And we are going to randomly generate something, randomly generate a string. Base64 encode this with URL encoding. So this URL encoding is important because we want to pass it as a query string attribute. So this is going to be base64, just random. So every time we need a random string, we are going to call this function. So no need to write this yourself. It's pretty simple. It just uses the crypto rand, generates generates a random string. We're going to base64 encode it. And whenever you have an equal sign, we're just also going to remove it. So then we just have a random string with no characters that could conflict in our URL. And then we have the type. So I already discussed this discovery type, but we also have a token type and a JWKS type that is just an array of JWKS keys. So here we have our public key information. So this is also standardized. So this is standardized. This is standardized. This is a token endpoint. What well, is being returned from our token endpoint? And this is also standardized. Because this is all standardized, I created this OIDC package and these types are gonna be all the same for everyone who is gonna write an OIDC implementation. So that's why I already put them right here just so that we have some boilerplate code so that I could also write my tests because in my tests, I'm also loading these structs and it will make our life easier once we start writing the code for all our endpoints. So ORDC has these standardized types and just a few functions. Then the server is going to be our server implementation and the users is going to be our users implementation that you might want to change if you would like to be able to log in with a real login and password. So that's it. You can download this OIDC start package and then we can start working on the implementation of the first endpoints. In this demo, I will parse the config file. So right now, if we would start the server, it would throw us an error. The config file doesn't exist. To solve that, we would first need to have a config file. So we need to define this constant here, config file, because that's what we are checking on here. And then we're going to read the config file and we are going to parse the config file. So we have this server read config. So this read config will have to write using codes that will parse the config file. You can choose the format of the config file yourself. I'll be using YAML. So first I will need to define the config file constant. I will call my config file config.yaml. And my config.yaml is going to be right here. Config.yaml in the main directory, because that's where I'm going to start the server. Let's have a look at our types again. So in types, you have the config, consists of apps, URL, load error. And then within the apps, we have a map with client ID, client secret, issuer, and redirect URLs. Let's start with URL. And we are going to host it on localhost 8080 currently. We can change it over time. So right now it's localhost 8080, but we might change it over time 
because if you use a service like ngrok, if you want to have it accessible on the internet or we deploy it somewhere, we might change this. And then the apps. And the first app is going to be app one. App one is our map key, our map key. And then we are going to define the app config. Client ID, I'll just say one, two, three, four. Client secret, it's gonna be our secret. Issuer is going to be the same as our URL, because that's the server that is going to issue the JLT. And then we have the redirect URIs, which is an array and localhost 8081 is the app server. So that's what I'm going to use as a redirect server name, but then the path is going to be the callback. So we are going to allow to redirect back to our application server on the callback URL. I'm going to save this and we then need to parse this in this config, config.go. This config.go will do the config parsing using this config type, but this config type doesn't have any metadata yet in the struct, so let me add that first. If we are going to use YAML, we can add YAML metadata and that can then be read by a library. So there is a library for YAML available. The Go YAML slash YAML. YAML support for the Go language. The YAML package enables Go programs to comfortably encode and decode YAML values. It was developed within Canonical as part of the Juju project. So we can use this one. It's been based on the libyamlc library, but it's purely written in Go. There are more libraries available, so it doesn't really matter exactly which one you are going to use. This one is a good one. You can use this one or another one. To install it, run this command. Go get the YAML v3. And now we'll be able to use it in the config.co. Let's now make sure that we put the correct metadata in place. YAML apps. And this then need to match exactly how we wrote our config.yaml. So if you have a look at this config.yaml, apps right here, all lowercase. And you see here we are using camel case. First a lowercase and then uppercase if we start a new word. So we just need to make sure that matches URL load error we're not using client ID client secret issuer redirect URIs. Save this and then we can do the parsing. Works very similar as how we are parsing our JSON. Instead of JSON, unmarshal and marshal, we do yaml.unmarshal. The binds and then the interface, which in our case is the config variable. This returns an error. If the error is not equal to nil, we are actually not going to stop the program. We're going to say config.loadError equals the error, and then we are going to return the config. Just so that we can later capture the error and then do something with it, rather than already returning an error. So if we have a way to start without a config, we might as well do that. So we are just waiting to return an error here. We're just going to return the config, but we are encapsulating the error in our config variable. Save this and save this. Let's try to run our server 
and I think our server is now running. Localhost 8080 page not found, so that seems to be working. So our server started. We don't even have an endpoint for slash, so that's actually not what we get a 404. I could try token. Okay, and this token gives a 200, but no output. Let's maybe just see if we have our config output, and then that's going to be end of this part of doing the config work. And then we can start with these endpoints. So this plus V is going to show us also the keys. So we have the config apps is all applications it is the map. We have the key, which is app one. Client ID, we have the secret the issuer, the redirect URIs, the URL, and we have no load error. So it's all great. I'm going to remove this line again, save this, and we can continue with the next part of our server. Going back to our ORDC slide that shows the flow with the HTTP request. So this authorized endpoint on SAS authorization is the first endpoint we need to write for the flow to start working. It takes a client ID, the redirect URI. So the client ID needs to match the client ID that we put in our config file. The redirect URI also need to match the redirect URI that we put in the config for that specific client ID. So these things we will need to check. We will need to check whether the scope is definitely not empty. We are only going to support open ID, but we can as well ignore that or just save it for later use and then check it later. We are not really specifying in our config file what scopes we can receive. Open ID is for ORDC, but you can also have an offline token and other scopes that gives you more functionality. Response type is code. We need to check for that. That's the only valid response type that can be passed, so it just says that we are going to then reply with a code. And then we also need to check for the state. The state is a random string. And that state we later need to give back. So you need to also save all this information somewhere on the authorization server. We can validate the information right now, save it somewhere, and then we need to redirect the user. So we need to send a redirect URL to the login page. Once it goes to the login page, we also need to track the user because it will be entering its login and password information. So when we do the redirect, we want to give some a random ID, like a session ID with it, so that we later on can track what user was actually logging in. So we have a match between the client ID and all the information that it supplies to us and the actual request. So we kind of need to track the request as well when we are going to redirect this user to other endpoints so we don't lose track of the user itself. So let's try to implement this. So we are going to implement this in the authorization function. Let's declare all the variables that we need to have, and then we can start checking on them and getting them from the request. So we have the client ID, redirect URI, scope, response type, and the state that we need to receive. So let's store the correct information in all of them and just check whether they are all not empty. If client ID equals to, and we have the request in R and then the URL. In the URL, we have the query and we can then do get get gets the first value associated with the given key the key is going to be client id so if client id equals to client id and if then the client id is empty we want to throw an error how we want to throw error we probably want to do return error and then write a function to return an error and then say what the error is client id is empty and then we want to return to stop our function. So this return error we don't have yet. So let's try to write this. I'll just write an HTTP. 
we'll just have a function here func return error w is HTTP response writer and error this is not a pointer like if something goes wrong there's a header HTTP error code 400 that we could return back it's called bad request bad request is an int of 400 and we can say write byte and then we just return error and we're also going to print on screen so we know that we threw an error that's easier for debugging just like that and then we can always use this return error when we want to say there's a bad request because something is missing and we just need to show the error to the end user so now we can do this for all these variables let's just copy paste this five times so now we copy paste this five times and we are checking whether client id is not empty redirect url uri is not empty scope is not empty still need to change this and this looks all good except that the response type we can say if it's not equal to code because we're only accepting code here now we are sure that the client id is not empty let me just check this one more time client id client id client id redirect uri scope response type state all looks good now we have for sure the client id it's not empty so let's try to find the client id in our config and remember our config is in this server variable so we can loop our config apps for apps in as config apps for app if app client id equals our client id then we can say app config is an app config we can now assign this app to our app config if we didn't find anything then app config will be empty if app config client id is empty we gonna return error client id not found so it's not empty but now it's not found and we also need to pass our w and this needs to be error f and return the client id is empty but we still need to validate the redirect URI. The redirect URI is an array in YAML, so we will need to iterate over that. Font is false, I will say. And then for redirect URI config, range app config, which is now our app config that matches with our client ID, redirect URIs. If the re direct uri config equals to the redirect uri that was supplied found is true so if you don't find this redirect uri that was supplied in the request in our config then we also need to we also need to throw an error return error redirect uri not found in config or not whitelisted what's then the next step i was talking about tracking our user with a session id because we want to keep this information somewhere if you lose this information we don't have this information later on in a later stage so we'll need to store it somewhere and we can store it in our server struct we'll need to make a new type 
that we then put in our server struct so we can keep these variables. So I'll just copy paste those. Those are the ones we're going to initially keep. And I will make a new type, login request with those variables. If I give them capitals and they're also accessible outside the package, which might be useful later on. Maybe not in this demo, but later on, if you need access to this login request at some point outside this specific package. I'm going back to authorization. And here I need to store them in a the server. The server is declared in HTTP.go, HTTP.go. And then here I'm going to make a new variable. How am I going to store this request information per user? I'm going to create a new unique ID and I will call it a session ID. And that's how we are going to track this information on a per user basis. So login request is going to be a map. And then this string key is going to be a unique session ID. If I make a map, I also need to use the make function to initialize the map. Make right here, save this. And then now I'm going to say session ID is going to be OIDC get random string. And I'm going to make it pretty long, so it's definitely unique. If there's an error, then return error. And we're going to say get random string error, and we return the error. And then we also need to stop from this function. And here as well, we need to stop the function. So once we have a session ID, we can say login request within the server. So the, this S comes from the server. It's a pointer. So changes that we make here are actually saved the next request as well. So if later on we hit another endpoint, this login request will contain the same information. Login request is a map. A session ID is going to be my key. And then I'm going to have a new login request struct with client ID, redirect URI, scope, response type, although I probably never will need this, just for completeness, and the state. This will be saved until the server stops. So if the server stops, it will be gone. So if we stop a server, then the sessions will be unknown to the server because we are not persisting this to disk. But for our use case, that is fine. If we stop a server, the sessions can be as well gone. If you would like to run this in the production environment and you want to keep the sessions, you would need a session store like a Redis server where you would store these sessions, for example, that if you have multiple authorization service running, and then you deploy a new version that you still keep track of the sessions. So now we have our login requests. What are we going to do? We are going now to send the user a redirect with the session ID so that we can keep track of the session ID. A redirect is done at the header level. So if you do header add, location and we're going to redirect our user to slash login and that's where we will have our login page where the user can enter his login and password and to keep track of this user now that is on a different page we're going to pass this session id and we can do fmt sprint f to make it nice and the session id is going to be session id and then as a header, as the HTTP status header, we are going to say HTTP found, status found, which is 302. So we found the location, we found the page, and we are redirecting the user to a different location. 
gonna save this. And like I said, I will have tests available to see if our implementation is working correctly. It doesn't test on everything and I will probably add tests over time. So just have a look here and see how many tests there are. Right now there's one, there might be more in the future. You do run test. And what will this one do? It will build this endpoint based on app one and it's going to do new requests. So it's using the HTTP test package, doing a new request, and then it's checking whether we have the HP status found and the whether we have location. So redirect URI is empty, location had not set. So we might have done something wrong. And yes, we have done something wrong. We are checking for redirect URI, but we should be checking for redirect URI with an underscore. All the other ones look correct. Run again. And now we passed our test. We got the location, location is slash login, and this is the session ID. So this test is enough for now. If you wrote something wrong, we will see it in one of the next lectures because then we are going to build this login page. There might always be a mistake in your code that come up, will come out later once you test the whole flow. And that's why I probably want to add a little bit more test cases over time. This one is already quite decent actually, because you see we are passing all this information. And actually this is wrong now that I'm looking at it. We don't pass the client secret. Let me just correct this, run the test again, and the test still works because we are not using this client secret. So there's no reason to pass it in our test. So client ID is a client ID, redirect URI is the first redirect URI, response type is code, and the state is a random string. So it looks all good. We can continue with the slash login implementation. In this demo, I'll be handling the login flow. So now that we went to the entries endpoint, we got a redirect to the login endpoint. So we have initialized our flow and now the authorization server should get us a login and password page where the end user can then log in, click submit or login. And then we are going to do a post request. It makes more sense to do that on the same endpoint. So if you are going to log in, we do a get request, we get a login box, we do a post request on the login endpoint with our login and password and our session ID and then the authorization server should check whether our login and password is correct. If it is correct, then the authorization server should redirect us to the redirect URI that has been specified when we went to the authorized endpoint. So let's try that out. Let's see if we can put it in code. This is the login.go, the login endpoint. And what are we going to do on this login endpoint? First, if it is a get request, we are going to show a login page and I already have a template for that. We are using this embedding. So these lines here, they make sure that the templates folder is actually embedded in the binary of Go so that we don't have to supply it separately. So the templates directory is right here. In the templates directory, we have a login.html. So we're basically bundling this with the binary. And to bundle this with the binary, we can use the slash slash, which is a comment, but it will be interpreted by the Go compiler, go colon embed the templates directory. And the templates directory will now then be accessible using this template FS variable. So here I put a comment to access the login template, use the template fs.open templates login.html, which will then load this login HTML file, the contents of this file into the template file. And then we can use this template file. So let's try this out. If there was an error with loading this file, we can do a return error again. And we can say 
template fs open error error and then we can output a template file what is a template file fs file so we still need to read the contents of that file io read all can do this io read all expects an io reader and template file is of fs file which is also implementing an io reader so if i do io read all template file i will have all the template file bytes and i will get an error if something went wrong this needs another return and this i want to copy paste read all error and template file let's have a look at this login.html first so this is what we want to show the user it's just an html file it's a login example you are free to change this into your own login form so it's a login form so we have the login input and the password input that if we then going to click this submit button here this login button then we'll do a post on slash login we also have room here for a session id so this is a type of type hidden so that means that we will not see it on the screen but it's still being passed as a variable to the slash login endpoint when we are doing a post on it so this session id we can actually then replace with our session id because when we are getting this redirect the redirect is happening on slash login but we are also passing this session id this unique code we have generated so let's try to extract this session id replace this in this login.html and then let's just output that to the user and then the user should be able to log in so we should have done that first probably how do we read this again r url r u r url query get session id make sure that it is exactly the same session id is a string if session id is then empty let's return an error to the client so now you have the session id template file string equals we are going to do a place of the session id strings replace we can use for that strings replace and let's copy this just to make sure we don't make any typos strings replace session id into the session id oh and we need to also pass this template file bytes so replace is first a string then the old string and a new string so the string where we want to do replacement needs to also be of string now it's of bytes so i'm just going to put string around it so now it will convert from bytes to string then we replace this string and we look for the string session id and we replace it into session id how many times minus one is no limit so minus one this is a new variable so a colon and then i think we can just output it all right template file string and then we indeed we need to convert it to byte that's what visual studio did for me and did we miss something i don't think so let's just 
test this to be sure. Go run and allow. I will just use curl, but you can also just use your browser, localhost 8080 login. Session ID is empty. Okay. ABC. And now I get the HTML. And the session ID here is filled out, so the replace also works. So now if I open this in a browser, or if I go to a browser to the authorization endpoint, then I get redirected. Then it will show this HTML. I click submit, and then there will be a post request happening. So before we are going to test the flow in the application server, let's just finish this login endpoint by splitting out get and post. And if there's a post, we need to try to log in. Then redirect to the redirect URI with the code. And I think if you have that, we can start working on the application server because we can then already test part of the flow. If our method is post, then we are going to do something else. We are going to check whether the user is authenticated. And otherwise, we are going to just return this HTML. When we do a post request, we can use the post form variable. Post form contains the parsed form data from patch, post, or put body parameters. So we first get the login, we press the submit button, then we hit again the slash login with the login password and session ID. And then we need to be able to parse these three elements. And to be able to parse these three elements, we can use the parse form. So they say this field is only available after parse form is called. So we first need to do a parse form, our parse form. And it doesn't take any parameters, but it can return error. So if you say error equals parse form, what if there's an error, then we're going to return the error, return error, parse form error, and then return out of the function. And if that doesn't give any error, then we should be able to use post form get and we should be able to use our session ID. So it makes sense to first retrieve our session ID because before we're going to test a login, we want to make sure that we have information on this user. How do we know whether we have information on this user? Well, if we have the login request session ID set login request OK equals login request session ID. If OK, which is a Boolean, if OK is set to true, then we have this key in this map, the login request map, and then the login request will contain the login request. If not OK, then we can return an error. Login request, login session, session, session not found. So now we have the login request that has been created at the authorization endpoint as login request session ID. So now we are just checking whether we can find this. And now that we have this, we have the redirect URI, we have the scope, we have the state, and we can use that. Next, we can do the authentication flow. So we have this users auth that we can use, users auth. Now users is imported. And we can pass login passwords, MFA, if we have MFA, but we don't really have MFA implemented here. So I'm going to use an empty string and then it will be returning three variables. Whether we are authenticated, the user, and whether we have an error. 
what do we pass? Our post form post form get login and this needs to match the input boxes. So the input boxes from the HTML form are also login and password. If we have an error, authentication error. Now we can say if the authentication was successful, we do something. If the authentication was not successful, we probably need to return an error. We can redirect the user back to the login page with an error, or we can just output something to keep it simple. I will just output something. W write header HTTP status unauthorized W write byte and then authentication failed. The authentication was failed. If we are authenticated though, then we need to do some extra work. We need to do another redirect. So we're going to do another location. We need to do another redirect to the request you write that is in the login request. FMT aspirin F login request redirect URI. So we redirect to this redirect URI if the authentication is successful, but we also need to supply the code and the state. So we have a code that we still need to generate and the state is going to be login request state. So we're just going to return back the state so that the app server could potentially check this. The code is going to be a unique string again. So we can just generate a unique string. We just need to make sure that if we generate a new string, that we can still find it somewhere on our server. And also we need to do a w write header HTTP status font. Otherwise it's not going to work. So let's generate a new code. YDC get random string. How long? Doesn't really matter. 64 sounds about right. There's also an error that comes back. Get random string error. But how can we then later on find this user? we'll have to create something new in our server struct. Otherwise we cannot find this. We also need to save this user object. This user object looks like this. We want to save this. This is some user information that we need to know in the server. If the app server asks for some user information, we need to be able to return that. So why do we need to be able to keep the code, it's because there will be another request on slash token and then the app server will supply us this code with the client secret and will then want to have a JLT token. But we can only return this JLT token if we know what code we issued. So we're going to store this code somewhere. Let's go back to HTTP and let's create another map. And let's just call this codes. We need to initialize it again. Codes make map of string. And we can reuse this login request. So now that we have the code, we can say as codes. We use code as a key. And we say it equals to login request. But now we also want to add some more information because we still have this user variable that we also want to store. And we should also keep track of when those codes are issued so that we can have a timeout on them. So let's go to the types. 
and let's just add a few fields here code issued at time time and user users user so let's now add these extra fields login request code issued at time now and this should be code issued at code issued at login requests user is equal to the user and then we assign this to the s codes that is a map with all the codes in there with the login requests and then it has a code and it maps to a login request now that we have logged in a user we could as well delete the session id so we have the s login request session id that we want to remove so how do we do that delete we can use for that so delete the map the map is the s login request and the key that we want to delete is the session id so then we also remove the session id from the login request so that we cannot log in twice is there anything else that we need it looks good let's have a look at these tests We have a test login get, which passed. Here we are also passing the client secret, which is not necessary. It's because I copy pasted this. I will have to remove it everywhere. Because it first does the authorization flow and then is going to do the login flow. So we are doing this flow and then I will have to remove this client secret everywhere. So here we are doing the authorization flow, the login get flow, and then the login post flow. And we are expecting a location and a code. So let's try again this test login get. That works, test login post, and this also passed. So we have the redirect URI, the code that has been generated, and then the state. As state, we are just passing a random string so that's fine if you change your login values in the users package then you might want to change them here as well so here we are doing the login get flow then the login post flow and then we are checking where you have the location so this all looks pretty good so i think we are now ready to start working on our application server we'll still need one more small thing before we can do that but then we can already test our authorization and login flow to see if we get a code back and then afterwards if we get a code then we can start working on the token exchange once we have a code the application server can actually go to the authorization server with the secret that we don't know here the client doesn't know it the browser is not going to know it the application server is the only one that can go to the authorization server to get these tokens. It's time now to start working on the app server. But before we can do that, we need to make the discovery endpoint. And the reason why we need the discovery endpoint is that we don't really want to pass to our application server all the endpoints that are possible, like the authorized endpoint, the token endpoint, the endpoint where we'll find all the public keys. There are a lot of endpoints in OIDC. So there is actually a mechanism where you specify just one URL, the discovery URL. And that discovery URL will reply all the URLs in a JSON. And then within the app, once we want to use OIDC, once we need to know a URL like the authorization endpoint, we can go to that endpoint, do a GET request, get a JSON, translate the JSON into a Go struct, and then we can use the individual URLs. If you have a look at the types, 
here is this discovery struct. So this discovery struct is standardized. So I already put it in place in the OIDC package. So the JSON is going to contain the issuer, the authorization endpoint, the token endpoint, the user info endpoint. So we just need to make sure that we generate that in the server. The server has this endpoint defined. It's also standardized dot well known slash open ID configuration. So if you're going to pass an OIDC URL to an application, that application will know that it needs to go to the well known open ID configuration to get the discovery information. We just need to make sure that the discovery function right here actually gives the correct information. Let's try to build this endpoint. Discovery is a new discovery struct from OIDC discovery. And then we just are going one by one define all these variables. The issuer is going to be the sconfig URL, the authorization endpoint sconfig URL. And now it depends whether we added a slash at the end for the URL. If you didn't add a slash here, then you need to add a slash in the discovery. You can still do a string replace on double slashes or actually parse every URL. That's also possible. Authorization is our authorization endpoint. Token endpoint is slash token. User info endpoint is user info. JWKS URI is going to be jwks.json. So we only did the authorization endpoint for now. We still have to do all these other endpoints. Scope supported. What are the scopes that we support? Currently ORIC. Response time supported. What are we going to respond? A code. Token endpoint authentication method supported. So let's say you go directly to the token. What is the authentication method that is supported? We don't have any authentication method supported. Now we need to reply JSON. So JSON Marshall, JSON Marshall, discovery. If there's an error, which is very unlikely, but we still need to capture it. Colon here. And then we can write the output. Go run main.go. Curl localhost 8080. I'll just copy paste it to be sure. And then we have it. The issuer, authorization, endpoint, token endpoint. And if I pass this through JQ, then I can actually have it much nicer. Authorization, token, user info, JWKS. That looks all good. Scope support, ORDC. So if we are going to support more, we can add more to that as well. Offline tokens, if you want to be able to refresh tokens. But then we will have to add more code to support all these. So for now, we are just implementing one flow. So ORDC is actually good enough. We're actually not going to do anything with this scope supported anyways. Our application server is only going to use this authorization endpoint and then maybe the user info endpoint. It's only going to use these endpoints here to use these scope supported. It's just going to ignore. So that looks all good. And the next step is then going to be to build the application server. So in the application server, we can now pass this one URL 
our authorization server and our application can then retrieve the URLs that it needs. Okay, let's get started with the application server. So what do we need to do? We are going to create a login button and the login button is then going to redirect to our authorization endpoint. And that will then handle the login process. What's going to be our redirect URL? This one, localhost 8081 callback. This will have to supply to the authorization endpoint. How do we know the authorization endpoint? Well, we'll first have to retrieve this well-known open ID configuration and parse this. Let's start with the OIDC endpoint. The OIDC endpoint we are going to pass as an environment variable. Now we have the OIDC endpoint and we have this helper function here in discovery.go in ORDC. Discovery.go will do a get request and parse this into the discovery struct. So very simple function. Let's use this instead of writing this ourselves. It's just some very simple HTTP get function. OIDC parse discovery. What do we need to pass? The Endpoint. So we have the ORDC endpoint, and then we're going to add this well known open ID configuration. Discovery equals discovery and error. What if we have an error? Let's do the same as we did with the server. Let's have a return error function. But if something goes wrong on the application server, it's most of the time going to be an internal server error, which is an error 500. That's probably a better error code to use on the application server. If error is not equal to nil, then return error. parse discovery error and then return. Let's start to build this authorization URL. Authorization URL is values as printf. First we have the URL. This comes from the discovery endpoint. And then we need to supply some parameters. We have to pass client ID, which will be supplied also as an environment variable. Client ID will have the scope. Scope is open ID. We will have, well, let's have a look on our slide just to be sure. Client ID, we need to redirect to URI, the scope and the response type and the state. Response type code, state is the state. And what else did we need? The redirect URI. So this redirect URI is going to be a constant localhost 8081 callback. redirect URI, the constant, and then what else do we have? Just the state. And the state is going to be a unique string again. So we can just say state error equals YDC get random string. How long? 64 should be fine. And then we need to capture the error and we can pass the state. I think we have everything. Now we just need to return something to the browser. How do we return something? Well, just some HTML we're going to return.
Let's try backticks. Yeah, that looks better. Body. And then we're just gonna have one simple button with a link. And where are we going to redirect our user when they click the link to the authorization URL? And we have the button login. I think this should work. It's not very pretty. Let's maybe just make sure that it's wide enough so we can pass the width touch to it let's try to get this started what do we need to pass the client id client id should be one two three four client id client id one two three four and oidc url OIDC endpoint and that is localhost 8080 and then go run let's make this a bit bigger maybe go run go run cmd app server main.go and let's now just open our browser localhost 8081 here we have our login button and this is going to redirect us to localhost localhost 8080 authorization client ID 1234 redirect URI there's a callback scope is open ID response type is codes and then the state is this unique string and I made a typo I see localhost it's here in the config and then I will need to restart my server Let's try this again. I will need to refresh this page, otherwise it will still direct me to the old URL. Now, login, and I get the form, because now we are hitting slash login. It's a get request. We got the redirect, so we basically first went to authorization, then the authorization made the redirect to slash login, and now we have the session ID as well. Login and password. So the login and password is going to be in the users package. So that's why we do the authentication. You can change the login there into your own name, for example. My login is Edward and the password is just password. Login. And then we have localhost 8081 callback with a code. Code equals a random string again from the server and we are hitting the application server with this code. The next step would then be for our application server to then use its client ID, client secret and code to get a token. We get a white page because we are not doing anything yet in slash code. So maybe let me just put something there, hit refresh to see if we are hitting this slash callback endpoint. So we wrote the index and here you have the callback. Callback code is our URL query get code. Restart application server refresh this callback code is and this is our code this code is visible for the end user but this code doesn't mean anything because i could just change the code here in my url bar we still need to go to the authorization server with our client secret to see whether we will get a token and only the token the id token will be the proof that we are authenticated writing this slash token endpoint is going to be the next step so now that we have implemented the authorization endpoint the login page both get and post now we are able to do the redirect back to the callback the application server gets the code and now wants to exchange the code using this slash 
token endpoint. With the slash token endpoint, we can exchange our code into tokens. We do a post request with grant type is authorization code. We need to supply the client ID, the client secret, the redirect URI again, and the code. And then the token endpoint will give us a token if everything goes okay. So let's try to write the necessary code that we need to put in this slash token endpoint to make it work. So slash token goes to s token. And then we have here our function signature that is still empty. What is the first thing that we need to check? Is this a post request? If it is not a post request, then return an error. Not a post request. Then we need to parse again these post entries. And for that, again, we need this parse form. So if there's an error with parse form, then we again need to return an error. Let's not forget this return here in case something goes wrong. And if parse form goes wrong, parse form error. And now we can use the R post form get and we have the code but what else do we have this grant type so this needs to be equal to authorization code if it is not equal to authorization code then we again can return an error we can say invalid grant type we can always return what the grant type was so that it's a bit easier for debugging. So what is the code now? The code is our post form get code. We need to do a lookup of that code. So we can say login request OK equals S code. And then the key of this map is the code. Code. Codes, I think it is. Codes, okay, that's it. If not okay, we will say that we couldn't find a code. Invalid code. If we have the code, we still need to check whether the code is still valid. Login request had a code issued at. If the time now is after, I will save after code issued at, and we're going to add 10 minutes. If the time now, so now we are a specific time if it's after the code that is issued at a specific time plus 10 minutes then we are also going to return that the code is expired so you have 10 minutes to complete this flow you can change these values in a bit less time or more time doesn't really matter what else do we need to be checking we pass the client ID and the client secret. We also need to check that. Is the client ID equal to post form get client ID? If it's not equal, we can say invalid client ID, client ID mismatch. And we do the same for login request client secret, which we are not saving in the login request. So let's change maybe a little bit our authorization flow. 
and a login request. Let's add app config. App config is the app config. The app config I extracted right here somewhere. See, we have here the app config. So that way we have the config information. And login request app config client secret needs to be equal to the post form client secret. Otherwise, it's also not good. And then we can say invalid client secret if it's not the same. Next, we also need to validate whether the redirect URI is still the same. If login request redirect URI is not equal to our post form get redirect URI, then we are going to say that the redirect URI is invalid. Let's have a look on our slide again. We do a post, we check for post, grant type, authorization code, we have that. Client ID, we checked. Client secret, we checked. Redirect URI, we checked. And the code, we also checked because if it's not in the map, we had an invalid code. So now we can issue these JLTs. How do we issue JLTs? Well, we can use the JLT library. The Golang JLT, JLT. Let's have a look at the reference documentation. And we have here examples. Parsing, building and signing. Building and signing a token is what we need. And here we have an example of a JLT new with claims and the signing method. This signing method is HMAC, which is a method that shares a secret. We are not going to share a secret, we are going to use a private and a public key, so we will need another signing method. We will use a signing method for RSA keys. Then we're going to have the JLT map claims. These are key value pairs that will be in the JLT token that we supply. These are quite random here, foo and bar, but we will use some standardized ones. And then the next step will be to sign the token using our RSA private key, rather than here, this HMAC sample secret. First step is maybe to get the private key. We have this S private key, which is still in byte format, it's in PEM format. But luckily this JLT has a private key function to convert this, but we might have to import it first. GitHub.com Golang JLT, JLT version 4. I will need to do go get. Maybe I already did it earlier, but it doesn't hurt. JLT, and then we have some parse functions here. Parse RSA private key from PEM. Parse RSA private key from PEM. And then we just need to input a byte. So that's what we need. And then we get a private key and an error. If the error is not equal to nil, then let's return our error. Private key parsing error, error. Let's create a new JLT. JLT new with claims is going to return as a token. That's fine. New JLT with claims. The method, JLT signing method. So it's going to be RS for RSA and RSA 256 signing method RS256 should be okay. The other signing methods like 512 just uses another SHA algorithm, but we are going to use 
256 for our purposes. Then the claims, which should be of JLT claims. Let's maybe do that separately. JLT map claims we should be able to use. Map claims is a map string interface and that should work with the JLT claims because claims is an interface. So when we do a new with claims, it will generate a new token. There'll be a header, claims, and a method. Type will be JLT, algorithm will be then our RSA algorithm, and the, the claims will be here. So these are our key value pairs. And these key value pairs we can define right here. What are the key value pairs that we have to define? These claims are very standardized, so we have the claims standard claims and these are the standard claims structured version of the JLT claim set as referenced at the here at RFC so there's an RFC where they explain what your key name should be they even say here they do not follow the specification exactly the use of this is this Courage, that's why we are not going to use it. We are just going to use map claims and define our own claims. Which ones are the standard ones? So we need the audience expires at, issued at, the issuer, and definitely also the subject. Not before at, we could use. So let's start with the subject. Who is a subject? We have our login request here, login request user, and the user has a subject. So it is something that typically comes from the user itself. It needs to be like a unique login. Then we also have the issuer. The issuer is going to come from the config. Config URL is the issuer. The audience. So we're actually going to issue two tokens, an ID token and an access token. The ID token is for the application server to know whether we authenticated. The access token is for the application server if it wants to make API calls. So the audience for this ID token is going to be the client ID. So login request, client ID. Then we have the expiration, which is in Unix time. When it's going to expire, we can say one hour to keep it simple. It depends on your use case, how quickly you want it to expire. If it expires, a new one needs to be issued. If we would work with refresh tokens, then within one hour, the token needs to be refreshed with the refresh token. If you don't work with refresh token, you have to go through the whole login flow again. This is Unix time not before should be time now and issued at is also time now so then we have this token but we still need to sign the token and i want to make one more change to this token so we have the claims but we also need something specifically set in the header for our JWKS to work. So the way this public key endpoint is going to work, this JWKS.json, is that we need to specify a key ID. And because we only have one key, we are just going to specify a static number. 00001 is our key, because we only have one private key. And this is the key ID. So the key ID stands for key ID. And this is something that we need to put in the header. Now we can sign this JLT with our private key token sign string. So we're going to retrieve the sign string from this token. And we need to get a private key for that. This returns the signed token, signed ID token, and an error if there's something going wrong. If something went wrong, then we need to capture this.
assign string error error here. How are we going to return this? We have this OIDC token for that. So in types we have this token. So this is access token, token type, reverse token, expires in and ID token that we typically should return at the token endpoint. So we're going to use this one, OIDC token, so this is also standardized. Token output is OIDC token and token has the access token, the token type, the refresh token expires in an ID token. So we will actually need to create two tokens because we just created the ID token, which can be used to validate whether we are authenticated, but we also need an access token. Let's start with ID token is signed ID token. And then we're going to just copy paste this. And then this will be our access token. Signed access token. And then access token is the signed access token. But the access token needs to be looking a little bit different because it has different audience. And the audience is actually a string slice of the endpoint it can access. So what can it access? It can access any API that we would give access to, as in once we have a second application server and we would enter that in the audience here, then, then the second application server could actually parse the JLT, have a look in the audience, have a look whether it has access to a specific endpoint. Right now, we are just going to give it access to our user info endpoint. So we have our URL and with this token, the application server can go to our slash user info endpoint and we will then return some user info. So this is the difference between access token and our ID token. Token type is going to be bare. It's going to be bare token. So then we can use authorization bearer and then the token, the JOT token in HTTP access calls. What else do we have? Refresh token. So if you want to supply a refresh token, for example, when the scope is offline access, then you just need to generate a random string for here. And to make another endpoint that if this refresh token is supplied, that you issue a new JLT. Currently not going to do that. We are going to focus on this first flow that we are trying to implement. We have an expires in as well. Expires in is an integer. How many minutes will it expire in? So we have one hour. Token output, then we still need to parse it. Token output, JSON Marshall, our token output, out and error. And then we can check for errors. Token Marshall error, just in case that we have an error. And we need to do one more thing. So we are going to just write this first to the app server where it's connecting. But we also need to make sure that we remove this code. So we have this codes as codes where we keep all the codes. Now that we issued a token, we need to get rid of this. So as codes and we have the code. The code is our post form get code. So you also need to remove this code from the map. So then when the app server would execute it again, then it will fail because we don't have this code anymore. You just have to go through the whole flow again if you want to have a new token. You cannot reuse your codes. That looks 
okay, I think. Could be that there's still a mistake. How do we check for that? Well, that's why I wrote these tests. Token test. What is this going to do? First, going to hit the authorization endpoint, and here I will also remove this secret because it's not necessary for our first endpoint. I just copy pasted all this code multiple times, so that's why this the same mistake is in all these tests. So first hit authorization flow, we get the code or the redirect, we get the redirect, we go to the login flow, we get the code, and we need to then exchange the code into a token. And then we need a secret actually. So this all, and I didn't specify this last time, this all uses this test config. Test config is defined right here in HP test. And whenever we run our test, we are going to do a setup of this test config, which generates an RSA key. So we don't need an RSA key just to run a test. The test will actually generate its own key and we'll have here a map of some default configuration. Well, let's hope it works. No, it didn't work. And standard claims issued at needs to be of in64. Issued at Oh, I did time now. Needs to be Unix and that's an in64. And this also needs to be Unix. So that's why we have these tests. Easy to then find whether your code is working or not. Still not working. Cannot marshal string into GoStruct. Ah, because we have it two times. We have it two times. Once for our ID token. Once for our access token. And this works. Got valid token from a token endpoint. So I'm going to leave it at that. And then in the next lecture, we can try to see whether our application server can now get this token with the code that was supplied at the callback endpoint in our application server. Now that we have written the slash token endpoint, let's try to add this code to our web application to hit this token endpoint with our code and then retrieve our token. That will be step one to retrieve the token. Step two will be to validate the token. So I will first try to get a token and then we need to validate the token. To validate the token, we need the public key so we need another endpoint at the authorization server for that, the JWKS endpoint, which will output the public keys. We will need to parse that and then the public key we can use to validate our JWT that was returned or our JWTs that were returned. So let's first start with a post request on this slash token endpoint. We have still the app server. And then here in the callback, we have the code. This code we need to validate. We have a JWT and a JWT test. So if you use this JWT signature, get token from code, then it will be easier for us to validate our code because we have a test in JLD underscore test. Here we have a test to test the get token from code. So let's try to use this code get token from code. What do we need for that? The token URL, the JWKS URL, the redirect URI, client ID, client secret. So we can use this, we'll just copy paste it for now, this discovery endpoint. Token URL is discovery token endpoint. JWKS is discovery JWKS URI. Redirect URI is static. Client ID 
is client ID as an environment variable. Then we have the client secret, which will also pass as an environment variable. And then we have the code, which is coming as a query parameter. What does this return? A token claims an error. And we can say token received. claims subject. I'm not 100% sure whether I will use these standard claims because they are discouraged. Maybe just for the simple get token from, from code, but really map claims is much more flexible. So we probably should be using that. Token received. If token, oh, we also have the claims here if you want token claims. Hmm. Maybe we shouldn't even return the claims on token dot. Let's keep it like this for now. Save this. And let's start working on this get token from code. We'll have to do an HTTP post request on the token URL. And with a post, we have a URL, content type, and a body. What is the content type going to be? It's a specific content type for form encoding. And because this is actually a special type, there is post form. Post form issues a post to specify the URL, and then the content type header is set to application x www form URL encoded, so that we don't have to set it manually token URL and then the data, the URL values. So URL values is of type URL values. It's a map string and then a slice of strings. We have some add functions that we can use. What do we all need? We need to pass the client ID client ID, client secret, redirect URI, the code, and this grant type authorization code. Then we have this post form, response an error. If we have an error, then turn nil nil error, defer res body close, and then we can read the body. Res body, body error is IO read all because this is an IO reader. If res status code is not 200, let's also return something. We will then say status code was not 200. And I'll just output with the body for now to the screen here to see something happened. Not sure what's going to be this. Maybe we should just return not yet fully implemented. And then here in the main we can just say
get token from code error. As long as we didn't write the complete flow, then we will get this error, which makes sense, I think. So this get token from error, there's one thing we didn't do, and that is we didn't validate our state. So we generated here our state. We generated here our state in the index, get random string, but we didn't store it anywhere. So let's try to store it somewhere. We are not going to store anything in this state or match any user with this state. So I think it's enough to just store the state and then see if we issued this random state string in the callback. If not, then we just reject the request. If you are going to store something in the state or match a user or something else with it, then I would recommend you to encrypt the state so that nobody can change or read it what's really inside. And you can even pass it in a cookie with the client so that at the callback you could compare it with the client. So I'm going to keep it simple and create a state map string boolean, make map string boolean here for the state. And when I create this state, I'm going to add this, the state, I'll call it states, states. So that way I for sure know that the request originated from this index page and then here in the callback, we are going to check if OK, a states, and then the state, our URL, query, get state. If it's not OK, then we'll just return an error. Then we'll just return error, state mismatch error. And then we can remove this state, delete a state, the state. So that, that also means that if you're going to refresh this callback page, it will not work anymore. So we'll have to go back through the flow to get a new state. Should we try this out? I cannot test my code yet because I'm just checking whether I'm getting a token. We would still need to validate the token. Let's go and run the server. Client secret is the secret, which is configured in the config.yml. ORDC endpoint, go run, and then we also need to specify the j.t.go. Let's open the browser, localhost 8081, login. We can supply our login and password information. Get token from code not yet fully implemented, but did we get the token output on our screen? Yes, we did. So here we have the body, the access token, and the ID token will also be somewhere there. Refresh token expires in ID token. Now we just need to validate this token. So this is a JLT. You can actually input it in jlt.io, which is a simple JSON web token tool. And what do we see? Algorithm RS256, the key ID, the type, 
And here we have the audience, expiration date, issued at, issuer, not valid before, and the subject. If you would paste our public key here, then it would also be able to validate our signature. So it can decode it, but it cannot validate it because we still need to validate it. To validate it, we need to get a public key and to get a public key, we need to make this endpoint, the JWKS endpoint. And that's what we will be doing next. Now that our web application received our tokens, we still need to parse and validate those tokens. And to validate those tokens, we are going to do a get request to the JWKS endpoint. And that endpoint will supply us the public keys, the public keys that can be used to validate the JLT signatures. We'll have to write the JWKS endpoint where we will have to return a JSON with the public keys. We only have one, so we'll just have to output one public key in a standardized format and then our web application will get that json parse that and then see if we can validate the jlt with that public key that we received from the authorization server if everything is valid then the token is valid and we can be sure that the user is actually successfully logged in we can trust now this token and the contents within it it is now sure that the authorization server created that JLT and signed it with its private key. So this is where we left. The body is the token that has been returned from the slash token endpoint. So now we need to validate this JLT. So what I'm going to do is I'm first going to parse this body of our token is of type OIDC token and we're going to JSON unmarshal this body that is the JSON into this token if there is an error then we're going to return an unmarshal error unmarshal token error so we know where it comes from And now we can start validating the JLT. We're going to return the claims. And I was saying that we are going to use the standard claims. The standard claims because that's our, just needs to be a pointer. Our standard claims because that's our function signature. But then if you have a look at these standard claims, it says that they only support integer-based date fields and singular audiences. So what do they mean with that? You see here, not before, expired at, expires at, only supports integer-based fields, which we are only returning. So that would actually work for us, but singular audiences. Let's have another look at our token endpoint. And here we can see we have this ID token and this has a single audience. But if you look at our access token, here we have a slice. So we have multiple audiences. And this standard claims can only deal with a single audience. So what do they say here in documentation? Reduce registered claims instead for a forward compatible way to access registered claims. So yeah, I can actually just change this into registered claims and we just need to change this function signature and it is forward compatible. So our test will still work because here we also still have the subject. The subject is still a string, but we, if you need to use the audience, it's not just a string anymore. And if we have expires at, it's also not an integer anymore. So this should be a better way of using claims. What is then the next step? We need to parse this token. 
We have two tokens, but let's start with ID token. Parse with claims. And now our ID token should be in the token variable because we unmarshaled it. We're going to pass the claims. So the parse with claims will have a look at the claims that are within the token and put it in this claims variable. And then we have the key function. And the key function is going to be a function where we have to validate this signature of this JLT. And here we'll actually need this public key to be able to validate it. How does key function look like? JLT key function. Key function is a function, token and interface. If we just copy this, JLT token, and then we need a return, save this, and then we don't have a compile error, but we are not validating it yet. What does it return? A token and an error. I don't think we need a token, we just need the error, because if there's an error, then our token is invalid. Return nil nil fmt error token parsing failed and the error why it has failed. So if if the validation failed, then it will throw an error. So what do we return here still? I think we actually need a token, yeah, the JLD token. So I'll call this parsed token parse token claims and then we don't need to return an error just nil and this should be it we then need to start working on this validation code but we didn't implement our GLKS URL yet, so we'll have to do that first. We'll first have to go back to the authorization server, implement this JWKS URL, and then we can write a get to get the public key. In this lecture, I will show you how to do the JWKS parsing. So it's standardized, so we need to output a standardized JSON, and we will have to do that for every key. We only have one key, we have the private key in our server struct. So as private key is a byte slice. It's a byte slice because it is just the contents of this file, encryption key.pem, and this is a pem formatted file. So we'll have to first parse this, this private key into an RSA private key object. And I think we already did that earlier when we generated the token. So let's have a look how we did that previously. So here we have the private key. And we used the JLT parse RSA private key from PEM. Let's copy that. So now we have the private key. And the private key also has a public key and is the RSA public key. So we can say public key equals the RSA private key public key. Now we need to output this JLKS URL and because it's standardized, I already have it in OIDC declared so we have the JWKS struct that contains the keys. And for every key that is in this array, you have an E algorithm use KID and KTY. Key type. Is this going to be key type? So what does that mean? What does that mean? If we have a look at this public key, go to definition. Public key has this N and E. 
and an E here. So basically, this information is already known for us. It's the modulus and the public exponent. It's part of the RSA key. It's properties of the RSA key. So if we can output these in a readable format, because this is just a big int, we would need to convert this. If we can convert this, put this in a string, make sure that we fill out the fields algorithm and so on, then we actually already have what we need. We just need to be able to output the public key in an agreed format. The format that has been agreed on is to do it in Base64. So we'll have to Base64 convert it. So JWKS is equal to ORDC JWKS. And here we have the keys, which is of type ORDC JWKS key. And here we have one element. And this key, we need to give an identifier. So this identifier is going to be the KID. And I'm going to use 0001 as KID, because when I generated the JLT in token, I specified this header 0001 as KID. So this is the ID of the key I used to encrypt it. It can just be any string. It just needs to be an identifier. What else do you have? Use algorithm key type. Algorithm RS256. Key type RSA. Use signature. These three are just some informative fields. And then now we need the actual public key information, so N and E. RE is always going to be the same. So this exponent that we are going to use is always going to be the same. We can just define it as a static string. So this is already convert from the exponent. So if you have a look at public key, this exponent will always be like this. So we don't ha really have to convert it. Maybe in the future, if you have different exponents, then you might need another one. But for our purpose, this will work. For n, we're going to use a public key n dot bytes. And these bytes, we are going to convert because you cannot just send the bytes into this JSON attribute. We are going to convert them with base64. So we're going to have base64, base64 standard encoding and go to string. And that should be it. Now we can convert it. JSON Marshall, this JWKS, out an error. JWKS Marshall error, if there's an error. And if there's no error, W right out. Let's do a go run of the server. Curl localhost 8080 jwks.json. Uh, that looks pretty good with jq. So we have the keys, the n, the e, the algorithm, the use, the kid and the key type. So the next step is to go back to our application server, do a get on this URL, parse this back into the JWS struct, and then use this to validate our JWT. Now that we have the JWKS endpoint available, let's go back to our application server. So how does this parse with claims work? Parse with claims will be executed and then this function will be invoked and we then need to return the public key. Here it accepts an interface, so anything can be returned. We should return an RSA public key. And when we return an RSA public key, then the public key will be, then the 
token validation will happen with the public key. So the signature will be compared. This is all done in this JLT package. We just need to supply this RSA public key. To do that, we need to first extract this K ID. So we have access to this token. So this token is parsed, but not validated yet. So if you have a look at token header K ID, that will be the K ID. If we don't have the K ID, then we need to return an error. K ID not found. If we have the K ID, then we should return the public key. Let's write a separate function for that. So we have the public key that we need, the error that can be returned, and we can say get public key from JLKS. JLKS URL we need to supply, and this KID we need to supply. KID is of type interface, but it's really a string, so we need to still convert this to a string. If we then have an error, let's just then return the error. If you don't have an error, let's return this public key. Function signature, get public key from JLKS. JLKS URL is a string and the KID is a string. What do we return? An, RS, an RSA public key. And this will come as a pointer, so I'm just going to return a pointer and the error. So what do we need to do here to get this public key? We need to do a get request on the JLKS URL. HTTP get on the JLKS URL, which returns a response and an error. If there's an error, then we will return this error. And otherwise we want to read the body. So we're going to defer the rest body clause. Body error is equal to IO read all. Rest body. If there's an error, then we return an error. And now we can parse the JLKS contents, which is a JSON. So JSON unmarshal. Data is in the body. And we are going to parse it as JLQS. ORDC JLQS. JLQS. Again, if we have an error, then we return an error. If res status code is not 200, we're also going to return an error because then the JSON will probably not be valid. And we should put that probably in front of the unmarshalling. Should go right here. Parse JLQS. And now we need to do the opposite of what we did. We first need to loop. So press entry, key entry is jlks.keys. So now we have the keys and we need to see if there is a key with the KID range here with the KID that is equal to my KID, my KID here that I supplied. If it is equal, then we can extract. If we didn't find a KID, then we can say no public key found with KID, KID. So how do we extract this? 
again with page 64. Standard encoding, decode, decode string, jQuery key entry, and then the n. What does this return? And bytes error if error is not equals to nil return then an error decode string error but the n is still in bytes and it is actually a big int remember when we were doing this jlqs then we had a public key and the n is in a big int format. So we still need to convert the bytes back into a big int. n is big from the big package because this is also big, big int. So we're gonna do a big int, new int. New int accepts an int64 and returns a pointer to a big integer. We're just going to say zero because we actually want to do an n set bytes because we have bytes. Sets z to that value and then returns z. But I don't think we need to return because it's just going to set n to the bytes. And then we can return an RSA public key. We don't need to pass an error because we don't have an error. And n is n. We don't really have to pass this e because this e is going to be defaulting to this. So not really necessary. Here we still need to return the error. Let's have a look. It actually looks like it's finished now because we did the get request. We passed the JLQS. We checked whether there was a KID. We decoded this string create a new public key with the modulus. So we get the public key right here, we return the public key so that the JLT parsed with claims can validate the ID token. If we have an error, then token parsing failed. Otherwise we'll just return the parse token and the claims. As I have a look at the main function, so if you don't get an error here, then it is valid. Let's run the server. And let's run the application server. And actually just before I'm going to run the application server, I'm going to run this test. Because I have a test to test whether this actually works. And it failed. Verification error. Token parsing failed. RSA verification error. So we still might have something wrong. I have this JLQS endpoint here that is actually an HTTP test new server. So I have this mock server that I created with a slash token endpoint and a slash jlqs.json endpoint. And here I just create a new key and we create a new token, return that. So it's just a part of the server that is being mocked here. And we get an error from the get token from code. Crypto RSA verification error. And actually I had a look offline for a second and it's very logical where I made a mistake because I said earlier in this lecture that we can just use E. Because it will default to the value that we need. But that's actually not true because you see here E is zero. And the value that we need, if we have another look, 
at our glks. It's this value and it's definitely not, not zero. It's not zero, but it's actually constant still. So if we just go back here at this constant here, which you can find on the internet, this exponent is a constant, or you can probably also decode it from this, but if it's a constant anyways, we can also put the exponent as a constant. And then let's run the test again. And the test seemed to work. So let's now run the app server. And let's get back to our app server, login. And now we get a token received and also the validation should have happened. So if we now go back to our main.go, you see the claims now of type registered claims has this subject, the sub claim, and it didn't throw an error. So now we can be sure that the user has been logged in, the token is valid, and we have the subject. What is next? Let's have a look at our HTTP endpoint. So we did the authorization endpoint, the token, the login, the JWKS, the well-known, and the last one that we have here is the user info. Right here we have these claims from the registered claims, but it doesn't really contain a lot of information. And you also want to keep your JLT quite lightweight in general. So what you can do is when you make the initial call, which we do here, we say scope open ID, you can also add more scopes. You can add a profile or you can add email to have these included into your JLT and then you can parse them in your claims. That's one way. Or another way is that we have also an access token and this access token can go back to the authorization endpoint and hit this user info. This user info will then return us some more information about the user in JSON format. In this lecture, I will show you how to build the user info endpoint. So this user info endpoint works a little bit different because now we actually have a token. The user info endpoint expects that token in the authorization header. And that is what you see here below. The authorization header needs to contain the token and with the keyword bearer. The ID token is for the application to validate whether the user is logged in. The access token is a token that we can use to make API calls. So to make an API call to the user info endpoint, we need the access token. And the access token also has the audience claim that states the URL of the user info endpoint. So we could actually also check on that to make sure that the application doesn't use the ID token to get to the user info endpoint. Once the token is validated, then the authorization server can reply some user info in a standardized JSON. You can have a look at the ORDC specification document if you want to see the specification of that JSON. It's already something that we have in our users package, so I'll be just returning the user. Here we have our user info endpoint. What is the first thing we need to do? We need to extract the token from the authorization header. authorization header equals our header get authorization. The authorization header has a prefix bearer, so we can remove that. Strings replace bearer in this authorization header to nothing. We can also check whether the authorization header was supplied. So if the authorization header was empty, then we return an error. Authorization header empty. JWT 
parse with claims we can use again. Token string is going to be the authorization header. The claims we can use again. Registered claims. You can also use map claims. Map claims is just a map and then you can parse yourself. Let's see how far we can get with these registered claims. Authorization header claims expect a pointer and then again this function signature JLT key func you see I cannot remember any signature I just need always to have a look in the documentation and that then returns a token and an error do we need a token Probably not, because we can continue with the claims. So let's see what we can return. Return private key. Ah, we still need to parse the private key. Private key equals GLT parse. RSA private key from PEM, S private key, and this can return an error. If error is not equal to nil, then return the error parse private key error. Error. Return private key public key nil no error that should work and then we get the error back from the parse with claims what if there's an error then we have an invalid token parse token error and return so if you come at this point we are sure that our token is valid but does our token have access to this endpoint so we can have a look where it has access for audience in claims audience but what is audience actually audience is a claim string claim string is basically just a slice of strings this type is necessary since Art claim can either be a single string or an array. So if there's a single string, they will put it still in an array when they do the JSON Marshall. And that's when I do this. They have this Marshall JSON and unmarshall JSON, which are the custom functions that are being invoked when they marshal or unmarshal JSON. So actually I just need the range keyword. That should work. And now I have an audience font is false if audience is equal to the config URL plus the user info then font is true and if font is false then we didn't find this and then we can say return error token has incorrect audience and we can even output the audience just in case that we get an error that we can easily debug it so what's the audience of this token we can join this claims audience together with a comma so now we know for sure that this token has been issued using our private key because we have this validate function with our public key we are sure that the token has access to this endpoint because we checked the audience now we need to return the user the user is the subject let's have a look at our users package so we did the authentication we returned the user this is our subject so we can compare our subject from our token to the subject here and then return the user the user has the json 
sub name, given name, family name, preferred username, email and picture, which is our standardized response that we need. For users in for user in range users get all users if user sub equals to claims subject and let's also check if claim subject is not empty just to be sure if it's empty then return error if something goes wrong in our in our authorization server and we would issue a token with an empty subject we don't really start comparing this so subject is empty just as a safety measure if we find it what are we going to do json marshall this user and if there's an error then we are going to return error and otherwise we're going to write the output and if you didn't find the user then if you didn't find the user then we do a return error where we say user not found Turn. We have a user info test that we can use to test our code that we just have written. Test user info. And we get an error. We get status code 400. Parse token error keys of invalid type. Let's have a look. Keys of invalid type. And I guess this should be a pointer to the RSA public key. Because otherwise it probably doesn't check for both the RSA public key type and the pointer type. And now it is working. Call to user is for JSON, the subject the name, the given name, family name, preferred username email and the picture is empty. So this is the user info endpoint. You can have a look at this test to see what is actually necessary to go to the whole flow. So this is using the HTTP test package to do requests on the authorization, to do on the login flow and so on all the way until we hit this user info endpoint. We are now going to do the same, but in the application server. In the next lecture. So now we will need to hit this user info endpoint and see if we can display this to our end user. So this is really going to be our last step for our OIDC flow, our first simple flow that we have in our OIDC server, our authorization server. We're just going to hit this user info endpoint with our application server to test whether everything works. And then we should be able to use this authorization server as an authorization server also for other applications that support the ORDC flow. Let's have a look at this main. So in this main, we have this callback and then we have access to our token. Maybe let's return also the access token or let's just return access token and not the ID token. So let's copy this. Access token claims. Access token. Parsed access token. Access token also has the KID. So we should be able to verify that. And then let's just return this parsed access token. And together also the parsed token. Or let's not do that because we have to change too much. I'm just going to only 
return the access token because we were not even using the identity token we were just verifying it parse the access token save access token so we So now we need to do a call and we need to change the request headers. So our call will look a little bit different. New request. It's a get request. The URL is going to be on discovery user info endpoint. And then the body is going to be nil. This is going to be request. If error is not equal to nil, return an error. New request error. Request header add authorization. In the authorization, we have the bear and then the access token access token raw is a string so this should be the access token now we have the request we still need an HTTP client HTTP client and we can do an action using a request and this gives us back the response just like we would do HTTP get and post do request error defer res body close and let's get a body read all res body read all error and I'll just print out the body. Let's send it. Token received. User info. And then the body. I'm going to make this FMTS print F. The comma here. Res body like this we still have an error somewhere we are not using the claims save this run the server run the app server this is from previously state mismatch error so if we try to refresh it it doesn't work so our authorization server is doing this correctly. We cannot use our previous state and our previous code to get a new token. Let's authenticate again. And token received, token validated. We went to the user info endpoint and the user info endpoint gives us back this subject, the name, given name, family name, and so on. So this is now the whole flow that we completed. The authorization, the callback, we have created every endpoint that we need. So if you want to plug in now another OIDC compatible application, that should work. We might not have implemented the complete protocol. So here and there you might have to add something. For example, if the implementation expects that it would receive some more claims if it adds the profile to the scope, then you would also need to implement that. This is a basic ORDC server, but it's a great starting point to extend it if you need any of those features, because all difficult implementation is actually done at this point. The application server is also very basic, of course, because we are not really saving this token or anything right here. So what you could do is you could change the application server to store this token somewhere locally. 
so that per user you can then access their tokens. You can then use the tokens for authentication validation, is user authenticated, or for authorization, what else does exist in this token? Maybe the user is in some group that has then special access on your application server. And also you have the access token that you can use to make API calls to the user info, but maybe to another application server that is running. So if you then need to make a call to another application server, you can then use the access token. Those tokens will expire. So within an hour, this token will not work. So you will either need to authenticate again or implement the offline access. That means that you have, need to have code where you can then refresh the token. So if you have a valid JWT, you can then get a new JWT with another 60 minutes, as long as you have a refresh token. We haven't implemented that, but that shouldn't be too difficult to implement at this point. Also, some authorization servers, they don't really look at the offline access scope. They just give you automatically a refresh token. It all depends. You have the reference documentation of ORDC. Everyone can do the implementation. Some implementations are not completely following the reference documentation, but that is often okay because the standard also leaves some room to do your own implementation. It kind of gives you a minimum that you should implement, but then for example, the user info endpoint could also return us a few more fields that is not really specified in this standard. So that is it for our minimal authorization server. If you would find mistakes in there or you want to do some improvements, all PRs on my GitHub are welcome. If they are adding functionality, I might not immediately merge them with the solution that we have, but I might, for example, create another directory in my GitHub repository with a V2 where we can have some improvements that were out of scope for these lectures. Now that we have an OIDC compatible authorization server, we can start adding applications that support OIDC. There are a lot of applications and SaaS applications that support OIDC, often next to SAML. There's also companies that can act as an OIDC provider itself, like Google, Apple, Facebook. Those social media logins have OIDC capabilities. You could either use the authorization server and trust their token, or write an integration to validate a successful social login and issue your own token with your own server. Often plugins are available to existing tools and software to implement ORDC. In the next lectures, I will show you the ORDC integration with Jenkins, which is a popular CI CD tool, and AWS. I am Federation with ORDC in AWS. We'll make AWS trust our ID token to issue access keys to our users. So within AWS, we can do federation and we can say that if a user can log into a specific app, then that user can be granted AWS access keys to be able to use the AWS services using the AWS API. In this demo, I want to show you that our authorization server actually works with real world applications. I'm going to set up a Jenkins server and I'm going to change the authentication part into OpenID Connect, OIDC. And I'm going to use our authorization server for that. So Jenkins will be another application for our authorization server. Let's first start to run the server. And I opened already the config here because we will need another redirect URI here. So we could actually create another app if you want, or we could just reuse this app. The smartest thing would actually be to create a Jenkins application. Client ID 1235. Secret is secret. The issue is the same. And the callback will have to change. But I don't know yet what the callback is. We'll change it. Then we need to run a Jenkins server and we can do that using Docker. So if you don't have Docker installed, it's best to install Docker, Docker for Windows or Docker for Mac. And then you can use Docker commands. 
there is an image Jenkins slash Jenkins and it has the LTS tag and this will launch a Jenkins image. I'm just going to add a few flags. I'm going to add a volume. The volume is called Jenkins. I'm going to mount it in var Jenkins home and I'm going to expose a port 8090 and I'm going to map it to 8080. So 8080 on Jenkins is going to map to 8090 on my machine. Minus IT so they can hit control C when necessary. And then maybe I can also add minus minus RM. So if I quit my container, then it will be automatically deleted. It will not delete the volume, so we can then still launch Jenkins later on. You can also give the name, name Jenkins, if you want to find it easier in the process list. And then actually I need just docker run because we are running docker run Jenkins Jenkins with all these flags and then we can start it. So you have to wait a few seconds. And then it says Jenkins initial setup is required and admin user has been created and a password generated. So please use the following password to proceed. So now we can go to localhost 1890. And then we should see this screen, unlock Jenkins. You can put this password. You can still find it here if you didn't see it in the output. And then we can install the suggested plugins or select plugins to install. I don't really need any plugins. I will just install plugins later on. And I can create a user. So let's do that. Jenkins URL. And we can start. So we have one user, my Edward user. But now we are going to configure OIDC. So I first need to install the OIDC plugin under available plugins, open ID. There's two plugins we can use, but I checked and this one has more installs. So most likely this one is better. Install. And then we can go back to the dashboard, manage Jenkins, configure global security. So security realm, Jenkins own user database or login with open ID connect. Client ID we then need to enter one, two, three, five. Client secret, secret. Configuration mode, automatic. Localhost 8080, well known, open ID configuration. And this will actually not work because now we are in our container. So we would have to reach our host system, which we cannot do. But there's an easy solution for that. And we'll also need it in the next demos. You can install something called ngrok. ngrok serve web commands with one command. You can sign up for free, but you can also just download it and you don't really need to sign up. macOS brew install ngrok. For Windows, you can download the zip file or do it with Chocolatey. Chocolatey is a package manager to easily install packages. Or even with Docker, you could do that, it looks like. But I'm going to use the macOS version. So I'm just going to open another window here. I have ngrok already installed and I'm going to do ngrok HTTP 8080. And that will give me an endpoint, this endpoint. And this is a public endpoint that will map to my localhost server. That I should be able to use here. And it's also HTTPS, so it's encrypted. This works. And now what I should actually do is to also change the configuration file. So I'm going to put this in place. And then stop the server, start the server again. 
And then in advanced, you can also have some more advanced options. So for example, the full name field for me is going to be name. So Jenkins will also hit our user info endpoint to get this extra information. We can also have an email field. I think that was email. I could have a look. If we have a look at users, we have here email. I could enter it there as well. So here we have name, sub, email. So let me just add email here. And you could also add a groups field name. So if you add a groups field name, that means that it's going to expect an array of strings and then you can have groups. And the benefit of having groups is that you can then download another plugin for authorization, matrix authorization. Then you could specify groups and then you can match groups to specific privileges. So now logged in users can do anything, but if you want more granular access, you could add groups and then use the authorization plugin in Jenkins to give more granular access to those groups. So I'm going to save this, then I'm going to log out. So here we are the Edward user. Now I'm going to log out. I'm going to go back to localhost 8090. You might get this warning just because we are doing a redirect. Then you just have to press this button. Redirect URI not whitelisted because I didn't know the exact URI. So I'm just going to copy paste it from the URL and then in our Jenkins application, I'm going to add this as redirect URI, refresh this. Oh, I still need to restart our server, refresh this, and then we have our login form. I'm going to log in and then I'm logged in. Welcome to Jenkins. Who am I now? Here's my full name and I'm the Jenkins user ID 9999 because that's my user ID. So if you have a look at the people, here we now have the users. This is the user from OpenID Connect and this is the user that we added at the installation. And then if you click on my user configure, then we can see the full name comes from the authorization server and also the email address comes from the authorization server. So that was nicely filled out. So we can even have more mappings to fill out more information if you want. That's the benefit of having an authorization server. It can distribute user information to your application servers. So that's it for Jenkins. There is always a possibility that you try out an application and that our authorization server is not immediately working with it. Then you just need to have a look at the flow that it's using you have to make sure that all the ORDC capabilities that the application needs are also implemented because we might not have implemented every single step or every single capability. When preparing the ALS ORDC lecture, where we will get ALS tokens based on our token that we get from our application, I realized that our discovery endpoint is missing a few attributes that we should return. Otherwise, this is not going to work because ALS IAM, Identity and Access Management, is actually checking for a few more attributes that we don't have. So I have those added in the types. It's ID token signing algorithm value supported, claim supported, and subject type supported. So we need to add those, otherwise the next demo is not going to work. So we're going to have ID token signing algorithm supported, which is RS256. Then claim supported, also a string slice. And these are the claims that we are returning. So we have sub, and we can just have a look at our token endpoint. We have issuer, sub, audience, expiration, issued at, and not before. Okay. 
And then lastly, we also have subject types supported. And there's a mechanism to hide some privacy sensitive information. So the only thing we need to do is say that we only support public. We just return the subject. The other thing we need is when we are going to use the app server, we are only replying one token and we are going to need both. So I'm just going to make an array of this. And then here we have the parse access token. Right here we have the parsed ID token. And I'm just going to JWT token. Going to add both of them. First ID token and then the access token. Parsed ID token. And yeah, I need another colon here. Save this, go to the main. So here we have both tokens and tokens. The second one is the access token. And I'm just gonna print on the console the ID token, because the ID token is the one we need the next demo. Tokens, raw. So that's it, we should be able to run the server again. And also maybe one last thing to mention, from this discovery endpoint, if you want to know more about this discovery endpoint, you can have a look online and just type in OpenID configuration endpoint and you will find some information. For example, I found this LDAP wiki and this LDAP wiki explains every single attribute that you can have. So here is an example. And here at the bottom, you actually have what attributes are required. So the issue is required, the authorization endpoint is required, which one is optional and which one is recommended. So we have the user info endpoint, which is recommended, but not required. But then we had some other required missing, which didn't work very nicely with AWS. So this information is actually very useful when creating this open ID configuration endpoint. In this demo, I will show you how we can use our OIDC authorization server to get AWS access tokens. We can configure within AWS IAM, Identity and Access Management, our OIDC server. That way, every user logged in into our authorization server could potentially get AWS credentials from AWS IAM. Let's have a look how this would work. First, we need to again set up our NGROC tunnel. So I'm just going to run the server first and then open another window. This is the same as I did in the previous lecture. If you didn't follow the Jenkins lecture, you just have to download ngrok from the ngrok website or with brew and you type ngrok HTTP 8080 and that will tunnel port 8080 from your local host to a public available host name. This is our host name. Our server is running. We just have to make sure that we update our config file as Every time you use ngrok, this host name will change. We then need to restart our server. And then we should be able to use this host name in AWS. So this is my AWS account. It's a sandbox account. It's empty. I just created a new one. And we need to go first to IAM, manage access to AWS resources. And here we have zero users, so we only have our root user. And we are not going to create a user, we are going to use our identity provider. So we click on identity providers. 
and here we can add a new provider. Use an identity provider IDP to manage your user identities outside of AWS, but grant the user identities permissions to use AWS resources in your account. So you first add a provider, and here you can choose between SAML and OpenID Connect. So in the first lecture, I was explaining you SAML and OIDC, where SAML is the older standard and OpenID is a newer one. And you can see that indeed SAML is still used in a lot of places. In the past, even only SAML was used in AWS, and then only later they supported OpenID. Because also when AWS came out, the OpenID standard didn't exist yet. We are going to choose for OpenID Connect, and then we can provide this URL. I'm going to provide my ngrok URL, and then you can click on Get Thumbprint. This thumbprint is from the CA certificate. So the CA validity is until 2024. So ngrok is configured with HTTPS. There's a certificate in use. The certificate I actually checked is from Let's Encrypt. It's just to make sure that AWS validates our certificate. It's not going to do it on the service certificate because a service certificate typically is only valid for a couple of months or for a year. So it does it on the CA and the CA is typically valid for a couple of more years. So we are now 2022, so it's valid for two more years. Then we can configure the audience and the audience in our ID token is the client ID. So that's why we have to also supply the client ID to be able to log into AWS. We cannot use the access ID. It's going to check the audience and the audience needs to be equal to the client ID. So I'm going to use a client ID from our first application server, 1234, and then I'm going to add this provider. So the provider is now created, and now we can link a role to this provider. So we can click here and assign a role to it. I'm going to create a new role, and you could say that whoever has access to our application server, our first application server has access to the complete ALS account, so admin permissions. Or you could say whoever has access to this account has a specific subset of permissions. I'm going to add S3 permissions, just as we are working with some kind of development server, we just created this server. So if something goes wrong, then at least we don't have admin privileges. So this is our identity provider. Audience is 1234. And ALS calls is the audience because the audience is equal to the client ID. But we always call this the client ID and not really the audience. So in the ID token, the audience is equal to the client ID. And that's why they call it audience here. Permissions. So here we could give administrator access, or I'm just going to do S3 full access. Tags, if you want to create tags, review, OIDC demo, S3 role, I'm going to call it. Create a role. And now we can assume this role using OIDC, using our OIDC token. I need this ARN because that's what I want to assume. And I will have to use the AWS command line utility. So if you don't have it installed yet, you can install it from the AWS website or again with Brew or with Chocolatey so that you have the AWS command available. And then we will also need the client token. So we need to log in to our application and we have to make sure the client ID matches. So the client ID that we entered matches with our app one. So I'm going to log into app one and that is going to give me the ID token. So here we have app one. I'm just going to start our application server. So this ORDC endpoint can still be localhost. It was just going to verify this token. It doesn't need to have access to our application server. And then what's going to happen here, I'm going to see the ID token in the output because I added this FMT printf here, ID token, token zero, zero should be the parse ID token. Okay, let's try that out. Localhost 8081, login, my login and password, token received, and let's just make sure that I Copy again this ARN, and then we can try to log into AWS and get the tokens. 
Let me maybe also create an S3 bucket so that we can do an S3 LS to list the buckets. And when that works, I'll be able to see whether, whether the tokens actually work. My test bucket. I'll just add some random string here because who knows it might already be in use because it needs to be unique within this ALS region. So just have to make sure that it's unique enough because my test bucket will probably already exist. So I have a bucket. So I'm going to try to assume this role here. And here you can also see that there's this trust relationship where we have this audience needs to be equal to one, two, three, four. So only the tokens from this app server will work on our ORDC provider. That is what ALS is going to check. It's going to check this token, see if the signature matches with the public key. And if that matches, it will accept the audience. The audience is equal to our client ID. If this audience is one, two, three, four, then I am granted access. Here is ID token. So let me just open another window. So our role, role ARN is this one, don't want to lose it. And our token is this one. So I'm just going to say token equals and then here I can do echo token, echo role ARN. If you're if you're on Windows, you can use set, I think, or you can just copy paste it in one string. That's also possible because it's just easier for me to work, but you could also just enter everything in one string. So you need to have the ALS account, but you don't need to be logged in. ALS ST LS enable to locate credentials. So I have no credentials and now I'm going to try to obtain credentials. And I'm going to do this with ALS STS assume role with web identity. So I think if I just add help to it, then I will get the help function. And if we scroll a little bit lower, it will show us the arguments, the role a run check. We have it. Role session name is just an identifier. So could be our user, for example, it's just a value. It's not being checked on. And then the web identity token. So this is what we need to be able to get a token. So I'm going to do ALS SDS assume role with web identity. Role a run is our role a run. Web identity token is our token and role session name is just going to be my name, Edward. That should be it really. Let's try it out if it works. Or before we try it out, let's just verify our token. JWT.io. I'm just going to paste this token here so that if you have troubles your, yourself, that you can have a look at my token. So I have the algorithm, KID, and the audience is important. One, two, three, four. This is the client ID because this is our ID token. The KID is going to be used by ALS to get this public key from our JWKS endpoint and to validate our signature right here. So once the signature is validated, it can be sure that our authorization server issued this JLT. So let's try and we get the credential. And we can actually see using ngrok the calls that happened. So these calls just happened here. It went to the OpenID configuration and it also went to the JWKS JSON to download the public key. And this is when I logged in, I did a login. And then here are some other requests that either me or Atlas did. So let's go back. 
So we now have these access keys and these access keys we could configure in our dot AWS slash credentials, or we can just configure them as environment variables and see if we can do S3 LS. So there's also an expiration. So what time is it now? Here it's 11.08 and this is UTC. So this must be valid for an hour. Let's try to configure them. So if I do ls access key, id equals to this secret alias secret access key equals to this part and then the alias session token equals to this part and then i don't really need to blur any of this because this will be expiring in an hour anyways it was s3 ls and i get my test bucket so you can see that with our id token we can get ALS credentials that are valid temporarily. Assume this role right here and then use it to access ALS. And we didn't even have to create a user on ALS. This is also called federation in ALS. So if you would like, we could potentially write an application, a Go application that lets you do the authentication with a user, a password, maybe even with MFA. And then does this STS assume role with web identity API call to get yourself credentials, admin credentials, normal credentials, so that you can get access to the ALS API. And this is actually the same mechanism that ALS uses for pods in Kubernetes. So if you use the Kubernetes service on ALS, then also every pod will get a JDLT. And then there's also an environment variable that is exposed to the path where this token is and the ALS SDK will automatically read this token and then we'll get automatically the credentials. Let me just have a look what the name is of this environment variable if you're interested in it. So here we have the configuring the ALS SDK for Go v2 and within Kubernetes or if you would be writing something where you would also use JLTs then if you use the load default config, there's always a path that it follows. So it actually says here when you initialize an ALS config instance using config load default config, there's a default credential chain. Environment variables, the one we used right now. So if you configure those, then it will automatically find your credentials or also the web identity token. So if you have configured the ALS web identity token file and your token is in that file, then you can also just configure this environment variable and then the ALS SDK will automatically go to the file, read the token and get those variables. If those two are not found, then it will also have a look in the ALS folder, in credentials and also in the ALS config. So there's a certain path that it follows. So if you want to make sure that your credentials are properly configured, just have a look at this documentation and make sure that you either supply one of these as path for AWS to find your credentials. So this is it. If you have any problems with ORDC and AWS, have a look whether your discovery endpoint is okay, have a look whether your JWS endpoint is there, whether the flow works with the, with the normal application, whether your ID token is valid, and then it should work. If it still doesn't work for you, feel free to reach out to me directly and I can always help you. In this section, we are going to talk about TLS. TLS stands for Transport Layer Security and is used for data encryption. Web encryption typically uses TLS to encrypt communication between client and server. TLS is a successor of SSL, Secure Socket Layer. The default port for unencrypted HTTP traffic is 80. And a default port for encrypted HTTPS traffic is 443. TLS itself is not an encryption algorithm, but a protocol to negotiate and agree on a common set of encryption and hashing algorithms called the Cypher Suite. 
with TLS enabled, the HTTP server offers the client an X509 certificate, which can be validated by the client to ensure the server can be trusted. The host name of the server will be included in the server certificate. The server certificate will be signed by a certificate authority, abbreviated CA. If the client can validate the server certificate, we can trust the server. And this is what exactly happens when we go to a secured website using HTTPS in the browser. To be able to validate the certificates, we'll need to always have the certificates of the certificate authorities that can sign the certificates. They're also called the root certificates. Browsers typically have this list built in. And within Go, it will also look for those files in hard-coded system paths to be able to validate certificates. So these certificates are provided by the operating system. So on a Linux system, they will be different than a Windows system or a macOS system. And with macOS or Linux, for example, it will be the operating system itself keeping them up to date. So Go will just look into a few directories to see if it can find those root certificates once it finds one directory with the root certificates in it, it will stop looking and it will use that directory. So with the browser, this is all pretty straightforward. You're using this every day where you go to an encrypted website. The validation happens because your browser has those root certificates and you can automatically trust the server. If a certificate will be expired or the host name would not match or the signature cannot be validated, you would typically get an error which sometimes happens on websites that don't maintain their certificates. What I just talked about, this is all client-server communication where the HTTP server offers the client a certificate that can be validated. This is called one-way TLS. You can also set up two-way TLS or mutual TLS, abbreviated MTLS. In this scenario, communication can only be established when the client also has an X509 certificate. So this you will typically not see with your browser because then your browser would need a certificate to be able to access a website. This two-way TLS is used often in server-to-server -server communication. For example, to secure communication between microservices. In the following lectures, I'm going to add TLS support to a simple Go HTTP server. There are multiple strategies to implement TLS. Using a self-signed certificate, we will issue the Certificate Authority certificate ourselves, so only someone who has a specific CA certificate will be able to validate our server certificate. Using a real certificate issued by a company that can sign with a root certificate. So companies like DigiCert, GeoTrust, RSA, GlobalSign, they own these root certificates and they can issue a certificate for you that is signed by one of their root certificates and those will then be valid if you would use a browser and visit your website with that certificate installed because your browser will have these root certificates built in and is able to validate the signature of this service certificate and also using Let's Encrypt, a non-profit certificate authority. So this is kind of a third option because the second option, the certificate issued by a company, you most likely will have to pay this company because they need to verify that you are the real owner of this host name, of this domain name. And with Let's Encrypt, this is actually free, it's a non-profit. So you can get a free TLS certificate with Let's Encrypt and they will have an automated procedure to get you verified. In the next lecture, I will explain these strategies in a little bit more detail, and then we will start implementing a self-signed certificate. All these approaches can be used for one-way TLS. For two-way TLS, a self-signed CA is common, but other approaches would also work. So for example, within Kubernetes, you have a lot of two-way TLS because you have a lot of services talking to each other and they need to be able to trust each other. Within microservices, you have two-way TLS. With VPNs, you have two-way TLS. One-way TLS is what you see every day in your browser. And two-way TLS is probably something you have less exposure to when you have two different services talking to each other. 
so every approach can be used for 2A TLS as well, although self-signed CA with 2A TLS is a bit more common than using real certificates, although it is still possible to do 2A TLS technically with a real certificates or even with Let's Encrypt. Let's go over the TLS strategies. We will look at the self-signed strategy signed by a root CA and Let's Encrypt. First, the self-signed CA. This will also be the next Go demo that I will show you. It's using a self-signed CA. In that case, we're going to have a server, a client, and only the server is going to have certificates, not the client, because it is a one-way TLS. And these server certificates need to be signed by a CA, a certificate authority, so that the client can validate whether the certificate is real. Because it is self-signed, we are also going to be the certificate authority. So we're going to have to create a certificate authority certificate and a certificate authority key. With this key, we can actually sign one or more certificates. So here we only have one certificate, but we could be signing a lot of certificates. We only need one CA to be able to sign multiple certificates. Once we have this set up, we can use the certificate authority key to sign the server certificate. The client can then connect to the server using TLS. The server certificate will be offered. The server key will not be offered because the server key is secret to the server. And the client can then also download the certificate authority certificate to validate the server certificate. Because this is not a root certificate, the client is not going to have this bundled in the browser or bundled in the operating system. So we'll have to provide this CA certificate file to the client to be able to validate the server certificate. If we maintain the client, for example, if the client is also a Go program or it is curl or it is our own browser, then this setup would work because we can have this CA certificate installed. Where it wouldn't work is if you would have a production server, a public production server, and we would offer any client that would connect to our server, any browser, this certificate where they don't have the CA. Then they would get an error because they don't have the CA certificate. And that's why all the servers that we connect to in a real world scenario are actually using one of the root certificates. So root signed CA is next, where we still have the server, the client, the server certificate, and the server key. But the client in this case has the root certificates available to be able to check the server certificate. It just needs to be signed now by a certificate authority company. This certificate authority company we have the certificates of this certificate authority company, but not the key. So we cannot sign any service certificate ourselves. We don't have access to the CA key or else everyone could sign any certificate. And this whole validation process would just not work. We all agree to trust these certificate authority companies to only sign service certificates after they validated the host name in this service certificate. So they will go and send an email, for example, to the email attached to the domain name and ask, are you the real owner? Can you verify that you are the real owner? And only then they will sign your server certificate. So how does it work? Well, you need to first give an unsigned server certificate to this certificate authority company. This unsigned server certificate is in the form of a certificate signing request or abbreviated CSR. So you basically give your certificate that you generated using your server key and the certificate authority company is going to sign this for you and give it back to you. So now you have a signed server certificate. And then the client can connect using TLS to the server, will receive this server certificate and will be able to validate this server certificate because it has the root certificates with all the certificate authority companies in there to be able to validate this server certificate. So you can imagine if you have a very old operating system or a very old browser that is 
10 years old and hasn't been updated, then actually those certificate authority certificates or root certificates, they expire. And when you then visit a server, you would get an error. So if you, for example, install a very old browser or an operating system that is 10 years old, you will see that those root certificates are not valid anymore and you will get an error when you just browse to some common websites. And then we have Let's Encrypt. And Let's Encrypt is very similar to the root certificates because Let's Encrypt is also a company that is included in the root certificates. The difference with Let's Encrypt is that it's an organization, it's a non-profit, and they don't ask money for a TLS certificate. We still have the server and the client, the server certificate and the server key, the root certificates that has Let's Encrypt in it, and Let's Encrypt itself, the company, we still don't have access to the CA key because that is managed by Let's Encrypt. What Let's Encrypt is going to do is it needs to be able to validate whether we really own this domain name. Let's Encrypt is validating our website using this automatic certificate management environment. Let's Encrypt will connect to the server that needs to be publicly available and will go to a specific path that you can see here, it's dot well known slash ace me challenge slash token. And this token is something that Let's Encrypt will give you if you start the procedure. It will see whether you really own this domain by putting something unique on your domain name that can be verified by Let's Encrypt. So Let's Encrypt will give you a random string. You put that random string on your server. If you are able to do that, then Let's Encrypt trusts that you own this server, that you own this domain name, and then it will then sign your service certificate. Here again, you need to give an unsigned service certificate, a CSR certificate signing request to Let's Encrypt so that it can sign your certificate based on this certificate signing request. You then have a service certificate that is signed by Let's Encrypt and the procedure now is the same. The client connects with TLS, the service certificate that is signed is offered and the client can verify it using the root certificates that includes also Let's Encrypt. Let's Encrypt is actually the newer strategy compared to the first two, because the first two are already around for a very long time, and Let's Encrypt is a new approach that came into existence so that you don't have to pay these companies always for your TLS certificates. Let's Encrypt is very popular, so there's a lot of websites that use Let's Encrypt, so they don't have the cost of paying for every TLS certificate it might be just a bit harder to get a certificate because you have to use this automated process. With the other companies that sign your TLS certificates, there are more options to do the validation process. But if you can use this automated validation process, it will end save you some money and it will also save you time to renew the certificates because you can automate your renewal as well. One strategy that I didn't cover yet is two-way TLS, so the Mutal TLS. So with Mutal TLS, the client also has a certificate. So how does that look then? We have a service certificate and server key and the client certificate and the client key. We have a certificate authority certificate and a certificate authority key. So in this case, we have self-signed certificates because we will also be the certificate authority. With the certificate authority key, we can sign both the client certificate and the service certificate. And then we can distribute the certificate authority certificate to validate both the client certificate and the service certificate. So the client will be able to use the CA certificate to validate the service certificate and the server will be able to use a CA certificate to validate the client certificate. So the client makes a TLS connection the server will be able to validate whether the client has a certificate and whether the certificate is valid. And the client can do then the same thing. So the benefit of Mutual TLS here is that you can have a two-way trust. In one-way TLS, the server doesn't know anything about the client. In two-way TLS, the client is also identified by a client certificate that is also signed by the certificate authority. So the server also knows that the client has obtained a certificate that has been signed by the same certificate authority. Like I said, you also have variations on this where you have two certificate authorities or you can also use a root certificate. 
In the next lecture, I will show you how to do a one-way TLS setup with an HTTPS server in Go. So it will be a very simple server using the self-signed strategy. This is the TLS start project from my GitHub repository. And this TLS start project I'm going to use to show you how to create a command line utility. A command line utility to create a certificate, a CA certificate first with the key and a service certificate. Because in this TLS start, we have a test server and this test server is going to launch an HTTPS server. So if we have a look here, so we can run this by go run cmd test server main.go. We have the main function and we're only going to handle slash the index page. And instead of listen and serve, we are going to use listen and serve TLS. TLS needs the address, which can be 443 or 8443 if your port 443 is blocked by maybe not a program already. We need a cert file and a key file, and it's going to be the server certificate and the server key. So if we are going to run this now, go run cmd test server main.go, it will complain because we don't have this server certificate and server key. This is a server certificate and server key that we still need to create. And how would you create those in the past? Well, you have the open SSL command line utility, but we don't want to use this open SSL utility. We want to write our own command line utility and our own command line utility will generate this CA certificate and key and will sign the server certificate and key just as I explained in this previous diagram. Just as a refresher, this is the setup we are going to build. So this server here on the right with the server certificate and server key, that's what you are going to pass to this function to start our server. But first we need to create the CA key and certificate to sign our certificate. We can then have a client that loads the CA certificate, then connects to the server, and can then validate the server certificate using the CA certificate. Our client can be a browser, can be another Golang program, or can be something like curl or postman. I'll be using curl. So this is our server, and we just want to write a command line utility. So we are going to have a TLS command. So TLS command, go run TLS main.go, and nothing will happen because we don't have any code in there. But that's how we're gonna run our TLS executable. You can also build it obviously and then execute it like that. So once it's ready, you could actually make the binary and use it even yourself to create certificates or even extend on it because our functionality will be pretty basic, but you could still extend on it. Because the OpenSL command line utility is quite extensive. You can do a lot of things with it. We We'll just do a subset of that. We will be able to create CA certificates and sign them, but compared to the OpenSSL utility, it's not a lot. So this main Go will load the PKG CMD package, PKG CMD. So that's where we're going to write our command line utility code. So we have the root.go and in root.go we have the execute function. We are going to use a library for that. It's a popular command line utility library. It's called Cobra. So we'll be using Cobra for the command line utility code. So we don't have to write everything ourselves. Cobra is used by popular tools like kubectl. So it will look very familiar if you already used Kubernetes at some point. So this in CMD will have our command line utility code. And in the third package will have our certificate code. So if we are going to write code for these X59 certificates, we'll do it here. We need to create a CA certificate and create a server certificate. So the server certificate is not very special. It's only the CA that is special. So we can have a function for the CA certificate and then a function for a regular certificate. And then later on, when you need to create a client certificate for two-way TLS, you could reuse this function. We have the pem.go and the pem.go just has one function, pem2x509. It just reads input in binds, 
which is a PEM formatted file, and then we can decode it and parse it into an X509. It's just a helper function right here that you don't have to write yourself. In types, I have the types, the CA cert, the cert and the cert subject. Why do I have already those? Because we are going to use a config file. And this config file is something I will just supply to you. It's called tls.yaml here. And here we are going to define the information that we need to create our CA certificate and our service certificate. So we have a CA certificate. Every certificate needs a serial. How long is it valid? Valid for 10 years. And this is a subject. Every certificate, the CA certificate and the service certificate, they have a subject. They have a country, organization, organizational unit, locality, and a common name. There's even some more information that you can give that you will see in this types.go. So you see here the subject is a little bit longer. There are some more attributes that you can add here. The common name in a certificate is either just a name, like CA certificate, to show someone looking into the certificate that this is a CA certificate. You could even add the name of your company. But then, for example, if you are going to use certificates, server certificates that we are going to use on websites, then the common name is going to be the host name. So here we have common name is godemo local test.me. And local test.me and all the subdomains of local test.me, they actually resolve to the IP address 127.001. So we can use this address because it will resolve back to our own machine. And that gives us a DNS name that we can then use to connect to in our browser or with curl. Our service certificate also has these other subject lines. It has a serial valid for years. And you will see that the CA is typically valid for longer than the certificate itself, the service certificates. It's best practice to rotate them once a year, for example, could be earlier. With Let's Encrypt, it's gonna be earlier. With root sign certificates, you can often choose. We are choosing here for one year, but it could be as well two or five years or something like that. You typically want your CA to last longer than your certificate. So if you pick 10 years here or 15 years, you will also have to increase this one. And then the last one is that if you want to have more DNS names, you can also use DNS names. And then you will have your common name plus more DNS names. For example, if you are using your own domain name and your own domain name is called localtest.me, then for example, you could have www.localtest.me and then the DNS name could just be the root of the domain so that you cover both of them. We are just going to use GoDemo but feel free to use any name that you like. So this is TLS.yml, we'll still need to parse this. We just have the types available so that we don't have to create them. Here's the YAML annotation so that we can unmarshal this with YAML. We'll do that in the root package in the next lecture. It's one of the first things that we'll do after I explain you the basics of Cobra. So next lecture, we'll start with Cobra. This will go in the CMD package, then the Certificate code will go in the cert package, and then we also have the key package. So every certificate needs an RSA key, and because I already went over RSA keys in our previous section of SSH, because SSH is also using RSA, I already have this code prepared. So the code is very similar to the SSH code, so if you want to know the details of RSA keys, I would suggest to have a look at the SSH lectures. We are just going to use these functions. It's actually very simple. We have the create RSA private key with a certain length, which will use generate key and reply a private key. With this RSA private key, we are not that much. We need to transform this private key to PEM format. So this is what the RSA private key to PEM does. It takes a private key in the private key format and returns a PEM block with RSA private key. So then we can save this in a file. And then we just have a save function, create RSA private key and save, which will create the RSA key with permission so that only the owner can read it. It will encode it using PEM and then save and close this file. 
And then we have the function to read it back. So if we have a file in PAM format, then we can use a private key PAM to RSA, which will then PAM decode the RSA private key and put it in the RSA private key format. So for that, we use the parse pkcs1 private key function to convert it from a PAM format to an RSA private key format. If we ever need the public key, the public key is accessible within this private key as well. So these are the functions, the RSA functions that we have to create a new key and convert between PAM and RSA format. So that is it. I also added this git ignore to make sure that we don't commit any PAM CRT or key file to GitHub. And then we also have the go mod file where I define the module name and I also replace the mock version from 143 to 144, which you probably already have seen in one of my earlier lectures. There is just something wrong with this 143 version. So it's just saying if you come across this 143 version, just replace it with 144. So this is it for the TLS start program. In the next lecture, I will start working on this program, starting with Cobra. If you need any of the solutions, then you can have a look at the TLS demo, where you'll find all the code that has been written. In this demo of the TLS command line utility tool, I'm going to use Cobra. Cobra is a project that you can find on GitHub. So it's github.com SPF 13 Cobra currently. Cobra is a library for creating powerful modern CLI applications. Cobra is used in many Go projects such as Kubernetes, Hugo, the GitHub CLI, to name a few. So it is actually quite popular because Kubernetes is a quite popular project and it is using Cobra. So what is so good about it? They have an easy way to create subcommands. For example, you can do app server, app fetch, so it's pretty easy to use. You can also nest your subcommands, so we can have, in our case, TLS create, TLS create key, TLS create CA, TLS create cert. So those are all subcommands that we can create in a nested create command. So let's have a look how we install this. Go get github.com spf13 cobra at latest. So I'm going to copy this already. And then we have the user guide here. So if you want to know a little bit more about Cobra, I would recommend you to read their user guide. It's not very long. So what we already did is we created this CMD directory in our PKG directory. And this is where you typically put your Go files for Cobra. Our main.go looks exactly like this. We have a main with CMD execute. So the main is very bare. It serves only one purpose to initialize Cobra. So we're going to initialize Cobra in the execute function within our CMD package. They have Cobra code generator if you want to use it, but we are not going to use it. We already have some code ready to go. The first Golang program that you would make is for the root CMD. Ideally, you place it in root.go. So that's what we are going to do first. That's where we have our execute function. So let's try to copy this code and see what happens. We'll replace this Hugo by our TLS explanations. So first I do the go get, and this is going to download Cobra 1.5.0. It's updating the go mod file, and now I can start writing in root.go the first lines that are going to use this Cobra package. So I'm going to Copy this and just replace this, save this so the imports are correct. So we imported Cobra, this is the root CMD, and when we do execute, it will execute the root CMD dot execute. If something goes wrong, it will show an error on STD error. So I just want to replace this, the use, the short, the long, which is the command and the explanation TLS. TLS is a command line tool or it could be utility or interface for TLS. And then we have a long explanation. TLS is a command line tool for TLS. 
mainly used for generation of certificates, but can be extended. I think that's fine. Let's just have a look what this does. So let's run our go run cmd tls main.go and it doesn't do anything yet because we are just hitting this do stuff here. But because we already initialized Cobra, we should be able to use the help function. And this is what is nice about Cobra. Now that we initialized our root cmd, it already has a help function. TLS is a command line tool for TLS. And then you see you can put some nicer text here. Usage TLS flags, there's a help flag. And now we can start adding commands. Every command can go in a different Go file and we just need to add more of these Cobra commands. Once we tie these Cobra commands together, they will show up in the usage. We'll also be able to add flags and then they will show up in the flags. So this is a very nice package that will make it for us very easy to write a command line utility. So one last thing that I want to mention here is that we have this execute function and this execute function happens on the root CMD, but the root CMD is actually declared outside our function. So the scope of this variable root CMD is not only within this function, but within the whole package. So once we create more Go files, we'll also be able to access this root CMD. That way we'll be able to tie all these commands together to the root CMD. And that's how then the root CMD execute will tie everything together. The root CMD execute will use this root CMD. Everything will be tied to this root CMD. And that's how this Cobra package will be able to find the link between all these Go files, and then we'll be able to show the commands that you can execute and the flags that you can use. So how to add flags and commands will all become more clear in the next lecture. This was just a simple introduction to the Cobra package. In the next lectures, we'll be adding the config file and more commands to be able to create our keys, CA and certificate. Now that we initialized our Cobra package, Let's try to parse this config file. So this config file describes a certificate authority certificate. It has a serial, valid for years, and a subject. And then it has certificates that are going to be signed by this CA certificate. So search is a map because we have here a key and we can have more certificates that are identified by key so that we can have one or more certificates or even zero. That way we can have now one certificate, but if you later want to add more certificates, we can add more certificates. So the first thing is going to be to add a flag in our root.go to allow the user to supply a config file, just the path to a config file. And maybe we can even put tls.yaml as a default so that if you don't supply anything, it will automatically look for tls.yaml. So how do we do that? Let's maybe have another look at the documentation of Cobra. So create root cmd. That's what you already did. We have function execute. You will additionally define flags and handle configuration in your init function. So remember that when we have an init function, that function will be automatically executed. So we can write this init function and add some more flags. So here we have the init function and then we typically do Cobra on initialize init config. So this will run this init config. So when Cobra initializes, this function will also run where we can then initialize the config. So I'm going to do it very similar as the user guide. We then are going to add to the root CMD a flag. When we use persistent flags, then for every subcommand, this flag will also be available. So for our subcommands, we are going to use local flags that are only available on the subcommand itself. And on our root command, we're going to use a persistent flag that is going to be available for every command because we're going to have this config file. So I'm just going to copy this. 
and add this right here. We will also then need an init config, func init config, and the config file. So this config file is going to be global as well. var config file config and let's then define a config type which is going to be a struct with a ca cert of type cert ca cert I'll make it a pointer so that it can also be nil and then yaml ca cert and this yaml should of course match with this ca cert looks like it's matching we need to do the same for the certificate and it's going to be a map map string cert dot cert and then the yaml is going to be certs certs here the key and this is going to be the cert object going to save this so this is a config so config files of type config init will automatically run it will say on initialize run this init config and this is not going to be a string var so actually this is the config file path that we need so we need another variable config file path is string and then we will need just a variable config and we need to parse the contents of this config file path into this config so config file path is going to be this one config file path this is the parameter config the default value we can leave it empty and then fill it out ourselves if we want in the init config config file default is and then we can say default is tls.yml we can also choose that there is a shorter version of config so if we say string var p then we will have an extra parameter we have the name which is config but also the shorthand and shorthand can then be c so we can use either dash dash config or c then we need to parse this config file which is yaml so if config file path is empty then we're going to say config file path is tls.yaml so we can either check for the config file here or we can input tls.yaml here so it's the same where you put it if you're going to check here in the init config you know that it was not supplied so you could take other actions like not reading the config file for example if it was not supplied so then the next step is going to be to read the contents of this config file path config file binds is io read file io util read file config file path if there is an error then we can output that there is an error error while reading config file and actually this needs to be printf because we are not returning an error we're just printing something on screen and then return it and then we can unmarshal into into this config file so unmarshal takes the binds config file binds and we can marshal this into our config error handling while parsing the config file I have one error and sometimes what happens is that Visual Studio Code decides to import some random library 
it's best to check what library it is importing. This is the one I typically use, go get. And now everything is green. So this should parse our config file. And what we can do is we can output it just to see if it worked. Config file parsed. We'll then later on remove this and just to see whether our config file was parsed. Go run. So this is the help flag. Doesn't seem to be parsing it with the help flag. Let's remove the help flag. Config file parsed. And this seemed to have worked. Cannot see all the data because it's a pointer. But this seemed to have worked. And this should then happen every time when we execute a command using the command line utility. So whether you want to parse the config every time when you execute it, depends on how you want to write this command line utility. If it is empty, you could also say, I'm not parsing it. Or you could say, I'm trying to parse it and I will not give an error if there was no config file supplied and I couldn't read the file. You can also check whether the file exists, for example. It's kind of all up to you how you want to write this command line utility. It should be as natural as possible for the end user without doing crazy things that the user wouldn't expect. I think this is fine. Let's say that you always need a config file so that when you want to use this tool, you just need to have tls.yaml in your directory or you need to supply it with config. So if you say config my other config.yaml, then I get an error because the file doesn't exist. So that's how it should work. I can even try with a shorthand flag, the shorthand flag minus C. So that also works. And if I use help, it also shows us the flag. So in the next lecture, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start writing our subcommands. So now I'm going to create the commands and the subcommands. I want to have a create command and some subcommands under this create command. Later, you could then extend this tool with some other commands. Create is what we need for this test server, but maybe you will also want to read certificates and you would need an info command. We are just going to focus on this create command. So I am going to create a new file here. Create.go package cmd. And I'm just going to write an init function here. And now I have access to all these global variables here. So I have access to the config, to the config file path, but mainly to this root cmd. So if I create a new command, I want to say root cmd, add command, and then I want to add a create command. And this create command can be of the same type of Cobra command. So this is going to be my create cmd. And I'm going to import Cobra. And here I can have the same information. Use short and long. And actually, I will delete this run function here because we don't need to have a run function when we just execute the root command without anything. Use create. Create CA certs or keys. Commands to create resources. CA certs keys. Save this and let's see what the behavior now is. Go run main.go. So now that we don't have a run function, it actually shows the help. So now we have usage, available commands, completion, help, flags. And then we have additional help topics, TLS create, 
but this is going to be another available command, but we haven't written any subcommands yet. So we can already see that it recognizes that we have this create command because create CA search or keys is actually here in the help. So if you do help, we get a help. If you do create, we just get this, create help, same. So we would need more subcommands. So let's create another subcommand for keys. Key.go package cmd, another init function. Instead of root cmd, we're now going to use create cmd, create cmd add command, and we're going to have a key create cmd. Key create cmd is going to look similar. Key create cmd is a cobra command. Key, key commands, commands to create keys. And then we're going to have this run function because now we actually want to do something. Run, which is a function. And here we can put our code. So let's see if we now use create. Now we get a help. Create, create key, key commands. So if you do create key, nothing happens because this function is still empty. And, and now if we enter go run without any argument, we see the available commands. Now we have the create command here as well because now this create command is actually doing something. So it's a real command. We have the create command. We have the config flag, which is global. Oh, I'm missing here a bracket. This key command could use a config, but I don't think our key command would need the config. And now we can even add commands at the key level. So what we want to do now, we want to add a key. Where do we want to write the key? So we could use a destination key, a destination key as a flag. So we could create a flag within this key. So a flag that we can only use in, in our create key subcommand. So now it is not going to be a persistent flag. It's going to be a normal flag. Key create cmd flags string var p. Where are we going to store it? var key out is a string key out and then a name key out shorthand so now that we have c already for config it needs to be something unique so maybe just k the value is going to be key.pem and the help destination path for key. So now we can write a key code. So how to create a key? Well, we already have this function written, create RSA key and then convert it to a PEM, create RSA private key and save. So we could use this. Cert.create RSA private key and save of this key out. We could even add a, a flag for the bytes. We could add a flag for the bytes. So the byte length key length called L. It cannot be a string, it's an integer, I think an integer key length integer
4096 is a default. You can choose a default. We are going to make it a default. This is going to be int var key length key length in the help. And this is going to be cert, cert, but we still need to import it. Looks like it is not being recognized. So go mod, copy this. PKG cert, and now it is recognized. Not declared cert. It's not going to be cert, it's going to be key. Makes sense. And what does it return? An error. So if there is an error, then we need to say something. Create key error and then the error. And then we can return if you want. So let's try that out. This will be our first function. So we have the create. And actually, if I mistype create, that's what is also nice. Did you mean this? Great. So this is also nice that it has these little things that we don't have to write ourselves. So now we have the last create, available commands, key, create, key. And the length is going to be key length, 1496 by default. So we don't really need to supply anything, create key. And nothing has been returned. That's also a little bit awkward. So let's say key created with length and then we just say key out key length save this put a return and key created key.pem with length 4096. Okay, and now we have the key.pem. So this is our first subcommand, key.go. And now we're going to create another subcommand or two other subcommands, CA and cert. And the difference there is going to be that here we already had a function create RSA private key and save. We still need to write the code for the certificate, the CA certificate and the cert. So the Cobra code will be very similar, but then we are actually going to dig into the package cert to be able to generate a CA certificate and then a server certificate. Now that we have finished the key.go, let's copy paste this key.go and then let's create a new file, ca.go. And the CA is going to output two files, the certificate and the key. So we're not going to really use this key.go anymore. We are not going to separately create a key and then input the key. When we create a CA, we're just going to create a new key. So we're going to have CA key and CA cert. Copy this because they are both going to be a string, CA key, CA cert, key out, cert out, CA dot key, and CA dot cert, destination path for CA key, destination path for CA cert. I'm going to add CA create CMD to the create command, still a Cobra command, CA, CA commands, commands to create the CA. And we are going to use cert, create CA cert. Oh, this needs to be a string. And what does it need? The config. 
which should be initialized. So we should have our config in this variable because we did this. So we'll create ca cert config ca cert. So that comes straight from our config. That's going to be this one here. And then we have the key file path and the CA cert file path, which is the CA key and the CA, CA cert. Create CA error, CA created with CA created key cert and then CA key, CA cert, save this. Looks like it's going to work. Clear this. And we have an error. We have the add flag error because look, I'm still doing key create CMD within the CA. So this is not good. So if you do something like that, you will get an error. And let's try again. Available commands, CA and key now. And you see the global flags is a config. So we can supply the config when doing the CA command. And that's useful because we have here the config that we parsed. So this is it for the Cobra implementation. Now I will need to do the actual implementation of the creation of the certificate for the CA. So how do we even start with this? So we know that there is an X509 package, X509, and we are going to create a certificate. So we have X509, the package, and what does X509 have? Create certificate. So now it imported crypto X509, create certificate. So create certificate creates a new X509 v3 certificate based on a template. The following members of template are currently used. And then there's all the parameters of a template of an X509 certificate. So what do we need for this? We need an IO reader. And we need a template. So why don't we start with creating a template? Template equals X59 certificate. And this needs to be a pointer. So I'm just going to make a reference to this. And then what do we need? Serial number. Serial number CA serial because we supply the serial number right here. What else do we have? Valid for years subject. Subject we also have. PKIX name is a type. So we will need this one and this has all these parameters. So we can just supply all these parameters. We just need to make sure because this is a string array that if they were not supplied in the config file, they will be empty. So we don't want to return an empty string in a string slice. So let's maybe first make a function remove empty string input is a string slice and the output is a string slice and what we are going to do is if the length of the input is one because we only have one item in this string and in the first element is empty let's then just is empty. Let then just return an empty slice. And otherwise, let's return input. 
remove empty string or yeah and then if we then do country remove empty string so if our ca subject country would be empty then it's going to be an empty string but then this function will remove this empty string by returning an empty slice so otherwise it will not show nicely in our certificate and now basically for every type that we have because i don't know if i have all the types for every type that we have we can define these values so that should work what else is there not before not before is of time time not before time now not after time now add and add date and then we can add some years now the only thing that you might want to check is that whether this valid years is not zero or empty it's an integer so it will be zero if this is zero you probably might want to send it to one or you might want to return an error not before not after what else does it have key usage we should also define extensions extra extensions is ca also need to say is ca is ca is true and then i'm going to add this extension key usage is of type extension key usage and then we need to add some key usage so this key usage for the CA needs to be 509 key usage digital signature and actually also the key usage cert sign. If you are interested in what exactly these flags mean, besides that they put some constraints, you can have a look in the standards documentation. These bits are actually explained and what exactly that they do. So we are just going to assume that these, these are the ones that we need. And what I now want to do is that this create CA cert and this other function create cert can use the same template. So I'm just going to copy this over right here. And the key usage needs to be different here because our service certificate doesn't need this one. But I can now change the CA right here in cert. We'll still need to change this template a little bit. Don't need the CA, but we can now create a common function for these create CA cert and create cert. We just need to make sure that we have all the parameters here as well. I need just one more. Basic constraints valid indicates whether ECA are valid. So if you are using ECA, then we also need this basic constraints valid to true. Let's now try to create a function that can be used by both this create cert function and the create ca cert function. In the next lecture where we'll do the certification, where we'll finish the create cert, we'll probably make some changes here still, but this is good enough to get an idea. So what would we need to create a function that we can both use for the ca and the cert? So we are going to take this template as an argument. So I'll call this create cert with a lowercase c. So outside the package, nobody can access it. X509 certificate. So I can say template needs to be a pointer. X509 certificate. What do I need to create this certificate? I will create the private key but i will for sure also need the ca certificate in case we are going to create a normal certificate and it needs to be signed so i'm going to pass ca key 
that's going to be a RSA private key, NSC cert, and that's going to be an X509 certificate. And because these are pointers, what I can do is if I'm going to create the CA certificate, I don't have the CA key and the CA certificate yet. So I'm just going to pass nil. And what am I going to return? Most likely bytes for the key and for the certificate so that we can write it out or use it and an error. So we still have errors because we are not using this template. So let's try to complete our certificate functions. Key binds, cert binds, error is create certificate template. And we are not going to pass a key or a certificate because that's for the create cert. If error is not equal to nil, we're going to return the error. And otherwise we are going to write to a file the key bytes and the sort bytes. So let's leave it like this for a second so that we can focus on this create sort. Uh, let's see, we'll just leave it like this. And then in the next lecture, we can focus on this. So create sort. What do we need to do? We need to create an RSA key first. We have this function in the key RSA go key key create RSA private key. And the bytes and are we passing them? We are not really passing how many binds, so I will just keep it on 4096. What does this return? The private key and error. If the error is not equal to nil, we return the error. Now, if our template is a CA, we are going to do something different than whether our template is not a CA. So is CA is true, then we are going to do something else. We are going to do something else. Our certificate is a CA, so we can do X509, create certificate. Rent reader, template, the parent. The parent, because it's a CA, it's also the template public key, so private key dot public is a public key, public, public key, and the private key. And the public key also needs to be a pointer. So I'm going to add this ampersand so that it's being sent as a pointer. If you don't do it, then it will just say that it doesn't recognize the public key because it's only checking for pointer public keys. What does this return? A byte, an error. We probably want to do a create certificate here as well. So I'm going to create a variable here called there bytes. There's a file type that we get back. And the error. If error is not equal to nil, return the error. And now we need to just convert it into PEM format because we also want to return it always in PEM format so we can then save it. PEM.go, could we use this? No, we couldn't use this because this already expected to be in PEM format, but we can use PEM encode instead of decode. So PEM encode, we need to write it somewhere. So I'm gonna have a cert out and this needs to be an IO writer. So I'm gonna have binds buffer. 
and by its buffer implements the read and write methods for bytes. So pem encode cert out and the pem block pem block that is matching pem block. What do we need to add here? To type optional headers and the bytes. So the bytes we have a type is going to be certificate and the bytes is going to be the their bytes. Cert out does not implement IO writer and that's because bytes buffer implements it as a pointer so I need to reference it here and there's an error that it returns. So if this error is not equal to nil, then we're gonna return the error. If there's no error, then it will have taken this pen block with the certificate type with the bind and it will have written it to cert out. We can do the same for the RSA private key. So if we make a key out by its buffer, change this into key out, pen block, and I think we have a function here, RSA private key to pem, and this is returning this pen block, type RSA private key, and then it's going to marshal this private key into bytes. So we can use this instead of the pen block key and then the private key. And this should also work. So we have a certificate, the private key and insert out and key out. We now have the bind pem encoded. So we can just return it now, set out bytes. What does bytes return? Bytes. Key out. Maybe I'll put the key first. I think I always put the key first. So if we put the key first, we should always put the key first. No errors, but we only did the CA obviously. And now we can have key out here, key bytes, and we can write this to a file key bytes and third bytes. IO util write file, file name, which was supplied, key file path, the data, key bytes, and the permissions. For the key, it's going to be 0600. What does it return? An error. If error is not equal to nil, we're going to return the error, and we're going to do the same for the third bytes. And the third bytes can actually be 644, because RCA certificate can be public. So it doesn't need to have these extra permissions. It's just for your local machine, just to make sure that nobody else can read it accidentally. It's kind of best practice to have your key always written with no group or other read permissions. Search file path, CA search file path, and search bytes. Save this, and let's hope that it all works. Only one way to know. Go run. Let's first see whether it compiles. Okay, available command is the CA. Should we do help? Not sure if that's gonna work. Minus H. Ah, unable to redefine C. Okay, because we already have the config. See, there is already a C here for the config. So I'm just gonna use O. Okay, and O. 
Okay, TLS creates the A flags, the O flag, the key flag, the H for help, and the global flags. So if you want to supply a config file, we don't need to really supply anything, then it will take the defaults, CA key, CA cert. And that created everything. I just need another return here. How can we validate this? Well, we can actually use the open SSL utility, open SSL in CA cert, text no out, I think that it is. And if you don't have the open SSL utility, you can either download it or you can also validate online. There's tools online if you type open SSL read certificate. There are websites where you can paste your certificate and it will show the output for you. You can do this with the certificate, but don't do this with the key because the key you should keep secret. This was not a command. Open SSL X509. It is because it's of X509 type. And this shows that in text everything. Serial number one, so that was good. Not before and not after. There's 10 years in between, so that's also good. The issuer is the same as the subject because it's our self signed CA. Country US, locality New York, organization, go like demo organization, organizational unit, certificate management, and common name CA certificate. Then we also should have these extensions. The CA is true. Digital signature, certificate sign, web client authentication. That all looks good. So I think we now have our CA created. And now we can use this CA, the CA key to sign our service certificate. So in the next lecture, I will create a service certificate and have it signed by our CA. So let's go back to our x509.go and here we have this create cert that we didn't finish. Template, serial number, we have the country, the common name, the common name, but we also need to add the nest name. Not before, not after. Let's see if you just have DNS name, DNS names. It's also a string. So if it's empty, then we return an empty string. If it's not empty, then it should just be the DNS names. Third subject or third. Oh, I think we are not parsing this. Where is our types? Yes, we can add it here. DNS names. It's a string. DNS names. And then here, DNS names. What else do we need to do? We need to parse the CA key and CA cert and then pass it to this create cert function. Key and private key pem to RSA. Yeah, that's the one. CA key and is going to return as the private key because we need the private key to be able to sign. This returns an error. So we have the CA private key and the error. If there's an error, we return the error. And then we have the CA certificate. And for that we have in pem.go pem to x509. CA cert parsed, CA key parsed. So 
So let's now just copy this. The template. The X5 and S certificate. And then the CA key and the CA cert. CA key parsed. CA cert parsed. And then we're going to write the key file path and the cert file path. So we still need to write the server key and the server cert based on what we get back. Save this. And then we just need to make sure that if it's not a CA, that we also have some code. Create certificates. The parent in this case is going to be the CA cert. And the private key is then going to be the CA private key. Because to sign a certificate, we need the CA private key. Save this. This is going to create the certificate. And then we just need to make sure that we have the code in our CMD for the cert. I can copy paste most of the stuff from the CA.go. So that's what I'm going to use. Cert key and cert. Cert key, cert. Oh, cert is already declared. So I'm just going to call this path at the end. Cert path. So this shouldn't really give us an issue because those are local flags. But now we also need the CA key and certificate. So let me just change this. Create CMD, cert CMD. And then this needs to be cert CMD, cert, cert commands, commands to create the certificates. And then we're going to have a create cert. And we also need to supply the CA key and the CA cert. So it's going to be the cert key path. and uh, third path. But then in between we have these two still to add. Create third error, third created. Third key path. Okay, I think we have everything, but we need to ask the user for a few things. We need to know the CA certificate and the CA key, but also the certificate name. So, cert name. There's going to be another flag. Cert name, or just name. With n, what is going to be the default? There's not going to be a default. Name of the certificate in the config file. And then we also need and let me just maybe copy paste it from here. key and cert, CA key and CA cert. And maybe let's not give them shorthand flags. 
might be confusing a bit. Default, CA key and CA cert. Yes, why not? This is the CA key to sign certificate and CA cert. Which ones are mandatory now? Well, those three are now mandatory. So we can say cert create CMD, mark flag required, name, mark flag required, CA key is required, CA cert is required and the name is required. And then I have to pass the CA key, but it needs to be in bytes. So I need to parse it first. CA key bytes error is IO util read file of this CA key. If the error is not equal to nil, CA key error, and we'll have to stop. And we are going to do the same for CA cert, read the CA cert, CA cert error, read error and read error we'll call it and then we can add the ca key binds and the ca cert binds save this still get an error no new variables on the left side config ca cert that's now going to be something else so we still have to say Assert config, okay, is config cert, which is the map, and we have the name, cert name. So we're asking for the name, we're checking in this map whether this key exists. If this key exists, okay will be true. If okay is not true, then we're gonna say could not find certificate name in config. And we'll stop and this should be then the cert and that is a cert all right will this work hopefully maybe i made a mistake somewhere but then we'll find it out very quickly if this doesn't work go run create cert because it's called cert huh? error required flags ca cert ca key and name not set so that works pretty nice and then we have these flags that we can set so let's set these flags the name is this key here go demo local test me CA key is CA dot key and CA cert is CA cert. Could not find certificate name in config. Hmm. Cert name. Cert name here. String var. <laughs> Probably did something wrong. Cert path. This should be cert name because that's a name. Cert created. Key is cert key and cert is cert cert. Let's do the same with this OpenSL utility on our cert cert. And actually, I didn't want to call it cert cert. I wanted it to call it server dot cert and server dot key. So let me just run it again because that's how we uh, 
put it in our test server, I think. Yeah, server.crt. Okay, server.crt is created. Open SSL utility on server.crt. Seems to work. Serial number one, issuer is our CA certificate and the subject is this code demo. One year valid. We have these extensions and we have these alternative names. Right. Right. Let's try to run our test server. And it's going to run on 443. Let's try first maybe to use the browser. Port 80, this side cannot be reached. I'm going to add HTTPS. And then it says your connection is not private because error certificate authority invalid. It doesn't know about our certificate authority, this CA certificate that is being issued. And that is because we self-signed our certificate because I was explaining that our browser knows about our root certificate, but not about our issuer CA certificate that we created ourselves. So we need to add this CA certificate to every client that we are going to use. Some clients can do it easily, some clients cannot, but you see that there is a reason why you should use a root certificate for a public website or let's encrypt and that a self-signed certificate will not work. If you are not a client, it still works for development purposes because I can do advanced and I can do proceed. And then I get it, it's working, but I will still get this not secure because the CA cannot be validated. So let's try to do it with curl and let's see if we can have the CA validated. And if we can have the CA validated, then we should not get an error. Curl, enable to get a local issuer. Now let's try curl with CA certificate, CA CRT. So we are now supplying the CA certificate to our client, curl, and then it will be able to use this CA certificate to see if our server certificate is valid. And actually I get another error, no alternative certificate subject names matches. And that's because I should probably have not only the common name here. So either you use not DNS names and then it will just work on the common name or I need to make sure that I define everything in DNS names. So I'm going to save this. And then I will have to reissue my certificate. Let's run this OpenSSL tool again. And then I see subject alternative names. Now I have both of them. And let's try now again. Connection refused because I didn't start it. Go run test CMD. And now it says it's working. So only when you supply the CA certificate only when you supply this argument CA cert, then it will be able to validate it. Because now if you do curl without it, it only has the root certificates from somewhere a directory on our operating system where we have all these root certificates, but we are not using a root certificate, we are using a self-signed certificate, which we then need to supply with CA cert. So in your browser, you could also make it work by importing this CA certificate. It's not really recommended on your browser that you use every day to start importing certificates. So in general, if you are going to work with a server, then you should use Let's Encrypt or root certificates. It's for testing or it can still be in production when you can supply your own CA certificate or in companies that manage every browser on every machine, they also sometimes inject their own CA. It's also useful for two-way TLS. As I explained earlier, with two-way TLS, you can have your CA bundled with your client and your server, and then you can also verify it. So this is the end of the demo. I hope that this whole certificate CA has been useful. It teaches you not only how to do it in Go, but also 
shows you in much detail how this signing and validating works and what really the process is when connecting to a secure website. Now that we have our test server running with our self-signed certificates, let's now investigate how we would run our test server with a Let's Encrypt certificate. Let's Encrypt is different because Let's Encrypt can sign using a root certificate, a root certificate that is recognized by your browser or by curl. So we don't need to import the CA certificate to be able to validate the service certificate. Even though Let's Encrypt signs with the root certificate, it was still useful to explore self-signed certificates because it's also useful for two-way TLS. And like I explained in the previous lecture, there are different scenarios where self-signed certificates are preferred. Let's try to create another server. Our Let's Encrypt server. And in this Let's Encrypt server, let's make a new main.go package main. And let's copy paste from our previous lecture. And what we are going to do different now is we're going to use autosert. Autosert is a package provided by Go. So we need to do a go get first. Golang.org x, so it's extra packages, crypto, ECMI, this protocol that is being used by Let's Encrypt and an auto cert. And this package contains helper functions to integrate within our HTTP package, the automatic certification. So we will not have to do much. We will just have to add this auto cert to our TLS server, and then it will create and renew packages for us. So let's have another look at this process. So this is the schematic. What needs to happen is that we need to support this ACME. So our auto sort package will implement this ACME, which is in a separate package, and it will create this well-known URL with this token to be able to verify our server. Let's Encrypt will then know that we own this domain and will issue a service certificate that we can then use. So that is what all happens in the background. The only thing that we need to do is to import this auto cert, copy our code, and we're then going to change this list and serve into just serve. And serve will then ask for a listener, a net listener. And this net listener is implemented by this auto cert. So this auto cert has a new listener and we can just apply the domains, which needs to be a real domain. So if you want to test out this demo yourself, you will have to register a domain or use a domain that you already have. My name is registered by namecheap.com and Namecheap gives you a DNS panel where you can add records to point a DNS name to a server. So it's an in a DNS record and I'm running a VM on DigitalOcean, but you can really run a VM anywhere. And I'll have to then copy this binary, this Go binary that I will create here to my DigitalOcean VM. So the domain name is Go Demo Test New Tech Academy. So if I try to resolve this, host Go Demo Test, this goes to my VM. So you need to have this setup first. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this binary to this VM, run this on this VM and see if I will get the certificate issued by Let's Encrypt. So once this code gets executed, it will serve on 443. So I just have to curl to 443. This new listener of auto search will then go to Let's Encrypt and ask to issue the certificates. So new listener is a convenience function for a common configuration. You can also do more complex configurations by using the auto search manager type. Also important, certificates are cached in the Golang auto search directory. So 
it's not going to issue a new cert every time. It will create a temp directory and you will find your key and your cert in there. So this should be it really. Let's try to build it. Go build. Let's encrypt server. And my server is a Linux server, so I will need to also specify that I want to build this for Linux. So I will specify Go Operating System Linux, Go Architecture AMD64, and I will compile CMD, Let's Encrypt Server, main.go. Then I will copy this over to my test server, SCP. I will need to specify my SSH key, root go demo test and the source file is let's encrypt server now i will have to start this binary on the vm now i'm logged into the vm and i can start it using let's encrypt server and let me now create a new window and I'm just going to go to this website, go demo test new tech academy. And if everything is working, I should get a, it's working, it's working. So no CA certificate warnings, a new certificate has been issued, which is now a let's encrypt TLS certificate. So if I try this in the browser, HTTPS, go demo test. The HTTP will not work because we didn't open anything on port 80, but you could actually add something on port 80 that just will forward to HTTPS. And if you now click here, connection is secure, certificate is valid, and it is a let's encrypt certificate that has been issued, and this is valid. So if you are doing one-way TLS and you need your server to be accessible to everyone on the internet, then the easiest way to do that without having to buy a TLS certificate from one of these known companies is to use Let's Encrypt. And you see that it's very easy to integrate it within your Go program. What happened in the background is that Go did this ACME validation for you in this AutoCert package. There's code to do that for you. And if you then go back to the VM, and you will see these errors as well. It just other people like bots trying to make connections, but we only whitelist this domain name. So we'll only ask a certificate for this host name, not for any host name that people are trying to access. So if we now have a look here in the dot cache directory, there's a Golang auto cert directory. And here we have our certificate. Go demo tests, new tech academy is our certificate. And this is our key. So here's our certificate that has been issued. So this is it for this demo. It's just a very small change to have in Go a Let's Encrypt certificate issued and use it with a TLS listener. I have shown you how to start a server using a self-signed certificate. I've shown you how to use a Let's Encrypt certificate. Now let's try to create a server that is two-way TLS. So any client connecting to our server will also need a client certificate. This is what I explained in one of the previous lectures, the mutual TLS diagram. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new certificate, a client certificate, and the client is then going to connect using TLS to the server. The server will need to be reconfigured a little bit. The server is only allow to accept clients if they have a client certificate. So the server will also have to validate the certificate authority certificate. So we also need to supply this CA cert to the server. Again, this is not very different than our test server. So let's start again with our test server. Let's create directory MTLS server, and then we'll have an MTLS client. main.go so what is going to be different the listen and serve 
we will need to supply our own configuration. We will have to change these TLS configuration flags. So instead of using HTTP listen and serve, we're going to define a server, HTTP server. And then we're going to change HTTP into server. And server now accepts only the sort file and key file. So we're going to remove the port. And then the port is then defined here in address. So address is going to be port 443. And this is not any different than our test server. The difference is going to be the way we are going to configure this server. So in server, we have TLS config. Optionally provides a TLS configuration for use by serve TLS and listen serve TLS. So we're going to use TLS config. TLS config is a type and what are we going to specify? Client authentication. Determines a service policy for TLS client authentication. The default is no client cert. So the default is that we don't need the client to provide a certificate. But we are going to change it into require and verify client certificate. So we will require a client certificate and we will also need to verify it. If we are going to verify it, we also need to supply the CA. Client CA defines a set of root certificate authorities that service use if required to verify client certificate. Client CAs. And this is of type X519 sort pool. So we need to define those. CA is X519 sort pool. This need to be of sort pool type, but we have in this X519 package new cert pool as a function. And then we have CA append cert from PEM, and then we can just load these PEM certs as bytes. To do that, we still need to read the CA cert. CA bytes, error is IO util read file, CA cert, if there's an error, then log fatal error. And then we can supply the CA bytes right here. This replies OK. So if it's not OK, then we also can supply an error. CA cert not valid, for example. And otherwise, in the CA, we have the correct CA now. If you want, you can also supply a minimum version TLS version TLS 13, for example. So 1.3 is minimum then. Now that we are defining error, we don't need to use this column here anymore. I'm going to save this and everything is green. So we loaded the CAs, We're still listening on port 443 and we specify require and verify client cert. So let's try to test this out. Go run cmd mtls server main.go. And let's curl to localhost. Let's curl to this correct host name. Go demo local test me. Unable to get local issuer. CA cert, CA cert. Okay, so when we can verify the server certificate, then we get an error back from the server because we don't have a client certificate. And this is only because we have this line. So let me try to remove that line. And then curl again. If we curl again, it says it's working because we are not verified a client certificate. So to make it working, we actually need a client certificate. 
So let's try to create a client certificate and let's try with curl to connect to this server. And then in the next lecture, we can create our own client in Go. Let's create this client certificate. So this is the command that we used to create the server certificate. This is not what we want. We want to output now a client certificate with the same CA. So I'm going to do minus H and it says assert out and key out. Assert out client assert and key out client.key. Now we have a new certificate signed with the same CA client certificate. Let's try to curl again. So we get the error. Oh, it's still working. So I'm just going to make sure this is saved, run this, allow to make sure that when I do a curl, I get the bad certificate error because the require verify is enabled. So let's now try to use these flags, key and cert. So we're going to use a client key and we are going to use the client.cert. And now it is working. So when we are using a key and a client certificate, where the client certificate is signed by a CA that is in the list of client CAs, it doesn't necessarily need to be the same CA as a service certificate. It just needs to be in this list. Then it will accept a connection. And this is mutual TLS. Mutual TLS is where we can make a connection over TLS but where the server will also verify the client certificate. And the client certificate's CA needs to be within these client CAs. So these client CAs need to contain the CA that our client certificate is signed with. So if you have microservices, for example, then you can have a lot of different server certificates. Then you can give every microservice its own certificate and its own key, have them all signed by a CA, trust the CA, and then you can have communication between them using TLS and where every client is also verified, giving you a very secure way to communicate between services, not only giving you encryption, but also every microservice will have a verifiable identity. It will have an identity because you can actually create a separate certificate for every client. So here I reused actually our go demo local test.me but I could have created a new certificate called Go Demo Client, and then I could have really defined a service certificate in the TLS YAML and a client certificate, which would actually have been a better way to, to do it. I didn't really think it through when I was making this demo, but we should have done Go Demo Client local test.me, and this should have been the, the client, maybe without any DNS names. So every server can basically have its own identity using the common name and you're going to have a different common name for every certificate and then you can have communication between your microservices. Th that the setup with client key worked is logical because you can also use a server certificate and a server key if you want to connect to your server because they are still signed with the same CA. So if you use a server key, it is still working. So in this simple example that I did here, it is all working with either the client certificate or the service certificate. Typically, you're not gonna use a service certificate for the client, but it is actually something that could work. So make sure that you always keep your server key private to your server. Otherwise, if you have the server certificate and a server key, you could also connect to the server and maybe that is not intended. So in the next demo, I will create a mutual TLS client to do the same that I did in curl within Go. And I will create a separate Go demo client certificate that will have a different common name so that we really have a service certificate and a client certificate that is not just a regenerated service certificate. 
in the previous lecture, I showed you how to use curl with this server certificate and this client certificate. I'm now going to create a go demo client. So I'm going now to create this go demo client certificate. And I'm also going to write a client in go that will connect to the server. So this client certificate that I created with the same common name as the server, that's not really how you do it. It was just good for a test, but I'm now going to recreate my certificate. So I'm going to remove the client certificate and client key and recreate it. So we have this TLS command, create cert, CA cert, CA key, and then the cert name should be go demo client, local test me, and cert out is going to be client.cert and key out is client.key. And then we'll have our own common name for our client. So it will have its own certificate using its own common name. It's name and not cert name, name, and the cert is created. Let's now create a new command, cmd mtls client. So this is going to be our client. It will have a main.go. And then I'm just going to write the client that is going to connect to the server. Package main, func main. So how did we do it previously? HTTP get of this host name, go demo local test me, HTTPS, HTTP get returns a response and error. If there's an error, we're going to do a log fatal of the error, defer response body close. And then we're going to read the body. Body error is equal to IO read all of this response body. And then we can say FMT printf body status, status code, HP status code, and the body is a string. So then we have resp status code and the body. So let's try that out. So I'm going to run the server. Let's close all these shells. And then I'm going to run this client. Go run cmd mtls client main.go. It's just a test because I didn't add the certificates yet. Certificate is not trusted. I get. So I will have to add the CA. And because we have this require and verify client certificate, we also will have to add the client key and the client certificate. How do we do that? So when I was doing this MTLS server, then we start the server is HP server. Then we have this parameters that we can add and then we can do server listen and serve TLS. It's very similar with the client. So we can say client equals HTTP client. And then we can do client get. And client has then variables that we can configure. Transport specifies the mechanism by which individual HTTP requests are made. If nil, default transport is used. Transport is HP transport. And what else do we have? We also have a timeout. So if you want, we can also have a timeout of 
60 seconds, for example. Then in HTTP transport, we can add a lot of transport configuration. TLS client config, TLS handshake timeout, TLS client config specifies the TLS configuration to use with TLS client. So this is the one we need. TLS config, what is in TLS config? Certificates. And we will also have something in there called root CAs. And the root CAs are the root certificate authorities that the client uses when verifying service certificates. If root CA is nil, TLS uses the host root CA set. So you're going to create again a cert pool and then add this CA, just like we did at the server. So we are going to copy this. It's exactly the same. We're going to read the CA, the CA cert, create a new cert pool, and then we should be able to validate the service certificate. Let's try to run again our client. Now we can verify our service certificate because we have the CA certificate, but now the remote, which is a server, says TLS bad certificate because we are not supplying this client certificate. So if we have a look now, we get client didn't provide a certificate. So we need to provide a certificate that can be validated by the server. And the server is only going to accept client certificates that are signed by our CA because the only CA cert that we have here as client CAs is our CA.CRT. So what do we have in the TLS config? We have the certificates. Certificates contain one or more certificates chain to present to the other side of the connection. So this is what we are going to need. Certificates, TLS certificates. We just need to now read our certificates. We can do that using TLS load x509 key pair and this accepts a cert file and a key file so cl client crt and client.key and it will then read these two files and then store it in our certificate and our certificate can then be used here and this is actually not a ca this is the error and if there's an error then we're gonna do a log fatal. So now we have loaded our client certificate, our client key. We will make the connection to the server and it will provide our certificate. Our certificate and it also needs the key to make the connection. So without the key, you cannot make the connection. And then we should get the body and the status code if all goes well. So let's try that out. body status 200 it's working so now we have made a connection using go to the server server didn't get an error server just replied with it's working so now we have an mtls connection between our client and server i just want to show you one more thing as i said we should use a different common name for every client and every server and the reason for that is that we are giving our client an identity. Our identity is go demo client local test me. And we can use that. We can use it in our server to see what identity our client has. So if we have two clients with two different certificates, we could distinguish between them. So if we go to MTLS server, we can add a function show common name. Response writer, HP request, and we can then extract our common name and then we'll add another handle func. Where is our common name? It's in the request. So common name 
is going to be the common name. We just need to extract this common name. Var common name is a string and request TLS has this information. Rec TLS verify change. And verify change has the X509 certificate, but it's a chain. So it contains also the root CA, the client CA. So it basically has all the certificates in there, but the certificate that we need is the first one. So what we can do is if rectls is not nil and the length of rectls verified chain is more than zero. And if the zeroth element is also greater than zero, then our common name will be rectls verified chains. The first element and then subject common name. And we know that the first element of this slice is basically our client certificate. So let's see if we can get this working. Common name is show common name. Save this, run this, and then go run, that's the body, and then if I look for common name, your common name is go demo client local test me. So this is the client certificate that has been signed by the CA. I'm able to make a connection, it's encrypted, but I also have an identity the server can verify who is this client exactly, what is the common name of its certificate, and then base actions on that. It can, for example, give me more access to an API or maybe deny access to a certain API endpoint. So this is a quite powerful tool to have within, for example, microservices, where every microservice can have its own identity. And then when we communicate to other microservices, we are aware what service is contacting us. The only prerequisite for this is that you create a certificate, a unique certificate with a unique common name for every client that is going to connect to a server. Or if you have multiple servers, just for every server that you are going to run. So that's it about MTLS. In this section, I'll be talking about DNS, writing a DNS server and resolver in Go. First of all, what is DNS? Simply said, DNS provides a translation between host names and IP addresses. For example, if you type in your browser www.google.com, which is a host name, a DNS server will translate that in the IP address. So the IP address now, when I tested it on my machine, is 142.250.114.99, but if you would test this on your machine, it could be already another IP address. How do you test this on your machine? You can use tools like NSLOCKUP on Windows or HOST or DIG on macOS or Linux to do the translation of a hostname to an IP address. Typically, the laptop or desktop you're working on has one or more IP addresses from your internet provider to run DNS queries. So, the server that you can call to do these DNS queries is typically provided by your internet provider. In Linux and macOS, this you're going to find in etcresolve.conf and on Windows, it's going to be in the DNS server settings. You can check this with ipconfig or you can go to the network settings on a Microsoft Windows machine. So even if you are not using any tooling yourself to translate the hostname to an IP address, Whenever you are using your browser, you type in google.com, the browser will automatically translate the host name to an IP address using a DNS server. So DNS is something very common that you do in the background on a daily basis. So how does a DNS request look like? So you have your browser on one side, your browser is going to do a lookup for, for example, google.com. 
and it's going to do this lookup using a DNS resolver. So your internet service provider DNS resolver will be used or other public DNS resolvers like 8.8.8.8 or 4.4.4.4, which is provided by Google. So it's not because we are doing google.com, it's just something that Google provides. Google provides a public DNS server that you can set up and use instead of your internet service provider DNS resolver. Or you can also use 1.1.1.1 and that one is maintained by Cloudflare, which is not a company. You can also set up this IP address as your DNS resolver and then you'll be able to resolve host names using that DNS resolver that is running on that IP address. So every time your browser is going to go to google.com and we wouldn't know the IP address yet because once you know it, you can cache it. But if you don't know it yet, then it's going to make a call to this DNS server to obtain the IP address for google.com. This DNS server doesn't really know where to find the IP address of google.com immediately. So it will have to go to something that's called the root servers. All the DNS resolvers will have these root servers configured in their DNS resolver settings. So they will have a config file somewhere where they have the IP addresses of these root servers. These are the IP addresses that need to be known to be able to start DNS resolving. So this DNS resolver will then go to one of these root servers and it will ask, what do you know about google.com? It can ask what do you know about google.com or it can ask what do you know about .com because the root servers will not know where to find google.com but they will only know the top level domain, the TLD. So as a DNS resolver, you can actually choose to send google.com to the root servers or just .com. So we're going to ask, do you know about google.com? And they will say, no, I don't know anything about google.com. I am not authoritative for that. Try.com at IP addresses. So the root server will say, google.com, I don't know about, but I can tell you where to go to get information about .com domain names. So the root servers only know where to find the servers of the top level domains. And it will reply the host names and IP addresses of those servers. So then our DNS resolver knows that it can go to another server, specific servers for .com domain names. And that is then what the DNS resolver will do. The DNS resolver will then go to these top level domain servers and it will ask, do you know something about google.com? I want to know what the IP address is. And the TLD servers for .com will then answer, I'm not authoritative for google.com, but the google.com name servers, the google.com DNS servers, you'll be able to find at this IP address. It can also say you can find them at these host names, and then you would still need to do more lookups to know the IP address of those host names. But in the most simple example, it's just going to give us the IP address, and then we can just go to this IP address where the name servers for google.com are, so these are the google.com name servers. And then we're going to ask again, what is the IP address for google.com? And the Google name service, I'm going to say, yes, I have the IP address of google.com. I am authoritative for this domain name, so I can give you this IP address. And then the DNS resolver will then be able to send to the browser the IP address, is this IP address that I found for google.com. The DNS resolver will then typically cache all these IP addresses. How long depends on another field that is being passed. There's a time to live TTL that is also passed. So that TTL will say how long these records can stay in cache. And the DNS resolver will then keep them in cache so that it doesn't always have to go to those servers because Google.com, for example, or just the com TLD are queried quite a lot. So it doesn't really need to go to the root servers every time. It can often skip some servers because they already resolved domain names earlier. But this is the most typical flow where the DNS resolver first goes to the root server, figures out where the top level domain is, then goes to one of the top level domain servers, and then they will give you a host name or a host name and IP address. And then you will be able to go to the name servers for that domain name 
and they will give you an authoritative answer that then can be sent back to the client. So what are those root servers? So those root servers are machines hosted by operators, companies that maintain these servers. These IP addresses, they don't change that often or at all. So they are all configured within these DNS resolvers. There is a website where you can also go to to get the latest list. So that list you download as a config file in your DNS server and these IP addresses you will have to statically configure to be able to know where the root servers are so that you can use them as a starting point. So it's not that every machine, every laptop or PC has this list. They typically have these DNS resolver configured and the DNS resolver will then reach out to those root servers. It's not typically the browser itself that will do that. The browser will just use a resolver that then can handle any DNS resolving for the browser or the user on that machine. Also maybe interesting to note is that even if you see a single IP address here, one IP address is not equal to one server. There are actually multiple servers scattered around the globe that are representing this IP address. So there's also routing in effect that routes you to the closest root server in your region. So there will be multiple servers responsible to be able to handle requests for a single IP address that you see here. How does a DNS packet look like? So before we are going to start writing this DNS resolver in Go, let's have a look how a DNS packet really looks like. So that we know a little bit more in detail how the protocol works, so we can then easily implement it. Once we will start writing our Go program, we are not going to parse the DNS packet ourselves. We are going to use a library that is available within Golang for that. So don't worry if you don't fully grasp all the concepts that I'm going to explain because we will still be able to use this package that comes with Go to be able to pack and unpack these DNS packets. So a DNS packet can be sent to the resolver using UDP or TCP. So if you are a browser, then you can send a DNS packet to the resolver and the packet can be UDP or TCP. So the difference between UDP and TCP is that TCP needs a handshake, so it takes a bit longer to get an answer. The handshake within TCP gives you an extra bit of latency, whereas UDP is stateless, it's just one single packet, so there's much less latency to get an answer. A DNS UDP packet cannot be larger than 512 bytes. This is to avoid the UDP packet being fragmented over multiple packets. Everything larger than that need to be sent over TCP. Let's focus solely on UDP packets to be able to write a simple DNS resolver server. So when we are going to write our DNS server, our resolver, we are only going to do the UDP implementation. So we will not be able to take any packets larger than 512 bytes because that's the maximum. You could use the same mechanism to then also implement TCP later on, but I'm just going to explain the concept and we're going to keep it simple. So we're going to just do UDP. So what is a DNS packet? How does it look like? So our browser will do a lookup and it will use a resolver. It will send a DNS packet using mostly UDP and this DNS packet consists of headers. There will be headers and then actual data. So the actual data, which is going to be the questions and answers, I'm going to go over later. Let's start just with the headers. This DNS packet headers is going to be the same whether it's a question or an answer. So if the browser sends a lookup to a resolver, it's going to have these headers here. And if the resolver sends something back, it's also going to have these headers that I'm showing. So it's not that they have different headers for requests and responses is going to be the same format headers. They're just going to have different values. So the headers start with a query ID, which is 16 bits long. This is just a unique ID that is used to send a request. When the resolver then answers, it will also use the same query ID so that the browser that did the lookup will know that this is an answer for this specific query ID. 
on the next row you will then have flags. You can find the explanation of these flags online if you want to know where every flag stands for. We are going to use this AA code here, so authoritative answer. If a server sends an authoritative answer, then this flag will be set. And this is something we will need to check on to know whether we reached the server that can give us the correct answer or whether we have to reach out to other servers. Then the QR, for example, is question or response. So this one will be set to one if it's a response or a zero if it's a question. Then we have our code, which is the result code, which can contain an error code if there's an error. And there's also TC for truncation. If this is used, this flag needs to be set to one. And then you have recursion desired and recursion available. Recursion means that if the service is not authoritative, that it will itself then go reach out to the authoritative server to get the request. So a resolver is actually recursive because the resolver will go to the different servers to find you the answer. If it wouldn't be recursive, then if you would ask for google.com, it would just say, I'm not authoritative for this domain name, so here's an error. Because it is doing recursive lookups, it will actually go and find the correct server for you and find you the answer. This Z here is also reserved, so we are not going to use this. There are some other flags as well. For example, the R code here, the result code. If there's an error code, then this flag will be set, for example. So these are the flags, and then you also have more information in this header. You have the question count. So if the browser is going to look up one host name, then the question count will be one. The answer count, if it's an answer, it can be higher than zero. If it's a question only, then the answer will be zero. The name server count, so this is going to be necessary if we cannot get the answer from the server, but the server knows other name servers where we can get the answer from, then this will be set. And this is just a count. So this is a field that just counts how many occurrences we will have in the data part of our packet. And then we have the additional count, the number of additional resource records. So this counter is showing how many additional records that we have. For example, this can be IP addresses. If we have the name service available, then the name service will only be the host names. If we also have the IP addresses, then it will be available in the additional records. And here we just have the count of those records. So this is just the header. Now we can have glued together within the same packet also the questions and the answers. So this can be our header for the lookup. And then we're going to have also questions. So then attached to the same packet, we're going to have this question part. And this part is going to have a question name, the DNS name to resolve. So in, in this case, it's going to be google.com. Names are split into labels and start with the length of the label first and end with a zero, a zero octet. So it's going to be double zero if you are reading it in hexadecimal. For example, if you have www.google.com, you will see three, which is the first part, the first label, that's the length of three, www is length of three. Then six, because Google has six letters, so the length of Google is six. And then three more, because then there is com, and then it ends with a zero. And in hexadecimal, this will be zero, zero. Then we're going to have a question type, which in our case is going to be an A record, but it can also be an MX record. MX record is for emails. So if you want to know the email server where to send the emails to, then you will ask for the MX record. Otherwise, you will ask for an A record. The A record is for IPv4. If you have four A's, you're going to ask for an IPv6 record. And then you're going to have the class, the question class, and that's going to be typically internet address. So there's a code for internet address and that is the code that we're going to use. So this question packet together with the header is going to be sent to the resolver. We're also going to have an answer part of the packet and that's going to be attached to the question, but it's going to be empty because we don't really have an answer when we are only asking the question, what is the IP address of google.com? 
So let's have a look at an example packet. Let's say that we want to do a lookup for www.google.com. Then we're going to have the header, the question, and the answer within our packet. So the header is going to have a unique ID, 59E2 is our ID in hexadecimal format. Then we're going to have our flags, which will include that recursion is desired, and that we have one question. Within our question, we'll then find this length 3, which represents 3 times W, then length 6 for Google, length 3 for come, and then it's also going to pass the type and the class, and type A for the A record is going to be 1, so in hexadecimal it's going to be 1, and the class is also going to be 1. So this is how our question is going to look like. So this 363 for the label is just to make it easy to parse. So programmatically this needs to be parsed, and because this field doesn't have set length like the header, we also need some help to know where the field starts or ends, and these lengths, they help us with that. We will not have to do this ourselves, so like I was already saying, we have a package in Golang that will parse this for us. Even though it's going to be parsed for us, it is actually very beneficial to have this schema in mind, so that when we are going to be digging into this package, that you have an ID what the information is that is available in the header, what is available in the question, and what's going to be available in the answer. So let's now have a look at the answer packet. So the answer packet is going to come back from the resolver to the browser. So the answer packet is going to have the name as well, which is the same format as the question name in the question packet. So if you ask for google.com, then it will also send back google.com. Also, the answer packet will have the same headers. So this packet that comes back, I'm only showing the answer part of this packet. It will still also have the headers and the questions in the same packet. So we have the name, the type, the type is going to be A record, the type can be A record, MX record, or something else, the class, the time to live. So if anyone is caching this record, how long can we cache this record? That's what the time to live is going to tell us in seconds. The response data length, so how long is the response going to be, and then the response data. So the response data for an A record is an IP address. So first we are going to say how long this IP address is, and then we're going to actually put straight after that the response data. So what does the packet look like? We are going to have the same ID in the header. We're going to have again the header, the question and the answer. In the header, we're going to have the same ID, but then our header, our flags will look a bit different. You will see here the hexadecimal representation of the flags, which are not the same ones as when we were sending the question, because here we are setting, for example, that we have one answer available. We then have the original question in our question packet. So google.com is still here. And we then have the answer for google.com, the IP address. So the answer from your resolver can come back like this. The first cell here, C00C, is actually a pointer that is saying the name can be found at the position 00C, and that's going to refer exactly to google.com in our question data. So that way we don't have to repeat the name in the answer. So there's a mechanism to make the packets smaller. Then we have the type, so it's an A record, so it's going to be 1, the class is also going to be 1, the time to live, so this is the representation of time to live. If you would convert this hexadecimal number to just a number, then you would get the amount of seconds that you can cache this entry. Then how long is the response going to be? The response is going to be 4 bytes, so 16 bits, so 8 hexadecimal letters. And if you would take those eight hexadecimal letters and convert this again, then you would see the IP address that starts with 142. So this is an example answer packet that could come back from the Google server that then the resolver sends back to the browser. So if you would like to know exactly what is in this header, then you would need to expand these hexadecimal numbers because you would need to see on a bit level whether a certain flag is set to 0 or 1 to see what flags have been set. 
So lastly, Go packages. Luckily, Go has packages available to parse those DNS packets. So we don't have to do it ourselves. Golang.org X for extra net DNS, DNS message is the package that can be used to unpack, which is decode and pack and code DNS packets. So when a DNS packet comes in over UDP, those bytes can then be parsed by this packet. And that way we don't have to manually go and try to parse this binary data. We have this package available to us to do that for us. And then we just can use this DNS message to extract the information that we need to build our resolver. So then we still need the net package that can be used to listen for UDP packets and send UDP packets to other DNS servers. So those are the main packages that we would need in our program to then write a DNS server that can resolve host names if you would send a query to it. And that's what I will show you in the next lecture. In the next lecture, I will show you how to build a DNS resolver in Go. Before we start writing our DNS server, our resolver in Go, let's go over the logical flow diagram so that we get an idea of what we are going to create. How is our resolver going to look like? Well, we are going to have to listen to UDP. So we're gonna create a UDP socket on port 53. Port 53 is the DNS port. We'll then have a client that is going to connect to our UDP port on our machine and the client is going to send a packet. So we need to handle this packet. Whenever a new packet comes from a client, we need to handle it and we can then start parsing it. So we can use this DNS message package from Golang to make it easy to parse a DNS packet, but we still need to figure out what fields we need to extract and have a look at. So the question part of the packet looks like this. It will have a question name, for example, www.google.com, question type, what do we need to know for this name, for this host name? We need, for example, a record, the question class, and for us, it's always going to be an internet address. Let's go in a little bit more detail. So we're going to parse our question. And then we're going to create a for loop. We are going to do a few actions in a loop until a certain condition is met. We are first going to query the server. The first DNS server that we are going to query is going to be the root server or one of the root servers. When the DNS package comes back from the root server, we are going to ask a question, is the answer authoritative? Yes or no. If it is yes, the first iteration of the loop, it will never be because we are asking the root server and the root server is always going to redirect us to another server. But this is part of our loop. If it is yes, then we can send the answer back to the client. If the answer is no, and if we are sending a query to the root server, it's going to be no, then we need to parse the authorities section in the DNS packet that comes back from the root server to get the new servers. So those servers are going to be the name servers for, for example, .com. So once we have these new servers, we'll have to again query the server, but instead of querying the root servers, we are going to query this new server, this new authority that our root server gave us in this DNS packet that we now know and that we now can query. So let me quickly show you with a DNS tool how this actually works. So I have a tool called dig and I can use dig trace google.com and it's going to show me the trace of all the queries that you would need to do. So the first query is going to be to the root servers. So these are the root servers 
aRooter.net. You saw these names on the slide. So we will query these, these root servers and we'll ask where can I find .com or google.com. Typically, you send less data to a DNS server, so it's just going to be .com. And the query would then go to one of the root servers. And the root server would then say, here, look, these are the name servers. And it's going to be in this authority section. So here we have a.gtldservers.net. And these are going to be then the servers that we can query. And then we can go to these servers and ask where is google.com. And then they say google.com. You can find those at ns1google.com, ns2.google.com, and so on. And then we can go to one of these name servers that belong to Google, and then we can get our A record. So these would then be a few iterations in our for loop to get eventually to the IP address. There's just one detail missing here. And when we say, is the answer authoritative? Then we say no, then we're going to parse the authorities to get the new servers. Any server that we're going to query might actually not give us the IP addresses. So the authorities only contain host names. We might get IP addresses, but we also might not get the IP addresses. So let's have another look in this for loop in more detail. So we have the query server. Is the answer authoritative? No. Then we're going to parse the authorities to get the new servers. These are typically the host names. And then we're going to parse the additional resources. And in those additional resources, which is part of the DNS packet, we are going to find the IP addresses if the server, the DNS server, is going to give them to us in this DNS packet. So here we have to ask ourselves again a question. Is the IP address included? If yes, then we have the IP address and we can query the next server and do another iteration of our loop. But if it's not included, then we have to start the whole loop function again to query the A record of the name server. For example, if the name server is ns1google.com, then we have to start the whole loop again. So typically, when we are going to query google.com and google.com has a name server within the same domain name, they will supply the IP addresses. But if Google is using another name server of another domain, it might as well not supply the IP addresses. If we are querying google.com and the name server is ns1google.com, then typically the IP addresses will be supplied because otherwise there's no way of knowing the IP address because we would just end up in an indefinite loop. It's often that when we could query google.com and the name server would not be in the google.com domain name, it would be something completely different. For example, it would run another company for some reason, then the IP address might not be known and then we would have to do a lookup. So then we have to start a new loop. We kind of have to go again in the same function to do a lookup of this domain name. Here with google.com, the IP address is actually supplied, so we could immediately create a new server, but with other domain names, it's not always the case. So a domain name XYZ might have an Amazon name server, and then we have to look up the amazon.com domain name, get the IP address, and then only we can continue. So once we have this IP address of this ns1google.com or some other host name, then we can actually continue because then the IP address we have, and then we can go to yes and create a new server with that IP address. So this will become more clear once we start writing the code. You just have to remember that we are going to parse the authorities to get these servers. We're going to parse the additional resources to get the IP addresses. If the IP address is not included, we are going to have to do more queries. If the IP address is included, we can just continue our loop and query the new server that we have found. Let's now have a look how to write this DNS server, which will be our resolver in Go. I opened my DNS start project that comes from 
my github.com repository golang for devops course and in this dns start project i have a cmd dns resolver so to start my project i will enter something like go run cmd dns resolver main.go which just says starting the dns server there's no code yet so here i will have to write my code to start the server to listen to udp packets then i will have a package the resolver.go and this resolver.go it has the root service defined so that you don't have to copy paste it in there and i will keep it up to date if there's a ip that would ever change then i will update it here and this resolver.go has the function handle packet so we can start a server in main.go but then we can use the function handle packet in this dns package to handle an incoming packet the benefit of doing it like this is that i also wrote a test file here i have this test file to test this test handle packet where i will try to resolve two host names and if it returns an error then it will stop so if i execute this now then serve error not implemented yet because i have the error not implemented yet returned here within this handle packet we will also have to contact other dns servers and for that we have the outgoing dns query and for this outgoing dns query which will make a dns query to a server defined here in the parameters for that i also have the test outgoing dns query test where we test whether we can reach the root servers and we're going to try, try to resolve the com which we know that we can resolve that we're going to ask for the name server type so we're going to ask the root server what is the name server for that com just as a test and if that works then our test will succeed so right now doesn't work we have no header found because the header is nil because we are just returning nil so these tests they test these two functions so if you use this start package with these functions it's easy to actually test whether your code works i also have this mock packet con because that's what i'm passing here i'm asking for a packet connection so this is an interface for a packet connection because we will have to use this variable here this pc to send something back to the client so we can send a udp packet back and that's why we have this so i'm just mocking this so that we can test this function without having to send a package back well we will trigger sending a package back in this function but nothing will really happen if we mock this function so i'll first start with this function it should be relatively easy outgoing dns query where we're just going to contact over udp another dns server and next i will then start the server and then start working on the handle packet code and then when everything is finished the test should also succeed let's start with this outgoing dns query let's have a look at our signature so we have servers service is a slice of net ip so net ip represents an ip address it's in type bytes so we'll have to convert a string ip address into bytes if you want to use this but that is actually quite easy if we have a look here we have the function net parse that can take a string and it returns a net ip address so we have our servers can be the root server can be the google name server can be the amazon name server or can be the name server for the com tlds for example and then we have the question and the question is of type dns message question so i was saying that we are going to use this dns message package so a dns message question is a question struct that contains a name type and class just like i showed you what 
a question really contained in a packet. So it contains a name, the type, and the class. And that's what we need to then ask a question to an external DNS server. We are going to return the DNS message parser, which will then give us access to the packet that is being returned from the server. It will also return the header. Just like I showed you in the slides, the header contains an ID, a response, which is a flag, operation code, whether it's authoritative or not, whether it's truncated, recursion desired, recursion available, authentic data, checking disabled, and the R code. So this is the header of the packet. This is the parser where we can then get more information from the packet. So if we're going to trigger this, this outgoing DNS query, then we can trigger this with a question. Here's our question, DNS message question. It has a name, type NS, and a class, and then it's going to call this outgoing DNS query using the server, which is the first of our root server, because we just kind of split them based on the comma here, and here it is comma separated IP addresses, and we're gonna take the first IP address, parse this, and then pass this net IP address to outgoing DNS query together with our question. So what are the next steps that we need to do to then actually reach out to the server and ask this question? We have to start by sending a UDP packet to the server. And what are we going to put in this packet? Well, we're going to put a DNS packet in there. And to put a DNS packet in there, we need to craft our message and package it, and then we'll be able to send it. So let's start with making our message. So our message is going to be of type DNS message message, which is a struct. And in this struct, we can put our header and our question. So this is going to be our DNS packet. So we have the header. If we have a look at this message, we have the header, questions, answer, authorities, and additionals. To send a question to a server, we only need those two the header and the questions. Questions is a slice, and I already have my questions available here. So the header is of type header. What do I need? I need an ID for sure. And I need to say that it's gonna be a question, so response is gonna be false, so I don't need to enter anything. So what I might do is just for clarity, add a few of these headers, like, is the response? No, it's false. But then it's clear that this is a question. Let's start with the ID, because it also comes here first. And the ID is an unsigned int 16. So you want to return a random number between zero and the maximum unsigned int 16. What is this maximum? We can actually use the variable max and assign this uint16 0 with this flag in front of it which will return the maximum possible unsigned int16 so this max will have the maximum unsigned int16 in this max variable and then the next step would be to use the crypt rand library to generate a number between 0 and this max unsigned in 16. How do we do that? We have the run library and then this one shows math run, but we need crypto run. We need an integer. This needs a random reader and then we need to supply a big integer and it then returns a big integer, which we then have to cast back to an unsigned integer and an error if there's an error. So, rand reader, and then big has a new int, new int, which accepts an int64. So we can say int64 of this max, we change this type from an unsigned int to an int64. Now we have the maximum here defined, and we can say random 
number error is run int. If there's an error, return the error. If there's no error, we would still need to convert the random number to an unsigned integer. So unsigned 16 of this random number. But this random number is of big int. So random number has actually a function to return an int 64. And then once we have an int 64, we can convert it to an unsigned int. So it's a lot of steps just to get the right format. But then we have exactly this ID in the unsigned int 16, because that's a type that it asks. What's next? Let's have a look in this header again. Opcode, opcode, and opcode is a DNS operation code. So this opcode, if you're going to have a look in this package, then we see that opcode is of type opcode, and it's also uh, unsigned in 16. An opcode is a DNS operation code, and we typically just use a static value for this, which is just going to be zero. So we can use DNS message opcode as a function to change the type of this zero to opcode. So now we are changing this zero here to type opcode. So we're using this type opcode to match the correct type. And this is just going to be zero. What else? We can leave it like that. I'm not even sure if we really need those last two fields because probably the defaults will be zero and false anyways. It's just to make it clear that we need these set like this. So we have the message, we have the header, then we have the questions. So here we have one question. So we can say DNS message question. And we have only one question. So this is a slice of the type question and we only supply one question. Now this message is of DNS message message and this DNS message message is a struct and has the back function which returns the bytes. So now we can just say buffer error equals message dot pack and now we can use this buffer to send to our DNS server. If there's an error, we're going to return it. So how do we make a connection to our server? We can even have multiple servers. So we should do this in a loop for server in range servers. We can use net dial. So net dial, dial connects to the address on the name network. No networks are TCP and also UDP, UDP. So we can say we are going to make a UDP connection to a certain address. The address is the server, and this is of type net IP, and this needs to be of string. So we're just going to use a string function and we're gonna do this on port 53 because that's a DNS port. So dial, here are some examples. So here's an example for DNS. This is an IPv6, but we are going to use IPv4. So we are doing dial and what does dial return? A connection and an error. Our connection we probably want outside our for loop, so I'm going to say var con is net con, con and error equals net dial. If there's an error, we are going to continue. So if there's no error, then we can break. And if there's an error, then 
we will just continue until we hit a server that actually works. So we then just need to check our if. So we either then need to check our error or our connection. So if connection is still nil, there's no connection made, then we can return an error. Fail to make connection to server servers. I will just say, what is the error? Return nil, nil, and then the error. So now that we know that we have a connection, we can write something to our connection. So we can use con write accepts bytes. Here's our buffer. And then it will return the bytes that it has written and the error. So if there's an error, then we're going to return the error. If there's no error, we're going to read the bytes from our connection. Let's have a look at this connection. So read and write and close. So we can use a reader, a Golang reader, a stream reader to read this out. I can use buff IO, new reader of this connection. And then I can read this into a variable reads data into P. So I just need to define a variable where our answer will go in. I can make a new byte and it's not going to be more than 512 bytes because it's a maximum. And I can read my answer. So read will read data into P. P is my answer and it returns the amount of bytes that it has read and the error. So if there's an error, I will return it. And now I can try to parse this again with our DNS message because this, what we get back, this answer should be a DNS message. Before I'm going to do that, I can actually close the connection just to make sure that we close it already because we don't need it anymore. We just want packet so we can close it. And then I need this DNS message and this DNS message has a parser. The parser is a struct. So now this is all going to be empty and our parser has a function to start. Parser allows incrementally parsing a DNS message. When parsing is started, the header is parsed. Next, each question can be either parsed or skipped. Alternatively, all questions can be skipped at once. So basically, because we are doing it incrementally, we can say first start, then we get a header, and then we get the questions. If we start with the questions, if we don't need the questions, we do skip questions, which is here, skip questions, or skip all questions so that we can either go to the next questions if there's more or skip all the questions if you want to go to the answers. All answers, authorities and additionals can be either parsed or skipped in the same way and each type of resource must be fully parsed or skipped before proceeding to the next type of resource. So this is a funny way to use this package but this parser is very much optimized so it's not going to read the data that you might not need. So first you read the headers because the headers come first, then the questions. If you don't need the questions you can skip the questions and then you can start reading the answers. And you can do the same then afterwards with the authorities and the additionals. Know that there is no requirement to fully skip or parse the message. So if you just need the, he the headers, you don't need to skip anything. Or if you only want to read the questions, you don't need to skip the questions, you can just read the questions. So this is the parser. So we're going to 
say b is our parser b has start and accepts our bytes our by side answer so we're going to say answer but are we going to send all the bytes to our parser because we only actually need the bytes that we have read so this is 512 big but our message message might only be 100 bytes so we're going to stop at n because that's what we have read so if you read only 100 bytes we get the first 100. this gives us the headers and an error so headers error if there was an error we just return mmt error f so it's clear if there's an error parser start error the error and then we could use the headers now what we could do is we can check the header whether our headers contains what we want and we can also check the question whether our question contains the question information that we were looking for and if that is all okay we would then return the parser so that we can later on use it so we're going to return the parser and we're also going to return the header so that we can also use the header later on so those are the headers or is it header it's actually is it header or headers it's a header so that way we can then use the header and the parser later on if after calling this function what else do we need we might want to do some checks here whether we have a success response code or not so let's maybe do that first then test it and then write some more checks just so that we can do some basic checks for example whether we have the same question as we asked for so before i'm going to return the parser i already want to check the questions because there might be something wrong in the questions and we want to do these checks first then skip the questions and then when we return this function we can immediately continue with the answers so the questions are b questions or could be all questions b all questions and now if i want i can check whether we have the same question so we can i can say len questions is equal to my original message questions so here i can also check the length so that my original message is here on top so do i have the same amount of questions returned that i started with if not i can return an error because then something went wrong and then i can say okay now i did my question checks now i'm gonna skip the questions skip all questions and this only returns an error so here just between all questions and skip all questions i can do my question checks if i want to check these things for example i can check now whether question name is equal to the original name and then i skip them and now next i'll be able to return the parser and the parser will be able to process the answers so the processing the answers i will then do in the handle packet so i could test this now because if you have a look here i'm going to have a header i'm going to have an answer my header could check the response code then i can skip all the answers and then i can check the authorities so if i want to check the authorities i need to skip the answers if i then want to check on the additional resources i need to do skip authorities so that's how it goes you go down the packet by getting the questions then the answers then the authorities then the additional records 
So let's test it by running the test. If something goes wrong, you can always do a debug test to see. New outgoing DNS query for com on these servers, and my test is passed. If your test wouldn't complete and you have exactly the same code, also check whether you actually are allowed to contact the root server directly. Maybe your internet provider would forbid that by blocking port 53, for example, to anything else than their own DNS servers. That is a possibility, a remote possibility, but most of the internet providers just allow DNS because you also have Google's and Cloudflare's public DNS servers. So that should, in general, that shouldn't be really a problem. If you get an error or panic, have a look at the code, whether you did something wrong, different, and you can, of course, use the debug test. So it's not much happening here. We are just doing a test. And here we are checking whether we are getting the answers. And we're getting some answers. So I could actually output the, the ARS authorities just to see if it actually is working. ARS authorities. And then run this. And then I have the parsed authorities. So we have the header, name, type, class, time to live, and the length. So we have the name com and the NS records. So here we have all these NS records for the com domain name so that we know what the name servers are for the .com top level domain name. You could also change this into google.com figure out what the name service for google.com and then use the server name server google.com here and then you could do a query on google as well so then that could work as well if you want to test so test outgoing dns query just makes with net dial a connection to the server or to the list of servers and then writes our message this is our message with our questions and then parses the DNS message using the parser. We parse the questions already in our function, which we don't have to do. I'm just doing it here. You can also just return the parser without doing this. And then you have to also parse the questions every time you are calling this outgoing DNS query. So it's up to you whether you want to do that or not. And then to test, you can run the test. And if your test succeeds, if it passes and you can print the authorities, for example, and you get something, then we have made a call to another DNS server. So this will be a building block for when we are going to handle an incoming packet in our DNS server, when we are going to run as a server, because when we have a request for, for example, google.com, we will have to first contact the root server. The root server will tell us where the .com top level domain server is, then we can ask this server where google.com is, then we can do a DNS query to the google.com DNS server. And every time we are making DNS query, we are going to use this outgoing DNS query function. So this function is quite important to have this one working first. And the next step is going to be to write our server. Let's now start writing our resolver. So here I'm again in Visual Studio Code. We wrote our outgoing DNS query. Now we have to start a server and then write this handle packet so that we can run another test, our test for test handle packet, where we try to resolve google.com and amazon.com. We are going to put these in a DNS message is going to be the header is going to be the questions. So name type an a record we're going to ask. We are going to pack this into a byte slice and then we're going to send this to a handle packet. So we use a mock packet connection. So because we are not really initiating a real connection, our IP address is going to be localhost, and then we're just going to send our buffer, which is this DNS question. 
if this all goes well, then our test works. We might want to write some other tests though, because this test is just going to test the handle packet. You might also want to manually test a few things. How do you test whether our DNS server works? On Mac or Linux, you can use dig. Dig with at and then the name server that you want to use. And then for example, google.com. Nothing is running yet, so it will not work. With NSLOOKUP on Windows, you can use NSLOOKUP and you can, for example, say on a resolve google.com on the name server 127.0.0.1 and the same on Linux as well. If you want to resolve google.com, you can also do that on 127.0.0.1. So there are tools on your machine that you can use that are installed by default or that you can install. For example, dig, you can install both on Windows and on Linux and on Mac. NSLOOKUP should be default on Windows. NSLOOKUP also has an interactive shell where you can just type requests. It is something like NSLOOKUP and then you just don't enter the host name and then the name server is 127.0.0.1 and then you're going to end up in a shell in Windows. There's also NSLOOKUP on Linux and on Mac but I never really use it. Maybe it is even a bit compatible. I often use dig or host. So this is how you test in a shell, but if you don't have any tools, you can also use test handle packet, which tests this handle packet. You could even write your own test here that is going to do an outgoing DNS query on your own server. That could also be a possibility. So you could actually also write everything in Go. So these are our tests. We don't have to really look at it straight away. We can first start writing a little bit of code and then we can enter debugging, for example, to see how it goes. Or just what I also do is a lot of print lines to see what the actual content is when we are then using the command line tools to do manual DNS queries. So let's get started with the server. So starting DNS server and now we need to Start it for real. I'm going to use that net package. Listen packet. The listen packet function. Listen packet announces on the local network address. And then we can process the packets. The network is UDP and the address is just 53. So we're going to listen to all the IP addresses that we locally have. And this is going to give us a packet connection and an error. Packet connection, error. What if there is an error? If there is an error, I will just panic for now. It's plain simple so that we also get the error message. We want to defer packet connection close. So at the end of the function, we want to close the socket that we opened and then we're going to have a loop a for loop so we're going to read the bytes if there are bytes coming and if there are bytes coming we're going to put them in a buffer and then we're going to trigger a handle function this handle function this handle packet is local so we're going to create another one for and then Let's make a new buffer of type bytes. Packets are never going to be bigger than 512. So we can put just 512 here to make it ourselves easy. Packet connection read, read from, reads a packet from the connection, copying the payload into P. Our payload is going to be the buffer and then it returns the number of bytes read, the network address, and an error. So bytes read, the address, and an error. Well, if there's an error, we can just print something. Read error 
from the address and this is the error address string this is going to return as address in the string and the error and then we just want to continue because then we can just continue the for loop if there's no error then what we can do is we can use this handle packet but if you would use this handle packet then we are not going to go back to our for loop because then we will be then we would be executing that function so what we want to do is we want to use a go routine here so that we return back into our loop and then we will be blocking here we will be blocked here until there's not a client that has sent us some data and if there's not a client that sent us some data then we will again execute this go routine in the background so we are going to create a go routine for every client that is connected and that sends us a package so for that we need another function handle packet and it is also in a package the dns package so i need a capital h to make it accessible and a go routine is not going to return anything so handle packet go handle packet what are the parameters my packet connection the address and the bytes packet connection the address and the bytes the bytes are in the buffer how many bytes am i going to pass all 512 no i only want to pass the bytes that i have read so i can say from the beginning to the bytes read go dns handle packet it's going to be and then it's going to be importing my dns start slash pkg dns so now this should be all the code i need in my main.go and now i can go to my resolver.go and then here i can say if a handle packet which returns an error same parameters if the error is not equal to nil then i'm going to just print something so that i have something on screen handle packet error maybe i will pass also the address so that i know and that is the, going to be the error the address string and the error save this maybe i want here as well a return at the end handle packet handle packet so now this is the only code that we have to write outside our test all the other code can go straight into this handle packet so let's have a look in this handle packet what do i receive the dns packet how do i parse this i'm going to use the dns message to parse this packet and then i can say p start of whatever is in my buffer and it's going to give us a header and an error and if you have an error i will just return it now that we have started parsing this dns message i can extract one or more questions p has all questions which is a dns message question slice or just question for simplicity now i will just assume that there's only going to be one question but we can also do all questions and then we can have another loop but i will keep it simple for now so we're going to say p question so the question is p question and also returns an error i think question and error if there's an error i will 
return it the error and now we know that here we have a question now we can see what is in this question so it's going to be a host name a type and a class and that is our question that we have to solve what is the type the a record of a certain host so we're going to use a separate function for that we're going to do a dns query and we're going to query a specific server with our question so we're going to have a question and we're going to have a server or servers what servers are we going to use well the first time we're going to run this is going to be the root servers but we still need to parse this so i will also make a separate function for that get root servers so we're going to do a dns query a function that we still have to write and we're going to pass the server that we want to query and the question that we have once this is done we will have a response maybe an error as well and that response we then can send back to the client so how do we send it back to the client if we have a response well let's first fix the error if there's an error we're going to return it let's say we already have our answer our response what's going to be the format of this it's probably going to be a dns message and then maybe just a whole message that's what we want to construct in our dns query and then we can easily send it back to our client so what is special about this is that we have to use the same id we have here this header with an id in that is randomly generated by our client so what we want to do is when we send a response we want to make sure that this id is the same so dns query let's try to write our function for this dns query we get root servers we can reuse this it's going to be always an ip address we're going to have a question so this is the same we're going to have a question that we're going to want to pass the question here is of type dns message question what are we going to return we want to return a full message dns message message so it's going to be a full message that we want to return so we can send it back to our client and then we're going to have also maybe an error so i'll just return nil nil so we don't have any compile errors then we have the response which is dns message so if there's an error we return the error get root servers maybe you should parse this first so this needs to be a net ip address so let me write this first get root servers maybe all the way at the bottom get root servers and we're going to apply a net ip slice root servers is strings split i'm going to split these root servers it's comma separated and then we can loop those root servers and then we just need to create a new ip address for every root server the net package has parse ip which takes a string the root server is a string and then we need to put this in root servers you now i will call these root servers our net ip and then i will just move this here so our root service our net ip slice and then we just need to append it so now we converted our strings that we split into a net ip return root servers so now we have a slice of net ips with the ip addresses of our root servers so get root servers 
and then we have the response. What are we going to do with this? First, we need to make sure that our response header ID is the same as our header ID because the client sent us a DNS packet with a specific header ID, a DNS header ID, and we need to, when we send the response, have the same ID. And now we could send this to the client. Our response is still in the DNS message format, so we need to do response pack, and it will return the bytes. So if you say, these are new buffer, do I need to make a new buffer for that? Response buffer error. If there's an error, we return. And then we have this net packet connection that we can use. PC write to. We can write the response buffer. Where are we going to write it to? To the address that we also passed here. This is a client address. And then we have the bytes returned. I don't think we need this bytes returned. We just need to make sure that if we have an error that we pass error and then return nil. Save this. So then we just have to write our DNS query function, which is going to be very long and complex. So to try to see if the code that we have written works, let's try to return a simple DNS message. An error, for example. So our DNS message is going to contain a header. And remember, this header also has in this DNS message header field. Should I put returns? Probably yes. We have this R code. R code is a response code. And what if we just send a failure? R code server failure. So we have a server failure. Then at least we are responding something back to the client. So that when we have a packet that comes in, we can see if it gets parsed, if we get the questions, and then we can do the DNS query. Now that we also have the questions, let's just also print out the questions that we have to verify where we can actually see something. Question, because we only parsed one question. So now we can actually test this easily. We could actually write a unit test of this handle packet with a little bit more simpler names. We could do a test handle packet and see where we get the right code back. We could actually use this test, I think, because we are not really checking on errors. We're just checking whether, whether this handle packet does return any errors. And will it return errors? No, it will not return errors, I think, because we will just send something back to the client, a server failure. So let's maybe do the unit test first, and then let's do it using the command line. Okay, so this worked. We have printed the question, google.com, type A, amazon.com, type A, and it just passes because we are not really checking whether the packet that comes back contains the answer that we are looking for. We are just, just simply checking whether we are not getting any error. So that works. Now let's try to run our server. Starting the DNS server. I'm gonna open a new shell. And now we can use dig or an lookup or host. Dig. I'm going to use dig first. So dig at one two seven zero zero one, and then I'm going to try Google.com. And what did I get? Status serve fail. So I did actually get a serve fail. So my server is running. I got a response because. Let's try actually first what happens if there's no server running. You see, nothing happens. I cannot connect, it will time out. Then I can run the server 
and then you will see immediately the question coming up because Dick keeps on retrying. Dick keeps on retrying, which can also be annoying at some point. So you can also put it off. There is something like tries, tries. So if you do Dick plus tries is one, there will only be one try. Tries one. I'm querying my local host, google.com or xyz.com. And then here we'll get google.com and xyz.com. So our server works. We are able to handle packets. We are launching GoRoutine for every packet. We are parsing our question that works. We are starting the DNS query function with our root service with our question. We are printing the question, but we don't have any other code. So we are sending a server failure. And then it goes back here. We fix the header ID. We package our response into bytes and we send the bytes back to the client. And then our client is actually getting a serve fail. So how does it actually look with other clients? So if you would use host, host google.com 127.0.0.1, you also get the serve fail. So Google not found serve fail. Let's try with NS lookup. How does it work? I haven't actually used it before. Yeah, it's the same. So NS lookup and then NS lookup you can use on Windows. I wonder whether it actually, it's actually the same behavior. So yeah, if you use NS lookup dash 127001, then you can just type uh, your host name that you want and then make sure that the server that you're querying is then 127001. So that all works. You can use dig, host, NS lookup, connect to our server, or you can use the unit test here. Benefit here is that you can do debugging. So I can say, I want to know what this ID is. So I put a breakpoint, I run debug test, and then I have my debugging console. So what is the ID? The ID is this hexadecimal number. How does my response look like? It's a message with headers. These are the headers. There's no and there's no answer. There's only this sur fail. Where is this sur fail? The R code. R code sur failure. And then I can actually continue to see what happens. And then it does the same for Amazon because we have a loop here. So I can actually continue here and then we are doing the same for Amazon. And then it stops and it's my output and it passes. So multiple ways to test this, which is going to be necessary because you want to test this all the time. Every time you write some code, you want to see if it is working. So next we are going to write this DNS query. This will be the actual meat of our resolver. This is where we are going to do our resolving for real. Before we continue, let's have a look where we are. So we did the listen to UDP socket on port 53. We tested whether a client can connect. We have a new packet that we then send to the handle packet function. We parse the question. We didn't send it to the root server yet. That's going to be the next step. We actually just returned an answer after the parse question back to the client to test whether that works. So what we're going to do now is we're going to enter our for loop and our for loop is going to query the server, first the root server, we're going to check whether the answer is authoritative. If yes, then we can send the answer back. If not, then we're going to have to parse the authorities. Check whether there's an IP address. 
yes or no, and then create new server and continue this loop. To make sure that if I would write a mistake somewhere that we don't end up in a loop querying one of these root servers, I'm just going to also limit the for loop to let's say three or five loops. So if something goes wrong and we write the wrong code, then at least we are not hitting one of these servers with DNS packets as fast as we can. So we are going to limit our for loop and that should be it. So we just have to write what's in the for loop here and that's gonna be that's gonna be this code because the previous slide actually doesn't show everything. Here we have then whether our IP address is included. So we're gonna parse these additional resources where we can find potentially an IP address. So it's a little bit more complex, but should be doable. It is surprisingly not a lot of lines of code because we can use this DNS message package. We don't really have to worry about the DNS packet itself. So let's get started. Let's clear our screen a little bit. We will not need this for now. DNS query. This should be a for loop. You can leave the print for some time. Then afterwards you can remove it. For i is zero as long as it's less than three let's increase it and then we are in our for loop and the first thing we have to do is we have to do a dns query we have this outgoing dns query function that we have written so we're going to do outgoing dns query our servers our question and it's going to return the parser parser an error what is the parser it is actually the dns entrack we'll call it outgoing dns query and there's also the header so the outgoing dns query if i scroll down here we do a skip all questions so now i can actually parse immediately the answers so we can say First, let's handle this error. DNS answer dot get all, all answers. These are all the answers. So these are the parsed answers. We'll also have an error if there's an error in the parsing. And let's maybe start with the end of our loop which will not happen at this point, but the most easy part is if the header says that it is authoritative, then we can actually just send back a message, the DNS message. We have a header, DNS message header. Here we put the ID, so we only need to put that we now have a response. And then the answers what is the answer well we have the parse answers here we can just say answers is a parse answers is there an error no there's no error and actually my return error here is also wrong so here return nil error and here we return the error message so if our answer is that we get from the dns server is authoritative then we can just return the message with the answers and then we just make sure that the id is correct here and that should work but this is only going to work at the end it's not going to work when we are just querying the root servers what are the root servers going to do the root servers are going to tell me if it is not authoritative it's going to have in this dns packet the authoritative name servers so we should parse those and those would also be in this parser dns answer authorities all authorities 
and this returns a resource authorities error if there's an error we exit so this is of type resource this is of type resource what is a resource resource has a header and a body so we will need to parse this body as well resource header is a name a type class and then a body so name is going to be the actual name so let's output what is actually in there or let's use debugging to see what is, what is actually in there so we know how to parse this so this is authorities and it's a slice so we will have to for sure loop them and actually what we can also do is just output them so we can use debugging or just output it what is in there maybe i will just output it authority but what if there are no authorities so just in the case that there are none let's write a check so if there are no authorities then it will be zero if it is zero then we can send a message back server failure what else do we have refused not implemented format error name error it's probably not really a name error we will need to have a look at the dns specification what exactly we would have to return here but let's keep this for now you can, all, you can always look it up later let's keep this for now so that if our authorities would be empty for some reason because we wrote something wrong then at least we know that we, uh, we see this name error here let's try to run this go run cmd main.go and let's use dig tries one of google.com and just to make sure we are going to query three times so let me just break here so we don't query three times uh, unconditionally terminated just for now and then we return the server failure code so we don't query three times so we get the server fail but what we get here is more interesting so what do we get new outgoing dns query for google.com these are the root servers and what is in this authority header name com name server ttl and then the body length 20 but that's here this length is because the in the dns packets it doesn't want to repeat always the same name so there's some optimization going on but let's have a look what is in these bodies i think we can do it like that and then we have the must new name and then we have the names of these name servers so a g t l d servers.net and so on b c d e f so this we want to save in a variable so we're going to have name name servers make what is it going to be a string the size len authorities i don't really like this go string here it doesn't really show exactly the name it shows how it looks in go so it's an ns resource so we just need to check exactly what the type is so if authority header what is in the header we have a type 
and the type is of DNS message type. If this is equal to type NS, then we have an NS type, and then we can for sure know that the authority body is of type DNS message NS resource. And when we know it's the NS resource, then we have NS, and then we can do a string. This will give us the NS string, which is going to be this. This we can add to the name servers. So now that we have sized it correct, we, we can do it like this. We don't need to append because it starts from zero. And then we already right sized it right here. So now we have all the name servers. Could check again if that's exactly what we have. Name servers. Yeah. Those are the name servers, but we don't have the IP addresses yet. So we would have to now check where we have these IP addresses. And these are going to be in another place within the same DNS packet. These are going to be in DNS answer, the additionals. The additionals is going to give us these additionals and an error if there's an error. And these additionals we can loop again. So just like we did here, additionals, additional, it's a resource. What is the type of this additional? Hmm, we don't know yet. Let's comment it out. Let's have a look what is in there. So you can also just use debugging. I'm just going to print it. What is in these additionals? Well, I can remove this. Do another query. Uh, it says header, the name, and then we have type A. This is IPv6, this is IPv4. You're going to keep it simple, so let's use IPv4. And then the body is going to be the IP address. So the additionals are going to have the IP addresses. So if the type is, what is the type here? Type A. What can I do with this? I can put this in a variable resolver servers. which is going to be an IP address. So this is type A. And I just need to use append now. Because I don't know how many there are going to be. But I should probably shouldn't, shouldn't just add all these IP addresses because who knows what can be in there. So let's compare them with the authority and only when the name matches with an authority, then we're gonna add it. Authorities, if authority, authorities, no name servers. We can loop over the name servers because it's already a string. So only when the additional header name, I have it from here, header name, String is equal to the name server, then let's append to these resolver servers the IP address. And how do we know the IP address? So we know that this is type A already. So we have the additional. Additional has a body. The body only has this go string. So here we used ns resource and here it will be the type DNS message a resource. A resource. Because the type is a. You can also just print the go print 
output and it will also tell you that a, re a resource. And then it has an A record and then it can return the bytes. So here we have the bytes and that we should be able to just add to the IP because IP is also bytes. Now that we have all these ifs, we also want to make sure that we know whether we have found IP addresses. We can say new resolver servers found is false. And here we can say true. So that at least we found one. And then if we didn't find any, then we can do something. But if we found IP addresses, then we can actually do a query. by iterating our loop again. And then we just need to change the servers. Question can stay the same. We can just change the servers. Now the service is the service from here, which is the root servers. Now we can actually say the servers is the new resolver servers. And maybe I should just have called these servers, servers. Then I don't need this line because then we are just changing this servers. So servers, we make it empty. And then this needs to be servers and this needs to be servers. So if we do the iteration, then we say servers is going to be these new servers. If we don't have any new servers, then we're going to break for now. And then we're going to end up here because we haven't implemented this yet. If we have found new servers, then we'll just go to the next iteration of the loop. So let's try to test that. So let's click clear our screens. Maybe remove any prints. Yeah, there's no prints anymore. Let's see if that works. Go run. And what do we have? Starting DNS server. The first question is for google.com. Google.com, there's a new outgoing DNS query to the root servers. The root servers returned these new NS records. We assign this to the servers. We do a new iteration. The new outgoing query is still for Google.com, but now we have different servers. And we keep on iterating on this until we have found an authoritative server. And then once we find it, we return the message. And then actually we got the message. There's no error. We got google.com and the IP addresses. So maybe it's a bit unclear. So let's run the resolver test in debug mode so that we can have a better look at how this works. So the first outgoing query, we have an answer. So this is going to be the answer of the root servers. And this is the message. Let's have a look at this answer. It's not authoritative. So we are getting all the authorities. And these are, these are these names. So let's continue a bit. So now we are figuring out what the name servers are, a GTLD. So we're going to fill this name servers and then we're going to do the same for the IP addresses. So let's continue here to the next loop. Oh, actually I see what I did wrong. I should put my breaking point here. So let's restart. Actually, let's just maybe remove amazon.com just to make sure that I'm not 
accidentally getting in that one. So I'm gonna stop, debug. So how many questions do we have before we get the answer? One, two, three. And these are the servers. Root servers, GTLD servers, and then the Google name servers. These are the Google name servers. And then at this last iteration, we actually get the authoritative answer. So that's the third one. And then here we parse the answer and here we are authoritative. So the answers are now coming from these servers, which are the name servers. So first the root servers, GTLD servers, so the .com top level main servers, and then the Google servers and the Google servers are authoritative and then we are responding. So this works, but what is not going to work if we don't have any resolver server found. If you say resolver server not found, and let's uncomment amazon.com, and Amazon currently doesn't have any IP addresses for their name server, because why don't they have that? They have another domain name, you see, so it's not the amazon.com domain name. And when you ask the .com, .com servers, they will only give you these host names. So if you run our test again, resolver server not found for Amazon. So we don't get a reply. We get these host names right here, but we don't get the IP addresses. So we are here. We get these additionals. There's nothing in them. The new resolver found is still false. So we are now here. So for google.com, we actually have it working, but for amazon.com, it doesn't work because we didn't complete this flow. So remember the slides, I have two flows. One that we check whether we have the IP address and one that we don't check whether we have the IP address. Google is one server because we have here google.com and there's one google.com and then we cannot look that up. So we have the IP addresses in the additionals. For amazon.com, we can actually do a lookup of these host names to figure out what the A record is and then reply the A records and then use the A record as a server. But that requires a little bit more code right here. So let's try to add the necessary code just right here. You can actually write this code in two ways. You can say, I have these name server records here and I'm gonna loop over them for name server, range name servers. And I'm going to say, I'm going to find all the IP addresses of the name server. This might be a little bit inefficient because we only need one working name server. So if you have one IP address, we might have enough. Now we might have an IP address that doesn't work. So then we would be in trouble. So if you have one IP address and just hope that IP address works and return that IP address back in our loop here as a server, or we can get all IP addresses. So it's up to you whether you want to write it efficient or not. If you want to write it in a way that you get all the IP addresses, it is actually possible that if you would write a caching resolver, that these IP addresses are already cached anyways in your resolver, so that the latency that you get by resolving all these name servers is not completely crazy. But yeah, you can already see one, two, three, four, five, six. Are we going to look up six host names to figure out all these IP addresses, whereas maybe one name server would be enough? It's up to you. I might just actually look up one. If I find an A record of one, I will just return that. So what I'm going to say is I'm going to use again this if here. If new resolver is not found, then I'm going to continue in this loop. And once I find one, I will just put this to true. And what I'm going to do now is that I actually need to 
restart this whole loop again. I need to run this DNS query, just like I run it here, this DNS query, because if I just run one query, that's not going to be enough. I need to run multiple outgoing queries because we have to start again with the root servers. The root server is going to say NS servers for .NET are going to be here. Then you're going to have the name servers of this Dynac.net or this UltraDNS.net. And then you're going to have the A record. So I'm going to have to recursively go into this function again to find the IP address of this host name here. So DNS query gives us a message, response an error, and I need to get the root servers again because I need to query the root servers, and then I can pass a question. So DNS message question, the name is going to be the name server, but actually the name is of type DNS message message. So there is a must new name that can convert a string into a name type. So must new name name server. The type is going to be the A type type A because I'm looking for an A record and the class is going to be the Enet class. If there's an error, if there's an error, I'm just going to print something, a warning, lookup of name server failed, and an error. And if there's no error, then I'm going to do something else. So that means that if there's an error, we will just continue the loop until we find a name server that works. If we find a name server that works and we have an A record, we can put this to true. The response will then have the answers and we'll have to loop those because it's a slice. So for answer range answers. So this is a message actually. So the DNS query, it's a message. We don't have the parser, so we don't need to parse these things because it is actually the message that is being returned from hopefully here. If we are authoritative after we went through the loop a couple of times, we're going to have these answers here. So for answer, what do we need from the answer? This is going to be our IP address. Could be multiple IP addresses. So if answer header type is type A, is type A, I get a warning here, I didn't add error. If it is type A, what do we do? Then we can say servers, which is now empty. Append servers and our answer body should contain a type A. So it's an A resource, just like here, an A resource. And this should be the IP address. If this doesn't work, we'll see. But normally, we are testing DNS message type A. So this is for sure going to be an A resource. We return the IP, we append this to servers, and then we can do the loop again. I don't think I am missing anything. There's still this break here. Do we still need this break? No, we don't need this break anymore. Although before we are going to do all these crazy things, maybe we should just say IPs found to see whether it's really working. 
IPs found, servers, and then we do a break. And what about that? I can live with that. So let's try to do that. So google.com, that works. Because we didn't really go in that loop. Amazon.com, IPs found. Okay, new outgoing DNS query for pdns1, ultra DNS. So we found, I hope, the correct IP address for ultra DNS. Yes, that seems to match. Let's remove this breaking point. And let's hope for the best. And we get an answer. Amazon.com and the A record is right here. Yeah. That seems to match. They're just in a different order. So this was our last step. If there is no A record provided, then we need to resolve it by running our DNS query again. And then after coming back here using the new servers, we have an authoritative answer and then we return the correct message. So this seems to work. Let's to be sure also run our unit test and that also seems to work. So how many lines of code do we have? Less than 200. Okay, but we also have the main function, but our library less than 200 lines and we have written a DNS resolver that is actually working for simple queries. It definitely could use some improvements, some more checks, some more tests. We can, for example, also test whether we can run MX records. So host mxgoogle.com is handled by smtpgoogle.com. And now if we ask our own server using domain server, the localhost one, then we also get mail is handled by smbpgoogle.com. So that seems to be working. You can do the same with dick. You just have to do dick minus type, I think. Type equals mx. So within 200 lines, you can write yourself a DNS server in Go using only this extra package that is still from golang.org. So it's actually maintained as well. It doesn't have the same promises as these built-in packages, but these are pretty stable and pretty high quality because you can see that they are very efficient in parsing these DNS packets. So you can play a little bit with it to see if it works for all cases or that it works for a domain name that you own. But for simple queries, it seems to be working. So our resolver can answer simple queries. It doesn't catch anything yet. So you see it does for every query a lot of DNS queries itself. So that means that it wouldn't be very useful to use this as a real resolver. You would still have to write a caching layer that takes into account the TTL as well to cache the host names. I will make these files available on my GitHub so that you can have a look at the solutions and hopefully also try to build it yourself and improve on it.